This is Jocko Podcast number 322 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Find a new mission. That right there is some advice that I have given a bunch of guys, a bunch of veterans over the last decade because when you leave the military, that mission that you've been on, this honorable mission, all of a sudden overnight, it's gone. And that's gonna leave a hole. And the longer you serve, the bigger that hole is going to be. And for some of us, if the only thing you ever really wanted to do was serve and execute that mission, it can be a rough transition. Especially after you spend 20 plus years with the opportunity to do what you always wanted to do, to wear the cloth of the nation, to take the fight to the enemy, and it's an honor to have had the opportunity to do that. To work with a bunch of other people that are also dedicated to one thing in life, and that is executing the mission. So once that's gone, like I said, it can be a rough transition, and you have to find a new mission. And some veterans go into business, some of them focus on their family. Some of them start nonprofits. Those are the positive things you can do. Some serve in other ways. And some just seem to keep going and keep getting after it and keep moving forward with new missions. And we're lucky enough to have people like that in our country. And I know one in particular that served in special forces as Green Beret, fought in Afghanistan and Iraq, served as a contractor, supporting the State Department, supporting the CIA, spent almost nine years, all told, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, and in a bunch of places all over the world as well. But that wasn't enough. Needed more missions. This guy is also a businessman. Owned a CrossFit gym, a giant CrossFit gym. Has a firearms range and a tactical training company. And he's competed in CrossFit and weightlifting and Ironman and ultra running. And he's coached athletes from CrossFit and Strongman and triathlons. And on top of all that, in December of 2021, just a few months ago, he volunteered once again with a new mission to represent the people of North Carolina by running as an elected, elected member of Congress. This man's name is Tony Cowden, and it's an honor to have him here with us tonight to share some of his experiences and the lessons that he's learned along the way. Tony, thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. What's up with that bio? <laughs> take it take it easy, man. <laughs> uh, you know, people always say, they're like, hey, man, I know you're busy. You know, yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm always busy. I don't take naps. I freaking, I'm busy. You know, I've, I got stuff to do. And when I don't have things to do, I find things to do. <laughs> you know, the old thing, like, if you ain't got anything to do, clean something. <laughs> um, I'm probably not that good at that if you ever see any of my guns. That's not what I'm known for. Um but yeah, man, one thing after another, and, and you hit it on, on that, that intro, how many, how many of our brothers in arms got out and that hole consumed them? You know, they didn't find purpose. They, everybody wants to know, well, why is suicide so bad? You know, so most veterans and, and, and across the United States in general. Purpose. People with purpose don't commit suicide, mm -hmm. you know? And when guys get out of the military, like you said, especially after feeling used and abused in the 20 some years war now, where even the war itself, guys started questioning the purpose. Well, what was the purpose? And, and at this point, we certainly don't know. Mm. But uh, yeah, man, without purpose, you know, guys start drinking. It's a depressant, it's, a, it's a poison, you know, and they don't stop training because 
you know, like me, I've always liked to train by myself. You know, I've only had one training partner in my entire life. It's my girlfriend, Melissa. You know, she's the only dude I know that can keep up. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I actually try to keep up with her. Uh, but I, I was just that guy that went to the gym by myself. It was my time. I went to run by myself. I went rock by myself. I swam by myself. Not that that's safe or anything, but whatever. Um, and, but you know those guys on the teams that go to the gym with their buddies. You know, they got their little clique, little two- and three-man team that goes to the gym. You know, when those guys get out of the surface, they stop working out. You know, they lose their physical fitness. They drink maybe they got hurt and the va put them on an opioid you know the story you know and they don't have purpose and uh it it breaks my heart Mm -hmm. um so many americans not just veterans right because you know uh, throughout the gym and everything like that i grew so many civilian friends or whatever and i don't use that term you know negatively in any way uh some of my best friends are regular people. Some of my best <laughs> friends are civilians. Yeah, some of my best friends are regular people, right? And a lot of times, you know the deal. We used to, we would use that terminology like when, when on the teams and stuff, like regular people. Like it was, we kind of looked at them out of the corner of our eye, not down at them, but you know, we, we, we recognized it. You know, we you know, we got this little team, and we really think we're the most awesome ever. You know, like the old joke. You know, you want to know who the best is in special forces or special operations. Ask any unit, they'll tell you, right? <laughs> Ask a SEAL. SEALs are the best. Ask a Ranger. They're the best, you know, all with very different missions. But, yeah, man, um, Americans in general, especially after this whole pandemic, freaking the wild. No, people are losing that, that purpose, and we're losing that pride in our nation. And, you know, now with all the containment and the mass and the mandates and stuff, man, suicide mental health is, man, it's, it's scary. You know? Deaths of despair. It's been a nightmare. Yeah, it um, really is. Let's get into all that in a little bit, but let's start off just to get to know you a little bit. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Hmm. A uh, little white trash redneck kid uh, <laughs> from very rural North Carolina. Um, you know, and I, that's definitely in terms of endearment. My my dad, 82nd Airborne guy. Oh, dude. I'm our dude. Um, won a weekend leave from Fayetteville, Fort Bragg. In Wilmington, met my mom. The Zellia <laughs> Festival weekend. That's a big thing in Wilmington. The Zellia Festival. And um, apparently he was head over heels in love with my mom, right? And, uh, you know, freaking, they got married. He got out of the Army. Moved back to where he was from up in Indiana. She was from Pamlico County, North Carolina. And we always use, we have to use the county as a marker because there's no town in Pamlico County that anyone would even have heard of unless you actually lived or visited there often, right? So nearest town's like New Bern. So it's very rural. One of the biggest counties in North Carolina, smallest populations. So anyway, they went up to Indiana and- um, Are you born yet at this point? Not yet, oh, right. not yet. Um, my older sister is about to be on her way. And uh, he took a job with um, one of the companies who made parts for General Motors, right? All that area up there, Indianapolis, Detroit, everything. Yep. It's all General Motors, Ford, so on and so forth. And uh, after three or four years of being up there, uh, he did a couple other things. He got, like, his pilot's license, and um, which apparently back then you didn't actually have to have. Well, there were dudes you flying airplanes. Fly. Dudes were just <laughs> flying airplanes while drinking liquor and stuff. The stories that they used to tell us, right? They were small and flying these little Super Cubs and Piper Cubs around and you know, he was talking about shooting, you know, doing aerial, you know, shooting foxes and stuff. I'm like, these crazy suckers were doing aerial sniper shit with freaking hunting rifles and shotguns. You know, he's like, yeah, we, you know, those little super cubs will fly so slow that you could shoot, you know, coyotes and foxes and deal with a shotgun. And I'm like, all while drinking? He's like, yeah. You know, I was like, man, you guys were nuts. Um, so I, I joke that, you know, when we're all out, you know, thinking we're cool shooting out of a helicopter. Yeah bunch of redneck dudes been doing it for a long time <laughs> um but uh yeah so you know man some affirmative action policies uh my dad got pushed over for some promotions over those years and like he should have been in a supervisory role he was like uh, you know people are getting promoted that have less time or less qualification he got got disgruntled with the whole manufacturing world mm-hmm. i wouldn't even call it corporate per se manufacturing you know and it's like all right well, they moved back down to Carolina where my mother was from, and he took a job with a seafood company. It's right on the Pamlico Sound, so docks, food and, uh, seafood would come off the boats there. They'd package, process it, send it to the restaurants. A few years later, he bought that company. Hmm. So at this point, my older sister's born. Um, 
I was born in this little time frame there. And, uh, you know, by like, so I was born in 76. So by 82, the business is doing good, you know, so, and I'm old enough to be aware of it. And, you know, I've got an older sister and a younger sister. So when my dad needed help, mm-hmm. guess, guess who the laborer was, you know? So, uh, you know, but I'll tell you, you know, my, my dad, you know, my dad wasn't like, you know, by today's parenting standards, my dad was a horrible father, <laughs> right? Like he wasn't that nice to me. Um, he wasn't the lovey dovey, you know, hugs and kisses type. But he wasn't abusive either, right? Like you know, I'd get a spanking if I deserved it, and I, looking back, I probably deserved every one plus a few I didn't get. But uh, you know, he was he wasn't a very good teacher, right? He was the type of guy like by today's standards, like he was just he did it all wrong. But you know. My older sister's a, a world-renowned pediatric endocrinologist, right? Like, if you Google her name, you know, pretty amazing woman out of one of the most rural, underfunded school systems mm-hmm. in America. My younger sister's a successful um, uh, social worker in Raleigh. She helps a lot of people, does some amazing things. Of the three of us, she's the most left. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that she would even vote for me. Um, <laughs> my older sister, she's in the moderate. My older sister's that, you know, that that mother in America that was in the middle and kind of got pushed into the left mm-hmm. over the last, you know, four or five years. Um, but she's she's that person I talk about. We need to win them back. You know, she's conservative. She was raised conservative. Hell, she grew up shooting, hunting, and everything I did. But anyway, my um, my dad was that guy that was like, hey, look, you need to do this, and you need to do this, and you better have this done before I get home. And I'd be like, Dad, I don't know how to do that stuff. Figure it out. <laughs> and at the time, I thought he was just an asshole. You know, I just thought he wouldn't didn't like me. I don't know. My dad's mean to me, blah, blah, whatever. Actually, I probably wasn't even aware. It's just how it was. Because most of the fathers in my neighborhood were very similar. And I grew up in one of the neighborhoods, like, if you were – caught misbehaving down the street, you might get a spanking from the neighbor, right? <laughs> like, they were all family. We all went to church together, you know, and um, and then you get another one when dad got home. But, you know, looking back, man, he taught me so much. He taught me to figure it out. And come to find out, that was the whole point. He didn't care if I completed it, you know, at 100%, you know, awesomeness or whatever you know he just wanted me to try and it's not like these days man someone gives you a task like i'll just youtube it (laughs) you know it's right here in here i'll just watch a video step by step it'll be easy you know and uh we didn't have that growing up right so no, you, just, you just had an extension cord and, and a freaking skill saw. Right. Good luck, boy. Tool, you know, the fact that I still have all my fingers and toes because he let me handle tools that I, so I, my, my employees slash interns at the range with the company, man, I, I, they have like training programs they have to go through. They can't just pick up one of my chainsaws, right? You can chop your leg off with a chainsaw like that. Circular saws, right? My, my dad was like, yeah, man, just get it done. Um, Welding, I learned to weld because if I broke something, I better have it fixed before he got home. It looked like a big pile of chewed bubble gum, but you know, you know as long as it would hold it's together, it's gonna hold. Yeah. You know? So that that was kind of my childhood, man, and and it was so many lessons learned. I watched my dad build this business uh, from nothing to you know took us to you know comfortable. I wouldn't say upper middle class, but you know slightly above average middle class, you know, especially for rural North Carolina. Cost of living is not huge. And um, he bought some property, developed a piece of property uh, into a subdivision on the water down there. One of the one of the really first subdivisions uh, in that era in Pamlico County when there was a lot of resistance for change. Right. People don't we don't want them Yankees coming down here, (laughs) buying up our, you know, riverfront property. Right. And so he got a lot of pushback. And, and I remember that was my probably my first exposure. You know, he would come home from a county commissioner's meeting. And these are all people we know, right? There's 12,500 people in, in Pamlico County and has been for like 80 years, right? <laughs> like the population doesn't change because the exact same amount of people that move there or are born there die or leave. Yeah. So, yeah, man, um, 
it was really cool. That's when I learned to run like large machinery. At 12, 13 years old, my dad had me running a D6 bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> like what? When we were putting the culverts in for the road, right? We built the roads in this place. You're laying la- layers and layers of gravel. So he bought a D3, a D6, uh, an excavator, a backhoe, all this stuff. I can't even reach the pedals on these pieces of equipment. I'm out there running them without a lot of instruction, you know, or any instruction, just go. Yeah. And I'll never forget, you know, putting the big concrete tiles into the you know, the, the ditches for the, the road. I'm on the backhoe steering these things in, and he's in that ditch. Dang, You're talking 1,000-pound concrete tiles. If I make a mistake, I would have killed him. Oh, yeah. Looking back, I would have never trusted me. I wouldn't have gotten that <laughs> ditch, but he did. And I was like, wow, you know, either A, my dad was a complete psychopath, (laughs) right? Um, Which, you know, he's one of those guys like mission, man. We will get it done. Being in the rain in the military, not a big deal. Because my dad was like, it would, there was that local little restaurant in town where everybody ate breakfast, all the men, you know, and uh, it'd be raining. And they're like, all right, we got to go. And they're like, y'all working in the rain today? He's like, I don't get to choose the weather. That was his attitude, man. He was just a tough mofo, man. Just hard hours upon hours of work, you know? And I like to say I'm a decent balance between him and my mother, who was, you know, the, the, the more gentle, the, I mean, she, was a, she wasn't a, a puss by any means, right? Like, she didn't put up with none of my BS. I, she, I probably got more spankings from her than I ever did him, <laughs> right? You know, but, like, you know, little pops on the, on the ass or whatever. You got more quality from the old man, but more right, quantity from right, mom. Right, you know? Um, and, and some people say that, you know, I was, I was mama's baby boy, right? I was the only boy. I was, yeah. I was different. And, uh, you know, my older sister, man, she's like, she's like a T-1000. She's the first version of the Terminator, dude. She is like... When people meet her, they're like, whoa, dude, I thought you were intense. <laughs> no, my older sister's a machine. I, I say there's probably like five or six people on this planet I'm, I'm afraid of. She's one of them. You know what I mean? Like, there's a handful of guys. Uh, we're, we're all, you know, pretty tough dudes, right? You know, can hold our own and all that kind of stuff. But there's all of us have that handful of guys that you're like, yeah, that guy's kind of scary. One of those guys for me is my older sister. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding, right? Like, uh, uh, she's just, whew, man, she is what she is and, uh, and is successful because of it. But, yeah, man, you know, watching my dad build those businesses, develop that piece of property, really set that foundation. And, um, you know, since I was involved in so much of it because he didn't have labor, you know, he didn't have help, so I had to be there. You know, I didn't get to play sports in school like I wanted to because he needed help. And looking back in a lot of ways, those lessons just continue to carry over. Whether, you know, like, heck, when we were in Afghanistan or right before we were going into Afghanistan, we were at the FOB, you need equipment moved around. Yeah, I knew how to run forklifts. How do you think we move pallets around in that seafood house? Uh, forklifts, you know, even that big crazy machine that grabs the connexes. Yeah. I went and jacked one of those from the Air Force one time, and we just went to moving around the entire <laughs> lot, you know, the entire all the connexes. You know, it was like, hey, go get that and bring it over here next to our tent so we can pack out, get ready to infill. Well, I could do all of that when we got into Afghanistan. You know, I, I knew how to the the little local tractor that the fella had. You know, we needed it to move some stuff around with time. I was like, yeah, you know, I can run that. So that foundation was huge. But more than any of the actual stuff that I did or learned, what he taught me was that I can do anything if you put your mind mm-hmm. to it. It's just like selection. I don't remember selection being that difficult. You know, it was just like I had this mission, mm-hmm. and it just had to be done. I mean, I, you know, he, he couldn't really afford all three of us going to college, you know. Um, he was struggling a little bit. Uh, my mother died when I was 16. I was, after that, I went, I went to misbehaving. How'd your, how'd your mother die? Cancer. Oof. Yeah, uh, four-year bout with it, man. And um, ultimately, it wasn't really the cancer that killed her. It was a surgery, complications from a surgery. So it was kind of heartbreaking. Like, yeah, she had been fighting it or whatever. Really, you know, the struggle back then was chemo, which it still is, but. You know, you're talking in the early 90s, man, freaking chemo was rough. Mm-hmm. And um, so I learned a lot from watching her deal with it, man. She she would get up and walk and exercise and work in the yard and mow the yard, you know, while having to stop and throw up from chemo. Yeah, yeah so one of the toughest people I ever grew up with was my mother. And, um, yeah, so after she passed, man, you know, I started being that bad kid, you know, and 
you know, smoking weed, wound up doing a little blow, whatever, freaking got in trouble, you know. Um, Who did you get in, get in trouble with, like school? Or? Yeah, you know, school, the law. Yeah, I got oh. arrested, man, freaking. Um, luckily, you know, it was all just minor dumb stuff, right? It's not like I was, a, you know, you know, dealing anything or stuff like that. I wasn't, you know, making money off of it, just partying, mm-hmm. you know, just doing dumb redneck stuff, you know, like hunting club roads, you know, you don't want to get on the road, you get a DWI, but we can ride around these hunting club dirt roads, you know, redneck stuff, man, you know, drink <laughs> beer and, you know, and, you know, do all the dumb stuff we were doing. And, and so, that was yeah. when you were still in high school? Yeah. So, yeah, my senior year in high school, um, you know, just being bad. and But I was still making good enough grades. Excuse me. Yeah, I was, you know, just – you know the deal, man. Just how, like everyone in software, we're all pretty smart dudes. We can get B's without really trying in any course we go to, you know. Um, most of us are B students in every course. And, of course, there's always that one nerd over there that gets honor grad. <laughs> you know, and, well, yeah, whatever. We'll make fun of that guy. What a nerd. Yeah, I wasn't the nerd. I was a misbehaved kid just being a jackass for and you didn't play any sports because you were working too much well i did play a little bit but like uh withdrew from you know the team in senior year stuff like that just just because yeah man he needed help after work Mm -hmm. and um so what did you do after high school yeah man so you know also our man we were the smallest uh school system and right next door to us is like west craven you know this this that's a school that's producing you know, pro football players, you know, uh, D.H. Conley over in Greenville, ECU, the, you know, big schools, man. And we were like, uh, they're like, we'll let Pamlico play us. And they would just destroy us. You know, they had like defense and offense and special teams. We had a football team. You didn't leave the field, man. And there was times we went to football games. We didn't have enough dudes, you know. It was like, we'll play. And, you know, so after, you know, a couple of years of that, man, I wasn't even really interested. You know, it was like, oh, what's the point? I'm going to – you know, the average dude on our team, you know, we had that one 220-pound guy where you go to West Grave and their entire lineup's 200-plus pounds. It's like we would just – they would mop the floor with us. So I lost interest in that and just started working more and partying more. And, uh, yeah, man, so good enough grades to get into NC State. I look back and I'm like, I still don't know how they let me in. Um, you know, not good enough grades to get any kind of scholarship. So, you know, my – after the second year, my, my younger sister is only a year behind me. My older sister is four years ahead of me. She's entering medical school. Where did she go to school? She went to uh, medical school at ECU. Where did she go to undergrad? At UNC Chapel Hill. Good yeah. Check. So, you know, um, dad's paying out of pocket. Plus, he's still very much, you know, dealing with the death of my mom. And he, he, had, a, he had a really hard time, man, freaking, you know, um, I watched him lose a lot of weight, you know, he didn't talk to people, he kept working, you know, and he worked more, which was already darn near impossible. And, you know, being a young, dumb, punk kid, I couldn't recognize it because I'm selfish, like kids are. And um, looking back, I was like, man, I could have been a better kid, I could have been a better son to him, but, I mean, we were kids, we were young. And looking, looking back, man, my mom taught me the number one best lesson in my entire life, and that is everyone you know is going to die, right? So as we entered that war, I had already lost, and I try not to use that terminology, one of the people that was closest to me in my life. And so that set me up for being able to deal with how many of our brothers got killed, close friends, and so on and so forth, you know, our partner forces, you know. I don't think guys always realize how tight we get with those partner forces you know i I got some of my best friends on this planet are you know muslims people don't always understand that you know my my, especially in iraq where i worked with the kurds for years the same team of dudes for seven eight years and um so anyway her passing taught me to appreciate why you have them and that's why i don't use that terminology you lost them i didn't lose my mother i can go show you right now where she rests I know exactly where she's at. So I didn't lose them. It was a gain, right? If someone in your life is so tight with you that when they die, it breaks your heart, right? You didn't lose anything. You gained something in life. Because if, if when we understand that everyone we know and love, they're going to die. When you start thinking like that, you start appreciating them every day. 
you know? Um, so I can say, man, my mom taught me the best lesson that I've ever had, and it, and it set me up for success in the war. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean like I'm somehow callous or, you know, uh, immune to feeling sad and, and upset, you know? There's still those anniversaries, there's those thoughts, you know, there's memories that pop back up that make us all upset, you know, and tear up and, you know, and so on and so forth. But yeah, man, freaking without her death, I don't know that now today I would be as healthy mentally as I am, you know? It just laid that foundation. Yeah. No, that's yeah, you know. And I tell people that all the time and I have throughout, you know, once I realized that and, and I'll tell you, it really probably number one thing that really woke me up. Two thousand and thirteen, in April of two thousand thirteen, my best friend was KIA, a guy named Ben Bittner. Ben was better than everyone else. He was that cocky little Little uh, that guy, you know, who everything who could he did, back it up too. you know, he, he was just better than everybody else. He wasn't huge or jack, but he was strong and fast. And uh, so anyway, man, I, I got that phone call and me and Melissa hadn't been dating very long. We were driving up I-40 kind of early on a Sunday morning. I got a phone call. I was like, who's this? You know, hey, bro, Ben Bender, okay, I, holy shit, dude, pulled off the side of the road and threw up because the one dude I thought that was truly immortal, right? just got suckered by the enemy in a baited ambush, right? And if had not been, I mean, shoot, that's 13, man. We're 12 years into the war. We already got plenty of memorial braces, you know? But for something about when, when Ben died, it was like, holy crap, we're not immortal. You know, I'd been injured, blown up. You know how it is. As a, a young little trooper, sometimes, right, those close calls, they make you more arrogant and cocky, right? You know, you start thinking that you can get away with more and more. And that's probably where I was in 13 when I got blown up in 2009. Like, after my recovery, I went back meaner, more aggressive, you know, probably taking risks that I shouldn't have, you know, looking back, taking risks with my teams and, and my, my partner forces lives just because I was emotionally wanting some retribution you know they had killed some of my teammates and and damn near killed me and and then ben died i was like holy shit but uh, like i said without my mom's death i don't know that i would have dealt with any of it very well so yeah man um nc state uh i like to say that i was enrolled at nc state <laughs> so your participation level was low <laughs> Well, you know, there's Pamlico County, and there's like, you know, uh, my graduating class was like 104 people. So let's say there was, you know, 55, 60 girls in that class, right? And then I get to NC State. <laughs> there's girls everywhere. <laughs> they were everywhere. I was like, holy crap, man. There's like thousands of them. And, uh, yes, yeah, so I was distracted, to say the least. And, um, you know, I quickly found out that classrooms where you have to be quiet and pay attention to a professor is not the best place to talk to these girls. So why would I waste my time going to those classes? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, freaking partying, wasting money, you know, that, that we didn't have. And my sister's in med school. Now my younger sister's going to school. She went was going down at UNC Wilmington. And, um, you know, it was clear, you know, that I, I was wasting money. I didn't have it. My dad didn't have it. So I withdrew and joined the army, you know. Um, was, your first, was that your first time thinking about joining the army? Absolutely not. I didn't want to go to college, mm. right? And, you know, our generation, we have to blame our parents for everything. So <laughs> my dad let me watch Rambo First Blood when I was nine or ten years old. Done deal. Right. Those Green Berets, they're real badasses. Mm -hmm. You know, it says it right in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, you know, so from there on, you know, like, let's face it, right? Like, some guys watch, you know, uh, something that's got seals in it, and they're like, oh, yeah. Or some guys will watch, you know, uh, the recon movie with Clint Eastwood. And, like, you know, and your impression at a, a young point. Well, mine was Rambo First Blood, man. Freaking that, you know, running around above the snow line and the rats <laughs> in the caves. I was like, yeah. I was already playing in the woods all the time anyway. And I loved to hunt. And all that. just, man. So from there on out, yeah, I just, man, I want one of those funny green hats. Which, looking back, I'm like, damn, that hat sucks. <laughs> it's made out of wool. It's hot as hell, right? Like, you want me to wear this wool hat in Fayetteville, you know, in you know, 100 plus degrees in the summertime, the sand hills in North Carolina, right? Like, this hat's dumb. There's no bill. It doesn't keep the sun out of your face. There's not like a boonie cap. There's no ballistic protection. Why do we even wear this dumb hat, right? Like, anyway, um, 
But yeah, that's what I wanted. And I, I, it didn't help. I met a fellow named Jason McKenzie at NC State, and he was going green to gold. And uh, he started telling me about— and Was he a former green bird? Yeah, he was a, a GB at the time. And um, he was getting his commission, and, and he went on to get his commission, go back to the 18 Alpha course, and then he went over to the unit. Freaking stud. He was a stud. Real smart dude. Uh, still is. And, um, yeah, man, I was like, started talking to him. He was like, hey, look, bro, I get it. College sucks. Let me tell you about this really cool secret. It's card that's called the National Guard Special Forces Groups. And I was like, what? How is that even possible? Right? How can you have a reserve special operations? Well, come to find out, most all of us have that. And uh, he's like, it is the coolest, most least known way to get into special forces. And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, where do I sign up? And he's like, yeah, man. So basically, you, you go in, and it's just like a, an active duty group. I mean, they just, you know, less bullshit. And that's really what it almost comes down to is, like, the guard gets on orders. It's not like they're doing, you know, one week in a month, two weeks a year type of thing. You know, they're doing weeks of training at a time. If When they deploy, it's, you know, months of work up, PMT, just like the group. They have to check all the same boxes, just in a lot less time. And I'm like, okay, yeah. He's like, so how does it work? He's like, well, you know, he's got me all hooked up with 19th group, the guys up in West Virginia. Um, I had to get a waiver for my misbehaviors and arrests, right? I remember. Uh, <laughs> what year is this? So this is uh, 97. And Was it uh, hard getting waivers? It, it wasn't. Were you uh, a minor when you got arrested? No. Uh, yes. Yes and no. <laughs> Both. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> I had just turned 18 um, uh, with one of the arrests. I was still a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. And uh, but everything else was before that. <laughs> and uh, no, nah, man, freaking. So I go and talk to these guys, and, and Colonel Hoyer was the battalion commander for Second Battalion of Nineteenth Special Forces Group, and he moved on to become like the the general, the tag of West Virginia. Really smart man, really smart guy, and um, not a not a very imposing figure, um, you know. N- just an average looking guy, a guy that could throw a suit on and disappear, you know, uh, not not the jack tattoo guys. Of course, tattoos on the sleeves and all that weren't quite popular at the time. And I remember walking in and thinking, this is a special forces colonel? I was expecting, you know, like <laughs> John the, G. Colonel, the Colonel <laughs> Colonel Trotman from <laughs> Rambo, right? This dude's supposed to scare the shit out of me. Very unassuming, which come to find out later, yeah, those are the dudes that are really the scary guys anyway. Well, anyway. Colonel Hoyer was like, um, yeah, so you need a waiver. Whew. You going to do this anymore? <laughs> and I'm like, no, sir. Done with that. That was, you know, three years ago. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Boom. That easy, you know? And, and had he, in his assessment of me, for whatever reason, you know, because um, I know him to have turned down similar cases. But, man, it was there was no interview, nothing. He just took me on a very first impression basis. And I was just a dumb kid. I didn't know. I'm, like, scared to death of all these GBs. You know, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm trying to join this very exclusive club. And I don't know what to say. I don't know how to act. So nothing I would have done would have been right anyway. But, uh, yeah, he gave me the waivers. I withdrew from school on a Tuesday morning. Uh, you know, Raleigh to Pamlico County to the house is about two hours. I went home. My dad was at home. I was like, yeah. Changed into some PTs and went for a run. Sure enough, met him on the road. He, like, hits the brakes. He's like, what the are you doing? Why are you home? You're supposed to be in college, boy. What's wrong with you? And you know, he knew at this point, like, oh, something's up, right? Like, mm-hmm. this ain't right. You know, he, oh, great. He's probably in trouble again. That was probably his first impression. I'm like, uh, I'll run to the house. Dad. I'll meet you there. He probably would have pulled over to the side of the road and got out. And we would have had that discussion on the side of the road. But my stepmother, he luckily, good Lord, man, luckily for my dad, man, he met an amazing woman after my mom died and who became one of my very best friends. Sad story. She died of cancer, too. Yeah, my dad, man, God bless his heart. So my stepmom's with him. And I remember she kind of like patted him on the shoulder and was like, let him come home and talk to us. You know, because my dad wasn't a little dude either. Right. Like he's, you know. About my size now, right? I was always smaller than him until I finally started lifting some weights. I was actually way more of a runner, dude, early on. I was like buck 70, you know, I, I could run. 
had no real weight on me, you know, but he was like two, two ten, you know. Oh, yeah. He's a you know, and a strong dude, yeah. a worker guy, right? Yeah. Old man strength, yeah. bro. He boxed, yeah. he boxed on the eighteenth airborne court. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. yeah. The few times we did scuff it up yeah. a little bit, yeah, he just it wiped me up, right? Well I just you. covered yeah. up. <laughs> and uh, you know, like I said. Anyway, man, freaking uh yeah. So I go to the house and I tell him and he's just shaking his head, but it's like he understood. You know, he understood. He knew. I mean, of course, I'm insane. He knew me. I'm his. He joined the 82nd Airborne for the same reason I wanted to go. So, yeah, man, um, a few weeks later, I was in basic training. That quick, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like two and a half months from the time I signed up, I was already in basic training. Because back then, you know, late 90s, recruitment was at a pretty low there. The Clinton administration, yeah. they had routed the military and cut so much funding. But trying to get guys to sign up for combat arms, you know, the recruiter would be like, heck yeah, sign him right up. Come on in here, you know. So, yeah, I did that. Um, How was boot camp? <laughs> I was in such good shape that it was, like, easy. I think I got in worse shape when I got there. I was already getting, like, a 340 on the Army's PT test. Right, and a lot of it was, you know, I could max the push-up and sit-ups, but my run time was, like, I was running, like, 11 flat two miles you know just a little runner Damn, runner dude right and uh and skinny god bless my heart i look back at some of them pictures man i'm like wow wow boy you needed to eat <laughs> <laughs> did you you never ran like competitively no in high school or anything no no i didn't start running i, I joined the rotc at nc state because you know okay well maybe i want to join the army but you know maybe i'll be an officer yeah you know that didn't really play out that way and, but that was the first time I started doing PT and running. And I think, like, my first PT test, I must have run, like, a 15-minute, two-mile. But, like, my second one was sub-12. Yeah. I, so, apparently, had some decent pre, Genetics. predisposition, genetic predisposition to running. And your uh, the shock of boot camp was no factor because you were just stoked to be there. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, at this point now, I'm – 20 so i'm one of the oldest kids in basic training and i'm even back then i'm looking around doing looking like dude these are a bunch of pussies where do these kids come from right like clearly they didn't work like you know my dad you know and in my head i think every american boy's like me you know and you now there's these city kids and whatever man yeah but basically it wasn't hard i remember i got like you know top pt and you know was quickly made like the stupid platoon sergeant or whatever and i was like great you know and you know uh, there was a little click you know because i did the basic and ait back to back so mm -hmm. it was like 14 weeks so you same drill sergeants all the way through by the end me and these couple other boys are a little bit older a little bit more mature you know we were running things we had our own little mafia going you know we had when they let us clean the drill sergeant's uh, uh office we took the key, snuck off post, made a coffee, a copy of it. So now we had a drill sergeant's uh, office key, which had all our personal bags in the, right? Like, so we would go in there and listen to the Walkmans and CDs, and, you know, and like hide out. And it was funny because the drill sergeants had no idea we were doing it, much less that we were leaving post. Like, you know, you can't leave post in basic training. There's no cell phone. Like nowadays they can make phone calls and be on the internet. None of that. You're on lockdown, yeah. right? We were sticking off post and like, cause we had access to the civilian clothes. Uh, we were sticking off post going and buying beer and it's stashing it in the drill sergeant's office, in the personal, right? And we go in there at night and have us a few beers, you know, <laughs> buy some liquor. No clue. So I always say like, I was already running an underground and auxiliary when I was in basic training. Like SF was just, you know, was where I was guest. <laughs> but yeah, man, I got out of there and um, freaking, immediately went to uh, uh, the, the little progression course or whatever, PLDC, where you had to go from, uh, you know, to get your promotion to E4 or whatever. And it was like a couple of days before I finished that little three-week course. So you're already in E4 after like a few months? Uh, no, I'm still in E3. Right? I finished because I did have a little bit of college. I was mm -hmm. finished basic as an E3. And uh, so now I'm in this little PLDC course so I can get promoted to E4. And they're like, hey, you ready to go to selection? And I'm like, uh, I guess. Uh, when? And they're like, in two weeks. Man, I haven't worn a rucksack. Right? And that's all our selection is, is carrying a rucksack for 28 days. I'm like, yeah, okay. Because okay. I'm like, I'm not going to say no. Yeah. I'm not turning down a slot at SFAS. Looking back, I could have been like, hey, I really could stand another month of training. And they'd be like, okay, whatever. And put me in the next course. I didn't know it like that. 
I thought just an opportunity at selection must have been a godsend. You can't say no. So I had a whopping two weeks to train for selection. (laughs) And went straight there, you know. And even then I look back and I'm like, it wasn't really that hard. But it wasn't hard because quitting wasn't an option, right? I couldn't have withdrawn from college all to go to special forces and then fail, right? Mm. That wouldn't have been a thing. I could not have sold that to family members, my dad, right? Myself. Couldn't have happened. How many people get... How many people make it through the so that first selection? What is it? Twenty eight days? You said back then it was twenty eight days, right? It's it's changed a lot over the years. Um, I think right now it's twenty one days of actual course, so maybe twenty six days mm-hmm. counting the admin and all that. So it was twenty eight back then, exactly four weeks. Um, yeah, there was two hundred and fifty or so dudes in my class. Fifty two finished, and forty or forty one were selected. And I think a lot of folks don't know that, right? You can finish that course and not get picked up. You know, 28-day non-select. Yeah, that's got to hurt. That has got to hurt. And uh, so, yeah, I got picked up. And most of those people are quitters or their performance drops or medical drops? You know, they hurt their knees. (laughs) Yeah, you know, the the number one attrition rate is voluntary withdrawals. You know, that's probably 95% and then injury. And, you know, it's funny. I've seen some dudes, and I'm sure the same at Bud's and everywhere else. You see those guys that, like, they've got stress fractures, broken ankle, broken toes, you know, torn patellar tendons, and they finish. Mm -hmm. You know? It's like, whew. I was just young and stupid, man. Freaking. I didn't. I'm so lucky. I don't get blisters on my feet. I never have. I got some of my first blisters ever last year hunting in the mountains of Idaho. (laughs) Because I bought a pair of boots and didn't really break them in. I you know, warm around in North Carolina working around the house, and then I throw a backpack on and go hiking in the mountains of uh, Idaho. Uh, and I call it hiking. It was armed hiking because we didn't kill anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not really hunting if you don't, well, you know, it's just armed hiking. Really well armed hiking. Uh, good training, I guess you could talk it up as. But yeah, I'd never even gotten a blister, like, you know. Um, so I was lucky when it comes to that because that's a big thing in our selection is like just dude's feet get turned to hamburger. Uh-huh. What do you? How are you gonna rut march if you ain't got you know feet? And I've seen some you know blisters that start at the toes and <laughs> end at like the back of the heel, you know, like gnarly. things that like you could lose a leg at over. You know, and the medics are like, whoa, you know. They have horrible, you know, in the little medic station, they had all those pictures. And And you think it's just some genetic thing, you just don't get blisters? I just, for whatever reason, my feet uh, fit jungle boots, which is weird because it's not like they're, (laughs) you know, I just did it. Uh, So, yeah, man, that just worked out, finished election. It was funny because at the time, Reg said to finish, it was before the 18 or the SF baby program, the 18 18 x-ray. Right, it was before that. And, but the guard had the back door. Oh. It was like the 18X because I didn't go to any other unit. And um, so it's graduation day. I had to go to the shrink and to the board a couple times because I was in E3. And they were like, you can't, you're not even supposed to be here, much less finish. Like, what the? Well, they didn't know what to do with me. Again, some dudes looked at it, gave me a waiver. But it was funny because, you know, the company commander, Company commander in the training, SF training, he's not really involved in anything. He shows up. You know, he's an admin guy for yeah. the most part. The enlisted boys run selection. So come time, you know, he's handing out, you know, his graduation, not very formal. It's out at Camp McCall. You're just all dirty and nasty, and you're walking across this little stage, and he's handing out. He's like, staff sergeant such and such, captain such and such, uh, sergeant such and such. You know, hey, shaking hands. And I get up there, and he goes, private for <laughs> He looks at the first sergeant, and the whole class knows. You know, we don't wear rank and stuff there, but you know, right? After four weeks, everyone knows who the cherry lieutenant is. And, and you know, there were some guys there probably who were pissed that I was there as an, you know, an E3. But most of the guys were like, wow, this dude's crushing it, and he's a baby. But I wasn't a child. You know, I wasn't 18, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, at least so I had the some average college. age in there, like 24 or something? Yeah, very much so. You know, the average age, you know. Senior E4 promotables, E5s and E6s made mm-hmm. up the bulk of the class. And most of the officers were, you know, first lieutenant and, and captains. And um, so it was kind of funny because the whole class, like, laughed and clapped. <laughs> yeah. You know, because the, the captain or the, the company commander and major was like, what the? 
What? <laughs> uh, he like talks to the first sergeant, the sergeant major, and they're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's like, really? And I'm like standing there on the stage like, am I getting ready to get booted? <laughs> you know, is the commander going to go, nope, right here? And uh, so anyway, freaking, he shakes my hand. He goes, all right, private first class, Cowden, welcome to regiment. Right on. So, man, it was kind of screwed up. I, I, I was in a race in motocross. One week before I was supposed to report to the Q course, broke my femur, a couple ribs, Ooh. and my arm. Yeah, man, and at a race that I shouldn't have been racing. Are you not allowed uh, to race it? Uh, no, it wasn't like that. You know how you know it, that wasn't on the list of things you can't do. You know, like you're not supposed to skydive. You're not, <laughs> you know, no one never thought these knuckleheads are out there. Like, r- you don't go ride rodeo yeah. is on the <laughs> list of things that you're not supposed to do while you know in the Q course. Well, I wasn't in the Q course yet, but motocross wasn't on the list. <laughs> Until I broke my femur. They added motorcycles to the list because of me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, man, I um, I missed my Q course day. And I was supposed to go to the Delta course. I wanted to be a medic. Oddly enough, my plan was to go be a medic and either go to PA school or medical school. I wanted to be like my Terminator sister. I was the one. That, I probably wanted to be a doctor more than she did. And, uh, but I was always in the, you know, I wanted to be like the, you know, the ER doc. I wanted to be the trauma guy. So 18 Delta just made sense. Well, eight months later, I'm still limping. You know, they put a rod in my leg and all that. Um, you know, I got my run times back down pretty good, but man, it hurt. It just hurt because I just destroyed this leg, man. It was like, you know, it was so atrophed afterwards. You know, I could put my hands around my quad. <laughs> it, it was just a bone in there. And it was, it's nasty because when I, Basically, what happened was I over jumped a, a triple jump. The, the jump got walloped up and it kicked the bike forward. My buds were standing over there. They said they could see the drain plug on the bottom of the bike. The bike was pointing at the ground. I was still upright. When it hit the ground, the front tire basically trapped this leg and then whoop, catapulted me, just threw me up in the air. Just so, when you smashed. said it's not a race you should have been in, it's like too advanced of a race for no, you? No, the exact opposite. It was like a local outlaw race, not an AMA sanctioned oh. race. <laughs> it was just a fun race, but there's no fun races because you still got to win, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was battling for first. And a funny thing was, I was racing the 250 class and the 125 class um, at that time. So, I had already raced those two. And then there was this the unlimited class where it didn't matter. You could race anything you wanted in it. And uh, so I was racing six motos that night, six different races that afternoon night. It was a six moto. I was exhausted. Damn. And uh, folks don't realize, man, like I'm in phenomenal shape at this time, right? And motocross is still one of the most physically demanding things I've ever done. And, you know, because you just don't realize that you're, you're strapped to a 230, 40 pound piece of equipment that has 45 horsepower. You know, with the right, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, you're trying to control that thing. You know, it's not like you're just relaxing on it. You're standing up, you're clenching it, you know, between your legs, all that. And anyway, yeah, man. Um, so now my career is like, okay, now what? So through advisement, they're like, hey, look, you lost all this time. I'm going to sign you up for the Charlie course, the engineer demo course. And I'm like, all right, at this point, I just want to get in the course. And, you know, I've been basically doing nothing for eight months except for rehab and uh so okay cool so i did the charlie course it was kind of funny man in the charlie course because i'm from north carolina so i know people (laughs) at uncw which is a you know wilmington is a college town with a beach problem right (laughs) uh nc state ecu party i have friends everywhere so i was like the tour guide on the weekend right like yeah i know people at this school let's go to this party all that kind of stuff so we're having a good time. That's where I met that fellow, Ben Bittner, um, our little clique, man, a bunch of little crazy dudes. And, um, you know, borderline, you know, we were misbehaving in the Q course, you know, because it wasn't that hard, you know, especially in the MOS phase. It wasn't the very hard. So we were partying and blah, blah. Um, yeah, I did all that stuff. Language school wasn't hard back then because no one cared about language. You really didn't have to go to language school. So I went to language school, but did not learn French. (laughs) And then, of course, it didn't really matter because it was like eight years later before I ever went anywhere that spoke French. You know, not a lot of French speakers in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know. But, yeah, man, freaking uh, cool stuff. I, um, I got lucky, though, because if I had done the medic course, 
I would have missed the invasion. Oh. I'd have been in language school or Sears school during that time frame. So because I did the shorter Charlie course, I was already done and on a team and doing some pretty cool stuff. Afghanistan kicks off and I got to go at the beginning. Where were you when September 11th went down? So when I said doing cool stuff, um, my warrant, he was the ASO guy, right? The, the source operations mm -hmm. guy, not the door kicker guy. Even though he had done all that, he had just matured into understanding that that's the that's the hard part, right? The finish is the easy part, right? How long does this to take us to execute a target? You know, 30 to 90 seconds typically, right? We're on target, everyone's zip tied or done. We're done with the target, now we're doing SSE, it's quick. It's that find, fix part, that ASO stuff, right? It's actually difficult, it takes a brain. And he was all about that. And because I was that skinny college kid, I didn't look like an SF guy. <laughs> so he got me signed up on this uh, program that fifth group, 10th group, all the active duty groups were participating. It was 10th group's year to run it. And it was the red cell against the NCCC, the nuclear command and control. So for the four months leading up to 9-11, I'm running around the nation tracking and you know developing patterns of life of this general He's got a suitcase attached to him. He's like number 12 in the chain of command of running our country Check. in the time of nuclear war with Russia. And I had no idea because it was very cellular, right? It was broken down into little cells, which is ironic, right? Because now we're playing red against the United States nuclear command and control. For those six months, I didn't interact. I did not see face to face. It was all old school Cold War trade craft. Dead oh, drops, check. notes, no text messages, nothing. The only time I got text messages or a call is when I actually called the handler, uh, who was a, a chief out of 10th group, and he was running our cell. So we were in Oklahoma, Nebraska, silos, man, mm -hmm. right? And this guy would go from silo facility to silo facility with these. Tractor trailers that, indescript, three tractor trailers or so, um, and that could change, right? And then a security detail that, you know, all plain clothes and stuff, right? Like you're driving down the highway, you would never notice this convoy. Of course, they didn't nut to buck convoy either. It was mm -hmm. just these three tractor trailer trucks. And, uh, and sometimes more than that, sometimes the convoy was much larger when they had other pieces of equipment that I had no idea what it was. I only cared about him. Because the ultimate goal was when we were supposed to execute we were trying to create a four second hiccup in the United States, nuclear reaction to Russia's attack. Four, Damn. four seconds. That was what it was, that's all supposedly Russia needed. Four seconds, man. Well, come to find out, man, it was a worldwide effort. It wasn't just my four goofballs, and I knew there were some others because other teammates of mine were scattered around the country, and I knew they were doing it. I had no idea where they're at because the last time I saw them was a, a meeting in Northern Virginia where we all came together, they briefed us and sent us on our ways. And it was fun, man. I'm this new little punk kid, oh, yeah. little SF dude. Man, there was, you know, unlimited budget, freaking just swiping a government credit card. There was days I had two different rental cars, freaking, you know, hotel, you know? And, and it was an amazing thing. It was really cool because, you know, I had to get an interim TS, which back then, a, a little baby E6, I didn't have TS clearances. So that, that paved the way to getting my, my clearances set up and all that. Uh, much younger than, than I should have probably, um, or at least was standard at the time. So, yeah, man, on the morning of 9-11, I would crawled through this drainage little culvert. Freaking, I went to Walmart, bought some leafy Gucci flies from Walmart, and you know, freaking got my little crappy Walmart ghillie suit, and I crawled like for four hours to get within taking a picture of this general that was going to be the shot. And like I said, man, you got teams around the world taking pictures of different types of planes and tell numbers and, oh, this plane took off in Interlook, Turkey, and then it landed in Alaska. Like, they flew across the North Pole? Yeah. I mean, these are, these are some crazy assets, right? Well, yeah, man, so I get a text, and it's like, abort. Move to such and such. And I'm like, I'm not compromised. I'm good. Right now was the text I got back. Abort. Right now. And I'm watching his security detail change. Mm. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? 
what the what's happening and um as i'm crawling out man freaking like the local sheriff's department freaking starts pulling in dudes have got shotguns right local redneck dudes some marines showed up i guess they were like freaking had been hovering this whole time this marine detail that i was not even aware of well luckily they weren't aware of me either so now i'm crawling quickly because it's clear something is going on right because they've got mags in their guns Mm. and i'm like what the fuck man get out get my car Freaking call, hey, what's up? Yeah, meet me at this motel. It's like, you know, side of the road, dirt motel, one story, old school, you know, 1950s built motel. And there's like 40 rental cars in this motel parking lot. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell is going on? Well, come to find out, it's not my four man cell. Man, there was redundancies upon redundancies for all these cells at every location around the world, man. And none of us knew about each other. And a couple of them you like recognize because this thing's been going on for months. And I'm like, I saw you in Nebraska. <laughs> I saw you, males, females, and this is that's a that's a good point because that was the first time in my life I realized how important females are for you know reconnaissance, surveillance, freaking like they, wow, they do have a a major role. That that changed a lot of my career the way I saw women and how they can be an asset, right? Like me and you, <laughs> right? How do we walk around? We're, we're, we're not in blending anywhere. in yeah, anywhere, no, right? Happening. We don't even blend in an average U.S. freaking <laughs> you know city, much less throw on some a man dress and try to walk around Jalalabad, right? <laughs> yeah. No, we're busted. Yeah. But man, these ladies, you know, they can go and do, especially when you recruit the ones that can speak Arabic and you know can blend in, right? Which we learned that lesson. But this was my first time seeing females. I was like, holy crap. Come to find out, one of the people on my team was a female. I didn't know. I'm just dead dropping letters and notes. So anyway, as I walk in the hotel room, man, yeah, there's like 40 people in this little hotel room. It's not, I mean, just cramped in, sitting, looking at a TV of burning towers. Mm. Yeah, man, I'm just sitting there going, okay, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, we're under attack. And at this point, you know, it's early in the morning. No one even knows. Pentagon hadn't been hit yet. And um, so it that happened while we were sitting there. And we're just like, whoa. Okay, so we pack up. We actually went and linked up with that uh, asset and provided a ring of security for them and escorted them. So we went from playing red cell against them to helping with their security cordon. We were unarmed, so we pulled in outer security and escorted them to a, a hard location. Damn. Yeah, and then got on planes and flew back to wherever we were supposed to. Uh, there were unit guys. There were guys from Damn Neck involved. Um, everybody flew back as fast as they could, but planes were grounded. So they're sending C-17s from wherever they could and picking us up. We drove 100 mile an hour all the way to Colorado Springs, you know, to 10th group, and got, all got on flights wherever we could get them. It was always funny because, you know, like the Tier 1 guys, you know, the – the Lear jets were waiting for them. We're just waiting on like whatever we could get. Like, oh, can, we, can I get on that crop duster? Get a ride back to Bragg, you know? But it was I always remember that was my first impression of those guys. Was like, how come they get Lear jets? You know? Oh, they're they're important. Uh, we're the scrubs. But um, yeah, man. So that's how it all got started. You know, um, I had a a slot to go to MFF, and you know, National Guard young sf dude to get a slot in free fall was a big deal back then you know because back then we didn't all sf didn't all go to free fall and so that chief was like well i mean your orders are good for another year you're detailed and assigned to us and what do you want to do i was like what do you mean well you can go to free fall or you can come with us i'm like (laughs) i'm with you let's go a couple weeks later man we were in afghanistan you know, young dumb kid. What'd that look like? So, that, what, what? I mean, what kind of what? What they do? Say, all right, here's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of go people go figure it out. Yeah, like your got, dad used to say to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was like, hey, um, you know, call your family members. We're going in isolation Monday. We're doing what? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> What's isolation? Like this is how. Like I only only isolation I knew about was that Robin Sage. I didn't completely understand, right? And honestly. Most of the guys didn't either. It was like, just because I was new, none of the force had been to war either. There was still only a handful of guys in SF because only a handful of fifth group dudes got to play in the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. Handful of guys from Mogadishu, you know, no combat experience. Yeah, but I was going to say in your actual team, there might have been zero. 
the chief had stuff in South America in the 80s, mm-hmm. you know, but all, you know, by, with, and through advisement mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but yeah, man, so we're like, okay, well, here we go. And um, yeah, man, uh, got to go and be in Tor Bora, you know, so there was basically a lot of, because uh, it's funny for us, like we all know how it all played out, but I mean, there's an entire generation of Americans that were born either right at or after 9-11, who don't understand, right? There was two parts of Afghanistan. There was the Taliban, right? The horse soldiers and everybody that came down from the, the north and Bagram, you know, Triple Nickel, you know, all that team did all that. And then there was Tora Bora. Pardon me. And, um, you know, Al-Qaeda. So I got lucky enough to be involved in all of that. Uh, my team settled in Jalalabad. Where'd you fly? And, uh, where'd, where'd, how'd you get in there? Uh, Hilo. Yeah. So you heloed into Jalalabad. Did you guys get a? Um, we we heloed in south of Jalalabad, north of Torbor. And then what was your? What'd you do? Um, well, just supported mostly supported the JTACs and the CCT guys dropping bombs, <laughs> <Jack>. <laughs> <laughs> right? And tried to mostly coordinate and keep our. You know, there was two main warlords in this region, and one was Hazrat Ali, and the other was Zaman. And Zaman spoke English, and was the agency's pick to be that. Nangahar warlord, that Nangahar leader. Well, Zaman had lived in Britain for 10 or 12 years. He left Afghanistan. Hazrat Ali was Muj, man. He was he was a, a farmer, right? <laughs> you know, a lot of folks don't realize, man, you know, Afghanistan, of the 14 most opium-producing countries in the world, Afghanistan was number 14 when we invaded. It's number one right now. That's a horrible result of this war. Well, Hazar Ali, <laughs> who ultimately became the Minister of Defense of Afghanistan, was a farmer, um, but also a freedom fighter, a muj against the Taliban. The Taliban very much disallowed opium growth. You know, they they were all about they. You know, that was a sin. So, you know, we changed that by getting rid of the Taliban. All right, everybody started growing opium. You know, and wow, what beautiful fields! Those pink red flowers, man, they're beautiful. But ooh. It's just death growing out of the ground, you know? So anyway, yeah, man. Um, how long were you on the ground for? Uh, how long, how much time well, did you this spend is on where that my first fa- deployment? This is, that question is where my fairy tale of initial entry into special forces begins to end. <laughs> so fifth group wanted out as fast as they could. So January, February, they were already like, yeah, we're going to the Horn of Africa. When did you get there? November? Mm-hmm. So November, December, yeah. January, and fifth group is already. And fifth group is like, they want out. They want to get to the Horn of Africa, right? There's still no talk of Iraq at this point, right? It's like, oh, Horn of Africa, we're going to Somalia. And everybody wanted that. They're like, oh, okay, we're going to go get some and return that favor, right? That's a 10-year-old favor. We owe those Somalis. Everybody wanted to get there. Well, then the clear the battle plans changed, and Iraq became a thing. Well, so 19th group and third group start showing up. So they're like, hey, look, we're just going to, you're going to be continuity. You're going to help this next team rip in, right? So I got left and wound up staying like another six months, man. I was like, oh, no. So that was where that fairy tale, everything happening really cool, kind of went, oh, shit. But it wasn't bad because I wound up. Uh, being on a team with a bunch of dudes that, that were good friends of mine. I actually got to go be an LNO for a few weeks up in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. So as a, you know, 24, 25-year-old young little buck, um, my first experience in a former Soviet uh, area. It was nice, nice four weeks of partying. I was supposed to work at the embassy. I think I went to the embassy twice. <laughs> I was the assistant LNO. The LNO was this former... 10th group dude who had retired got called back in and he had been working like the miami dade um organized crime task force he was uh he uh, his name i'm not gonna say his name he uh he had a very ukrainian name he was from the ukraine he came to america when he was like 12 so he spoke russian ukrainian man he had all kinds of stuff going on in ukraine or not ukraine uh uzbekistan and uh he was connected as the lno up there if you needed something out of uzbekistan he could get it I mean, the second night I was up there, the dude took me to a party at the Uk- or, uh, Ukraine, Uzbekistan's president's daughter's house or mansion. This dude knew everybody. He was the quintessential SF guy, right? <laughs> but he's like almost 60. He's kind of overweight. He speaks Russian and um, he's, he's fluent. So 
like four days after I get up there, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to the States. So now I'm just up there, the assistant LNO, uh, and I'm living in the Sheraton, which that's Russian for a Sheraton Hotel. Um, that's all I learned. And, uh, <laughs> and so I just partied for like four weeks. And, um, you know, I, basically my job was to take, you know, my, my bud, my Uzbeki driver buddy, and go pick up people from the airport, take them to the hotel, and then take them back to the airport so they could fly into the FOB, you know. And uh, so, yeah, man, freaking pretty cool. But yeah, so back to Afghanistan and then finally home. And um, we, did you do any good ops? Like, what kind of missions were you doing? Yeah, we, we did a lot of cool stuff. You know, of course, you know, dropping all the bombs in mm-hmm. in, in um, Torbor was cool. Of course, we started, and there was still a lot of you know stuff out there. You know, we went after some um, um, daggone Chechens. Mm-hmm. You know, some of those as they were, you know, because. And were you guys already working with a partner force? Yeah, we started the initial, what became the commandos. It was called the MRF, the MRF, Mobile Reaction Force there in Jalalabad. Jalalabad wasn't a base. It was just a crappy airfield. Every time we went to get a resupply, we had to clear the airfield Mm -hmm. and uh, clear the runway, make sure they didn't put anything on it. You know, the MC-130s would, you know, squeak in in the middle of the night, drop our junk off. And um, so we started building what became Jalalabad's FOB. We built ranges out there <clears throat> and started training this uh, Hazar Ali's guys. And that, you know, I was talking about Zaman and Hazar Ali. They, they're the reason freaking uh, UBL got away. They were supposed to be helping us deal with Al Qaeda and they turned on each other, right? So Zaman, the CIA's pick, no one liked him. He had no real pull. He was nobody. Heck, most of these kids had never heard of him. And Ali, who's been there, you know, running the show, Mm -hmm. he's not having it. So, yeah, man, they start fighting with each other. And you got, like, you know, half the team's over there with them and some of the other teams. And then half of us are over here with Zaman or uh, Hazar Ali's guys. And they're fighting each other. And we're like, wait, 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 wait. We're supposed to be killing those dudes. So it, it screwed the war up for about three days as we sorted that mess out. And, yeah, man, that's when that's when he escaped. That's when he got away. How'd you guys sort that out? Um, ultimately, the agency stepped in. They were running the show there, mm-hmm. right? The Juliet teams, and you know we were basically supporting them. Um, and um, we had two masters, right? We had the FOB and, and fifth groups, uh, Colonel Mulholland, and then of course we had the the ground branch guys, and they they were running the show in, in Torbor. Mm-hmm. And um, so we uh, freaking sorted that mess out, and basically they told Zaman like, "Hey, stand down." Okay. And once everything was hashed out, settled back, everybody went to Jalabad. Zaman actually went back to the to Britain. They exiled mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what Hazar Ali told everybody that he exiled him. But really, the agency was like, "Hey, man, you just need to leave." Yeah, you're so out. So it was a bad call, and it was you know a, a one of those convenient things. He spoke English. Hazar Ali didn't. Bad call on our part on who we decided we thought we could put in power. Um, we didn't really understand how much influence Hazar Ali really had over the Pashtu people. Well, at least they had the humility to recognize that and say, right. all right, cool, we screwed this up. Let's get this guy out of here and, mm-hmm. and move forward. You know, it's yeah. interesting that <laughs> the history repeats itself, right? Like talking to the, the SF guys in Vietnam, they would have those like guys shoot each other on base between the 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 Mungs and the mm-hmm. whatever other yeah. groups like the regular Vietnamese, right. they, they'd get in fights right. and shoot each other. Yeah, <laughs> get, yeah. like well, and then they go out on a mission with these guys. That's one of our <laughs> biggest problems, right? We, for some reason, as Americans, we have this arrogance that we think everyone's like us and likes the things we like. And well, you know, we have this amazing experiment in America, this diversity that's never been this way anywhere else on the planet ever. So we can walk out on the street, go to McDonald's, and see 20 different ethnicities, freaking people from all around the world, right? At least their ancestors are. And in some cases, they literally just came from there. Mm-hmm. Well, in other countries, those people will fight each other, <laughs> right? They're like from different villages and different tribes, and they don't like each other, and they're never going to. Yeah. We think we can impose that, right? Like, Americans can't grasp why the Shia and the Sunni absolutely hate each other and will fight each other. And the only time they'll come together is to fight someone else they hate more, yeah. us or Israel. You know? um, yeah, you know, Americans, and, and we're bad about it. You know, we really think we can imply uh, or, or impose 
our way of doing things. And it, it, you know the deal, man. You got your colonel or whoever else at the FOB. We're out there living with these boys, you know, living with them. They're our, our team, and we're trying to explain all the dynamics of it. And you got some colonel who's never done even like FIDS or JSET, much less run an unconventional war with a partner force. It was frustrating, you know, because it, to me it's just simple. You know, it's like, hey, just be nice to all these people. Freaking stop treating them like crap and realize that that tribe and that tribe should not ever be put in the same unit and given loaded weapons. They will shoot each other. But it's us, you know, it's just how we do things. And like you said, we just repeat it time and time again. Yeah, sometimes I think it's, it's conceit or whatever arrogance that we think well if we tell you guys to work together we're gonna work together and sometimes i think it's just arrogance people just don't realize like hey hey these two these two people that you're talking to right now they don't they're not gonna get along ever 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 nothing you can do yeah unless for some reason well, they i guess have the a ever should be yeah, i was gonna say right. the ever as well if there's someone that they hate worse <laughs> they'll go against that yeah, person like, but as soon okay, as that person's gone we can be an ally for the next two days how yeah. much money are we gonna get out of this you know if it like and it, you know that's funny i, I i've I've always tried to tell folks there's a huge difference between allies and friends. And allies are usually pretty predictable because that means we have a a very common goal, a common enemy, a com- we have a commonality. Whereas friends a lot of times friends are that's a, a loose relationship based mostly on emotion. Right? Mm-hmm. And and you you see it all the time, right? Who who hurts our feelings the most? Our friends. Mm-hmm. Our allies are predictable. Right? When you go into an alliance, so like business advice, I've always given guys business advice. One of the lessons I learned was don't start a business with a friend. If you have to have a partner, and you shouldn't take a partner, but if you have to have a partner and get this endeavor started, do not do it with a friend. I, I haven't listened to that advice. Like all my businesses are with <laughs> all my friends. <laughs> I hope you've had better luck than I have. I've had good luck you know? with it, man. Good, man. It, it, it's hard, you know, when you got, especially we tend to like start businesses with guys like us. And we're all so hard headed and set in our ways and all that, you know. And if there's not some type of clear hierarchy in those um, operations agreements and that stuff that you can always go back to and be like, hey, buddy, this is what the company says. Well, in my case, we didn't even have like an operations agreement. We just started it and then it, you know. Uh, luckily, it didn't dissolve into where we hated each other or anything yeah. like that. But, you know, I, my dad always told me, man, he's like, if you don't need a partner, don't have one. <laughs> you know? And then, sure enough, he was right. You know, like, wow, that dude was smart. Um, but, yeah, man, the career was awesome. I uh, So so how yeah. so you end up going to – so you end up spending this first, like, what is it? You end up nine months in Afghanistan with um, a little bit of time in Uzbek? Yeah, almost seven and a half months. Seven right. and a half yeah. months. And then what happens? So went home and uh, and when you're in the National Guard, are you, so you're in the National so, Guard. Yeah, but I'm on, you, I'm on active duty. Okay, orders. so it's no different, right? No different. So you know the guard guys would mobe and demobe, and there'd be two months on the you know if they let's say they deployed for eight months, and that was pretty typical. It was two months of mobe and then two months of demobe for a total of a year um, deployment. Got it. And so and eight was, months deployment. Two months on the front end, two right. months on the back end. That became the standard for SF, uh, National Guard. Well, mine was kind of like, well, what do I do now? Who do I belong to? Who am I working for? And um, so I was lucky. I freaking went and did some the, the counter drug uh, mission for the National Guard. It's advisement to law enforcement. So I did that until. Stateside? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's. Uh, it's Providing surveillance training, um, you know, the deal was yeah. like, eh, it's kind of, po- what about Pasta Cobra <laughs> Skirt. Well, you know, we're unarmed most of the time. You know, sometimes you, you know, no, we're really going to go out in the middle of West Virginia and yeah. surveil these meth heads with yeah. 30 out six rifles. I'm probably going to carry my personal firearm and deal with the ramifications later. Yeah. Um, and I've had a couple of times where meth heads, like, we were, were in snow. We actually didn't think he was home. He must have been sleeping it off, you know, because meth heads would, you know, they'd be up for days and then they'll sleep for days. And we thought this meth trailer, there was no, you know, they weren't cooking or whatever. And uh, we're sitting on the side of this mountain. It's snow. We're wearing woodland camouflage. Freaking, we're messing about. We didn't build a high site. Sun come up. We're not taking it seriously. And I mean, we're like 250 meters from this dude's, uh, it's like a cabin and a trailer up in this holler in West Virginia. Dude, he comes out. And start scanning 
with his hunting rifle and a scope. Dang. And we're just <laughs> sitting there trying to, like, get behind, uh, you know, trees. Dude, we're sticking out like sore thumbs, and we're not wearing overwhites or anything. Just dumb. Because, like I said, we weren't taking it seriously. You know, we'd just been to Afghanistan. <laughs> we're a bunch of tough guys. What's this dumb redneck going to do? Well, lucky that redneck didn't see us and shoot us, right? Because, let's face it, redneck boys, you know, they can shoot. It wouldn't have been the first time he shot something with that hunting rifle, you know? And I was like, oh, good God. I was running a yeah. recon course one time. This is like before the war. And I had this group up in the mountains. And they're, they're like laid up in hindsight, right? And I'm a land grader, right? So I'm, I'm out there. But I'm camied up, too, because I'm all fired up. So I would like sneak around. And so I'm kind of <laughs> sneaking up on them to kind of observe what they're doing to make sure that they're being squared away. Mm -hmm. And as I'm sitting there observing them, and I'm not that far away from them, I'm like 50 meters away, a guy, I hear like a dog, right? And I'm like, oh, these guys are gonna get you know busted. This is gonna be cool, I'm gonna watch the whole thing. So a guy comes down, he's got two freaking German shepherds with him, and they look badass. They look like freaking wolves. And so the guys, you know, I'm watching this whole thing play out. And the, you know, you, the guys pick up that they're coming because they, it was a squared away little crew. They they pick up the guy come. They like fade in. They're they're hunkered down. Guy comes walking down this path. It wasn't even a road. It was a path. And he doesn't. He's none the wiser. And all of a sudden, the dogs, bro. The dogs are like they stop. They start growling. And all of a sudden, the guy like starts scanning. Yeah. He reaches but. down and pulls out a forty-five, bro. And I'm like 50 meters away, and I go. Ex so the guys, I, I just go. Excuse me, sir. You know, because I'm. We're in America. Like right. this guy doesn't know what the hell's going right. on, man. I'm like, excuse me, sir, sir. You know, sir. It's okay. I said we're in the military. We're on a training operation, but yeah, it was uh, not a good scenario <laughs> to have going yeah, down. Man. There was lots of uh, things like that. You know, especially in the urban side. Um. Heck, good friend of mine, they called him the SF Cowboy. They used his likeness in that video game and all that. I don't know if you remember some of the first pictures that came out of Afghanistan. Big dude, sleeves cut off, big old beard. <laughs> he was my roommate. Right? Well, we're sitting in a little minivan, right, watching this house. And freaking, I'm like, oh, crap. I mean, it's like 2 in the morning, you know? And freaking dude walks up. Oh, shit. Revolver pointing at us. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Freaking rolls it down. Most of the time we had a law enforcement guy with us, mm -hmm. but in this case it was him and I and the law enforcement dudes were in another car up the road. And now it's like, hey, bro, hey, 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 hey. Well, he's just a concerned citizen. You know what yeah. I mean? And we're lucky, you know, that could have gone so bad. Can you imagine the headline? <sighs> right? Like, say one of us made a mistake and put him on the dirt. You know, an American civilian? <sighs> Yeah, and you know, so since then I've done a couple of things where I'm advising law enforcement in the states, Minneapolis, right? Mm. A couple of years, year, year before last, right? When that whole mess kicked off, and it's like, hey man, I don't care if you're far left, I don't care if you're BLM and rioting, right? You're an American. I'm not squeezing the trigger on an American, right? You can't. It's wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're threatening me, that's different. But just, mm. hey, man, if you're robbing and looting a Best Buy, mm, then to me, that's not something I can pull the trigger on somebody for, man. It's just not in my in my book. And it's weird. You know, it's weird. Like, you have to remind guys, like, hey, guys, this is not an operation. We are here in advisement only, only if you have done everything you can to get out of that situation. And it's defense of yourself a third party, man, right? Like, because the, the backlash of something like that would be huge. Uh, you know, there was those, um, there was that old, uh, the border surveillance thing. Oh, those yeah, Marines yeah, yeah. shot yep. that guy, like, in the oh, late 90s. I don't uh, remember I forgot that. the name of the, it was it had an, an operational yeah, name it was or whatever. Like, yeah, they, they'd send all kinds of guys down. Yeah, there yeah, stuff. and the Marines shot that one fella. And that was a big deal, and they shut that program down. Um, and we were kind of, like, a part of that same mm -hmm. umbrella. Um but yeah, we always used to, you know, joke, and it's not really that funny now that I'm older. That you know, yeah, post posse comitatus, you know. Now I look back and I'm like, should the military and the agency be allowed to advise? Because let's face it, right? Like um, in Waco, there were tier one advisors on the ground. You know, that that stuff that's kind of scary, man. You know, because 
you know, the, the rule of law says that our intelligence organizations and our military can't operate here. Of course, the National Guard gets around it a little bit with that yeah. state mission. Yeah. But it's scary, right? That there's a reason Pasacomas exists, so that yeah. military can't turn its weapons towards our population. So looking back, like I, I, I'm like, man, we were we were kids, we were joking, like, eh, Pasacomatized. Now I'm like, woo, mm. it's not funny anymore, right? Like, you know, when you're when you're young and dumb, you make jokes that are inappropriate because you're young and dumb. And now I look back, I'm like, I don't know that we should be doing that, right? Like. I know law enforcement needs help, but yeah, they probably a, shouldn't be getting it from us. There's definitely a, I don't there's know. A, there's a positive and negative to it too, because obviously, if you have guys that can help law enforcement improve their what they do, like that's beneficial. And then there's two two sides of that coin too, because guys that are in the military have a certain mindset. Part of that mindset is. Hey man, we've been through this before. Somebody gets starts getting crazy. We're not worried about it. We're not freaking out. Like we'll right. deescalate. In many cases, deescalate better than someone that hasn't been in these shitty situations before. Right. But then, not all military is created equal. So you might get someone from the same unit that goes, "If somebody does that shit, you gotta freaking go." And you're like, "No, actually, that's mm. not the right answer." So it, it that there's a there can be a positive, there can be a negative. Uh, that both those situations, you could have somebody from the military perform awesome. Right. You could also have someone from the yeah. military do something stupid. I mean, just because you're in the military doesn't mean you're. It doesn't mean it doesn't. It doesn't mean shit. They're, right. they're all over the map, you know, all yeah. over the map. I Some know. guys tactically, they were in the military for twenty years. They're tactical idiots. Right. You know, I, I've gotten that a couple of times with the whole campaign. Like, well, just because you're a veteran doesn't mean you're. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. Being a veteran doesn't mean that I was even good at being a military guy, <laughs> right? Like, just because you were in the service doesn't mean you're even good at whatever your job was in the service. So it definitely doesn't automatically qualify you to be a politician. Uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like my experiences completely make me unqualified <laughs> to be a typical politician, yeah. right? Like, I'm just, what I'm kind of getting at here yeah. is that, yeah, I'm not a politician and never have been, and that's what our country needs right now. And my experiences in the military have set me up to where I could go do good things for our country and never become a politician. I don't have that in my blood. It's just not how I am. Yeah, but. as I look at everything that's going on the last six months after the downfall of Afghanistan, and then even looking at Afghanistan, Iraq, and then you just compare all that to Vietnam, and you say to yourself, like like those lessons, uh, every lesson that we you can look back at Afghanistan and say, wow, you know, we learned this. We already knew this. We already knew this stuff from Vietnam. And so when it comes to people being in the government that are figuring out where we're going to war, I, I used to think, yeah, you know, somebody should somebody should uh, be in the military if they're going to serve in in the government. You know, if they're going to be a politician, they should have yeah. they should have served in the military. It'd be, be helpful. Right, I used to think that, like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like, oh yeah, that, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You understand what continued but, service, yeah, continued all that service, stuff. and like, oh yeah, you yeah. know what it's like. But now I'm, we absolutely need military people that are that understand these lessons to the core. That aren't just thinking with the arrogance that that the the generation that just sent us to war. Like, yeah, oh, let's yeah. fight. We'll fight for American principles and but. The, the, or, or even Wait, more who's so. gonna fight right you say we who's the no. we oh no no not we yeah right yeah those military yeah folks. those military and, guys and, are gonna i mean fight. Isn't, it, isn't it funny right you'll hear about folks who had these awesome blessed lives uh, maybe um like tillman nfl football player you hear these crazy stories about these people who had these awesome jobs or maybe they came from this awesome family and they go and he enlisted like, like it's automatically assumed because he came from a, 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 an amazing family that he should have been an officer, right? Like that prejudice is weird. So the fact that a rich, well-to-do guy enlists and goes to fight for war, that's a story. Why is that a story? That shouldn't be a story, but it is, right? And I just use Tillman because he's mm -hmm. such a, a famous story. And what, what an amazing man, you know, freaking pro football player. You know, life is set for this guy. Quits that and listen to Ranger Regiment, right? Like, whoa, bro, you really asking for it. Like, that's some American stuff. But my point is, who's going to war? Typically, it's just those young, 
what else did you have to do with your life type of guys, you know? And, and, and the guys, like a lot of us, right? Let's face it, you know, a lot of upper middle class dudes and soft, you know, and, you know, but, and, and feel that calling that I, I need to do this stuff because their dad lets them watch Rambo when they're a kid. <laughs> right? But, um, yeah, man, Congress, right, is the only part of our government per the Constitution that can declare war. How is it we've been at war for 20 years? What's the point? What was the point, right? Because in, in Jalalabad, which has been considered for 10, 12 years now a hot spot, right? But in January, February, March of 2002, I was walking around the market without a gun. I'd hop on the ATV, jump in the truck, hop in the car with one of my troopers, one of my Afghanis. Run down, wear an Afghani garb. The biggest threat to me in that market or anywhere in Jalalabad or all of Nangahar province was having the people hug me too tightly. That was the biggest threat to me. Or maybe a car accident because traffic's crazy. You know, they loved us. They loved us. So what happened? The conventional military showed up so all the colonels and generals can get their stars and their awards and get their promotions. Those politicians, because let's face it, right? <laughs> Once you become a certain level, whether it's enlisted or officer, right, your career becomes that thing. And then looking out for your other, you know, upper senior officers, senior enlisted, we got to get them bronze stars. We got them purple hearts. Our, our unit needs medals. Our unit needs combat. Because, you know, to become a general without a CIB in the Army, in this time frame, ooh, you got to go get some, right? And you're going to probably need a silver star, at least a bronze star would be. So how am I going to do that unless I go to war? So let's take these strikers and these M2 Bradleys and destroy roads and run over innocent people. And they weren't doing it on purpose. They're just, that's the conventional military. They have tanks. And, you know, I've never driven a striker before, but I've sat in a hatch and I'm like, how can you drive this thing without running over everything, you know? And they're like, well, well you do run over everything because it can. Well, you know what, man? We made those enemies. We made the enemies. The, we're now fighting the second generation. We're fighting the sons of the men we killed in Torbor. We're fighting the sons of the men we killed in the Shaikha and Helmand and everywhere else at the beginning of that war. We created that enemy. And the same thing happened in Iraq. And, you know, let's face it, right? Afghanistan was righteous. You know, Al-Qaeda needed to fall. I, looking back, is it a good strategy to topple regimes that are predictable? The Taliban was very predictable. The Taliban has never met the requirement to be listed as a terrorist organization. They were a sovereign nation. And yes, they had horrible, horrible means and human rights abuses, but they were a sovereign nation. Gaddafi, sovereign nation. Freaking Iraq. Sovereign nation with dictators, and dictators are predictable. They care about one thing. First and foremost, their main priority is their power. So they're predictable. You know, in the interviews with Saddam, you know, he talks about, like, I thought y'all were kidding. He was like, I, I thought y'all were making it up that you thought I had weapons of mass destruction. I haven't had gas in years. I don't have any of that stuff. In his interviews, you know, he's going, I really didn't think y'all were going to invade. So why did we? I have my own theories. My theory is because people say we went to war for oil. I'm like, have you seen the oil prices? We didn't go to war for oil. We went to war with Iraq to stop its oil production. The prices went up. Because if we had pumped oil out of Iraq, we wouldn't have made, all the oil companies wouldn't have made money. Right? Because that's a new source that we didn't, they didn't have rights or access to. You stop the oil. All right? Lower the supply, demand stays at or continues to increase, prices go up. So that's a little bit of my theory on that, but whatever. Either way, at least, and that's only based off of what I have seen since, right? When we first invaded Iraq, I was, woo, let's go, you know, like every other little young trooper. But really, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, thousands of Americans, and, and what did we get Right, if you tell me, you know, because war was supposed to be ex for expansion, um, 
minerals, riches, right? Throughout human history, war has been to expand your empire. Well, we suck at being an imperial power because <laughs> we go to these wars and we do nothing with the spoils. So why do we keep sending Americans? Because let's face it, was it really for our national defense or was it for our national interests? Because that's two very different things. Most of my work throughout my life has been for interests, less about defense. Because once Al-Qaeda was destroyed and eliminated, and even ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, were they ever really capable of attacking us here? Yeah, you know, they flew the planes into those towers and killed 3,000 plus people. But did they ever really threaten our daily lives? Did they threaten America, the United States? Probably not, you know, right? Could they ever have brought that war on a large scale to America and affected the average American's daily life? No, they didn't have that capability. And after, I mean, clearly, right? Like none of that's really... We haven't had any big attacks since 9-11. I think they just blew their wad. They were done. They, they didn't really, I don't think they had any, any plan after that. Right? <laughs> it was like, oh, no crap, now what? We pissed these guys off and they're coming for us. Now what? Right? They never really did anything since. So my point is, right, like where has Congress been? Where has our representatives and our Senate been these last 20 years? The military industrial complex continues to make big time money, big time money. When our enlisted soldiers are in barracks that are covered in mold, just nastiness, right? They're living in poverty. Whereas you can go to the general's house on any post and it's a well-groomed lawn and it's basically a little mansion, right? So, so what did we get out of these wars? Well, it's arguable, right? It's very arguable. But the bottom line is Congress has continued to set aside its authority its duty, its role, its responsibility to either declare war or cut the funding. They didn't cut the funding. No. A lot of people got rich off these wars. And I mean, I was a contractor. I Guilty, I, I, I got paid for going to war. Now, did I get paid like Glock or, you know, Northrop or Raytheon or? No, of course not. But... Well, you got a positive outlook, believe it or not, from my perspective, because the positive outlook would be that somebody was smart enough to figure out that if they did this stuff, uh, they'd be able to raise the price of oil and these other. I, 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 that's to me, that's a positive outlook to think that someone was smart enough to actually craft the things that you're saying. Right. I don't know if they actually it was planned or if it just we didn't stumble into it. Here's because, what I, yeah. Because I worry about they, people are you know, at least conspiracy theorists. I'm like, half the time they can't figure out where the bathroom is. That's what makes, that's what, that's what disturbs me more right. than anything else is that it's the arrogance combined with the being naive, the naive to think, okay, here's what's going on in Iraq. Look, we know that Saddam's not a good guy. We can probably create some kind of a good ally there, and we can probably just turn this into a democracy because we like democracy and we, you know, we like it. And all those people must want to be free too. And we've got people that came from Iraq or that are, are in Iraq that say, "Hell yeah, we want to be free." So cool. Let, let's invade. And in their minds, it plays out. Hey, it's going to be like the first Gulf War. It'll take us, you know, a couple weeks. Then we'll start to we'll get rid of the bath party. We'll establish. We'll start building WalMarts. Right. That I think that that's what they thought more Probably. than anything else. Probably. And it's just it's just an arrogant. It's just arrogance. It's well, it's not just arrogance. It's arrogance and it's ignorance yeah. to think that you can go and you know there's a when it comes to the economy, right? When you start trying to dictate, when you start having a centralized economy, it's you cannot pull it off. You can't do it. You can't pull off a centralized economy. That's why communism doesn't work. Right. You have to let the free market kind of do its thing. So if you think, if, you, if, you, if we know that you can't control an economy, which is a finite thing and a controllable thing in some, in some feasible way, right. And we can't control it, but at least you can understand what it is. But now we think we're going to take a bunch of millions of people and predict how they're going to respond and predict what the secondary tertiary effects are going to be with what they think and how they're going to behave. Like that's yeah. completely insane yeah. to think that. We, we think we are going to control the future with other people. We think we understand what they're doing. We, we can't. So we have to start behaving in a way that we, we utilize our power 
to make, to attempt to influence, but we can't think to ourselves that the things are gonna play out the way we think they're gonna play out, because they don't, they don't. They couldn't even figure out these two freaking guys in Afghanistan. One of them's from England. (laughs) Hey, everyone's gonna listen to this guy. Meanwhile, this local here that's been running shit for years, and we think this other guy's gonna fly in from England. He speaks English, he must be smart. Everyone's gonna listen to him. No, no, and then you just play that out over and over and over again in a bunch of different scenarios in Iraq and in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and that's what you end up with. So that's why I'm so happy that guys like you are stepping up, people that understand that we don't understand, people that understand that we can't control everything, people that understand that the enemy gets a vote, the civilians get a vote, (laughs) like all those things come into play. And we run around like we can figure it all out. Nothing is two plus two equals four. It's (laughs) always an equation with hundreds if not thousands of variables. And anytime you change one variable, to get the continued result, you're gonna have to change every variable or many of them, right? And and Americans, we, a couple are, you know, that arrogance, right? So what is, I always say, arrogance is ignorance and cockiness combined. (laughs) And, And Lord knows we are a lot of ignorance and then you've got the cockiness, and, and we think, we really think that people want 5G or 4G or 3G or whatever it was 10 years ago. We, they, they want that. But you've got this culture that no one wants to bother to understand. Who understands the culture of the Afghanis? Who understands the culture of the Azidi in northern Iraq or the Kurds in very north Iraq or the Shia in southeastern? Who understands this stuff? The guy on the ground. The guy on the ground. You know, we were talking about, you know, um, are you familiar with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller? Yeah. yeah. The Marine Corps. He was on the podcast, yeah. He, he was yeah, on the yeah. podcast, right? Right, yeah. I haven't talked to Stu in a couple of weeks. He and I went down to the border. And um, I told him, I was like, hey, bro, I got a, so, uh, he and I joke about how we met. We, we talked through it. We were on with uh, Evan and JT with a uh, black rifle. And, mm-hmm. and we were talking about how we met. It's a pretty funny story. But, um, we went down there and we talked with a border patrol agent who's a very good friend of mine and uh, of course off unofficial because he would get fired for even entertaining having a, co- a conversation with a congressional candidate or house of representatives candidate but he talked to us and he showed us some places we could go and what to look for and broke it down for us nothing in the media that i had heard was anything like the border really is, at least in this section, in this section of Texas around Roma and Rio Grande City. And it was just nothing like I thought, because we were on the ground. He, that fellow, that border patrol agent, he's the guy on the ground. I just went and got some info from him. And then we went driving around and stuff and looked, and everything he told us was exactly the way it was. And I was like, holy crap, man. But the border patrol's on basically a gag order, man. They talk to somebody, they, their job's over, done. Right. So, yeah, man, uh, Colonel Scheller and I, the funny thing is, man, he I got word that he might run for house. You know, he went out of the Marine Corps yet. And uh, I was like, Oof. and I hadn't announced yet either. So a friend of ours, a mutual friend, a major who had worked for Colonel, um, I reached out. I was like, hey, he's like, hey, Zach, gave me your number, says you want to talk to me. I'm like. Yes, sir, you know, um, our career paths may be about to collide. It'd be nice if we could just meet face-to-face and chat. He was like, okay, well, I'm up in Emerald Isle. You willing to come up here? Yep. How's tomorrow morning? Sat down and was like, here you think about running in the fourth. And he was, because <laughs> apparently at that time he had told two people. The fact that I knew it blew him away. He's like, whoa. <laughs> is this dude you know luckily my team uh my consulting team are very well connected and super smart guys or whatever so anyway we sat and chatted it was a really cool conversation i'm talking about mature adult conversation because he could have easily been like you know an arrogant dick and been like whatever i'll run against whoever i want but we said hmm we're two very similar types do we really need to run against each other I live in the fourth. He doesn't. And now it's not the fourth anymore, mm-hmm. but we can get to that. And uh, it was just a really cool conversation, a little coffee shop there in Emerald Isle, North Carolina. And we left it with, and I just, you know, I gained a lot of respect for the man when he's, he was like, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to think this over. I don't even know if I'm going to get out of the Marine Corps in enough time to even, you know, get in the race, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to think it over. Um, 
He's like, when are you going to announce on this day? He's like, okay, well, two days prior, I'll let you know. He's like, at least then you'll know if we're running against each other. I'm like, Roger that. Thanks. Anyway, the Marine Corps, it didn't work out or whatever. And, and it, it didn't work out for him. I would like to think he'll run in 2024. You know, um, I know he's considering it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot can happen in two years. But, um, yeah, man, what a what a good guy, man. He's definitely a Marine Corps officer, right? <laughs> like, you know, you guys talked with him, right? He is raw, you know. <laughs> but that we need some of that, man. We need some of that. I mean, that dude, through his... 17 almost 18 year career out the window to just stand up and say something which is funny because like i hear and see people on the internet like condemning him for it and i'm like enlisted guys i'm like fellas we have been begging pleading wishing a colonel would stand up and now you are trying to say this this man is doing it for recognition like just sit down and talk to him for two minutes, and you'll find it out. Not so much, but yeah, we we were uh, we were in Roma, Texas, and uh, we we found out we were looking like the people aren't coming across the border in the middle of the desert. They're coming across like the bridge that goes across. There's the border patrol checkpoint at Roma. They're walking under the bridge, coming up, hitting the cul-de-sac, and every night they get picked up by the border patrol buses and taken to the detainment facility. They're not stinking across in the middle of the desert. They're walking right up into town, sitting down, getting picked up every night. That's been going on for months, right? This whole shipping them around the nation thing, that's not new. It's been going on for months. I had no idea. I was, th those headlines had just broke the day before. I was like, holy crap, when did this start happening? My buddy was like, bro, we've been shipping illegals around this country for nine months, bro. He's like, the numbers are down. I'm like, yeah? He's like, yeah, it was 2,000 coming across the border in this little section every night. He goes, and then the cartels figured out and the, they all figured out, right, that the Border Patrol can only pick up about 200 a night. So now only 200 a night come across. On the other side, on the Mike side of the border, they have warehouses or hotels, and it costs to stay there. But they only let 200 each night. So the cartel, the cost to come across the border, not, not being ferried, not the coyote, not transportation, the cartel's tax or fee to walk across the border to get your armband so you can walk across the border. It's like armband. What, the would, cartel gives them an armband? Mm -hmm, Legit? Mm -hmm, an armband. On our side, nothing but trash. Armbands. It's like going into a club. You pay, mm -hmm. you get your armband. You're clear to go across. Well, and armbands are color-coded from which country you come from because in those warehouses that you can see from America right over there on the mic side, they're basically hotels, or it's just cots and, mm -hmm. and floor mats. Every night you stay there is $100. To walk across that border is $900 to $1,200, according to where you, for where you come from. Or if you don't want to spend a couple nights in that hotel warehouse, you can pay more. But that's what it costs. In Texas alone last year, 1.7 million illegal immigrants, illegal crossers of our border, were detained. That's just how many were detained in Texas. Just Texas. That's how many were detained. Not how many people came on across in this whole evolution of the Border Patrol and Customs facilitating the integration and ferrying throughout the country. It used to be, you know, coyotes would continue and pick up. Well, we destroyed that business and gave it all the cartels. So 1.7 million, let's say 1,000 bucks times $1,000. And we can only guess that double that were not in detained. So let's just right. call it an even three mil times $1,000. That's what we gave the cartels just in Mexico. And when I say we gave it to them, we created this marketplace for them. That's what this administration did by opening the borders. They created a marketplace where the, the cartels, now they don't really even care about drugs. The drugs that are coming across our border now are coming across in a backpack, not truckloads. There's no more marijuana coming across in truckloads. That's very, they're not seizing marijuana anymore. It's backpacks of fentanyl and heroin. Because 30 pound backpack of fentanyl, I can damn near kill the whole East Coast. Stuff is so potent. 30, 40 pounds of black tar, unprocessed opium, hash, bring it to the States, process it into heroin. One backpack turns into freaking half a million dollars worth of heroin. How do we combat that? 
if we don't get serious about true border security and even beyond that, right? Because the Lord knows that's one of my problems with Americans, but Republicans more so that everything's a linear solution, build a wall. And then what? No one's asking, and then what? So we build this wall. We're going to do put guns on it. People are like, yeah. Okay, so we're going to shoot our southern neighbors who want to come to America. Okay. I don't blame them for wanting to come here. But there's a line. Get in the back of it. There's a line to come here. So, yes, it's, it's got to be multifaceted, right? It can't be just build a wall. That, that's not solving the problem. That's just a measure to slow part of the result of the problem the illegal immigration. Why are our neighbors wanting to come here so badly? Because all our southern neighbors, their countries are crap. Had we adhered to the Monroe Doctrine and quit worried about Europe, quit worrying about the Middle East, I mean, we spent billions in movies. What if we had invested that in our southern neighbors instead of letting, say, I don't know, one of the richest, richest, wealthiest countries in the world, Venezuela, fall to communism right underneath our noses? Why? Why did we do that? Why are we not actually helping Mexico? Oh, we want to take these hard lines and look like a bunch of tough guys. It's not solving the problem. It, and, and it kills me that that's, that's all, all these solutions, right? When you, like all my opponents across the nation, if you, if you talk to Republican candidates for any office from city council, probably to the next president, they're going to have one linear solution for any problem you talk to them about. Because what? Talking points. Mm -hmm. But no one's actually discussing root causes of problems. So the border security, a wall, is a measure, not a solution. It's not, it's not going to solve the problem. You build a wall, well, there's these two bodies of water <laughs> on each side of it, right? You know the deal? There's not a single security measure put on this planet. You, whatever you build, whatever security protocol you build, there's guys like us that can get around it, right? It's just like lawyers, right? Lawyers can write a bunch of legal documents and then some other lawyers can figure out how to screw that. <laughs> it's the same thing, isn't that warfare? It's like your, your enemy does this, they set up these obstacles, you figure out how to get around them. Well, here's an idea. Let's address it at its root cause. And I don't know, maybe the demand to come here, well, let's say 20 years from now. Oh, my God. And that's not an American thing, right? 20 <laughs> years from now. We Next typically, election cycle only. Four years only, right? <laughs> Americans think in four-year blocks if we're lucky. Well, what if 20 years from now Mexico is a thriving ally and there's no cartels? We help them get rid of it. We give them incentives to stop teaming up with the cartels. Same goes for Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador. We help them with the game problems. We help them. And I don't mean just toss money at it and waste money. When I say invest, right? Invest means there's a implied return on that investment, right? Americans, when our Congress just allocates funds, they just throw money at things. They don't actually follow up or have measures in place to re ensure our return on investment. So my point here is, man, that, that's part of why I'm running is I'm so tired of these very linear band-aids to hemorrhaging wounds, you know. And the, the wall is just one great example of that, you know. I mean, and name any other hot topic right now. Um, abortion, ban it. The same people that say banning abortion will solve that problem are the same people that will tell you that banning guns won't get rid of guns. Where, where's the logic and reason here, folks? So like with abortion, yeah, man, it's, it's horrible, right? I mean, even people who are pro-choice will go, yeah, it's bad. And it's very, it, only the craziest of the crazy are like for abortion, right? That's, that's, human beings are not for killing unborn children, generally speaking. So why are we having abortions, right? Let's make them illegal. Okay, cool. Let's make them illegal. We're done. But we're not done because we haven't addressed why are we, why are women wanting or feeling the need to abort their unborn child? First of all, the three of us, 
will never ever be able to understand, sympathize with a woman that is so desperate that she wants to abort her child, right? It's just, a, a, first of all, we have to say that out loud, right? So let's bring in the experts. Let's talk to some ladies. I know that sounds crazy, right? <laughs> let's go find the subject matter experts and figure out why this is happening. Well, I ask people all the time, what's the number one demographic in America having abortions? Do you guys know? Put you on the spot, right? Yeah, I was a little surprised too. 17 to 22 year old upper middle class white women. Why? Well, because their fathers have told them they need to go to college, because modern feminism have told them that they need to go to college. They need to get careers. And a child inhibits that. Right? And, and this is a very summarized version of this very, very complex problem. So, what if we, as a community, as a, a government, right? It's okay for the government to do things for the community, right? Like, we can, we can have some good social welfare problems, right? Things that support the wellness of our communities and our culture and our nation. So, when I use welfare, I don't mean just throwing money at stuff and not expecting some type of return. So, if we start saying, okay, what if we create a robust and efficient adoption program. What if there's assistance for these women to carry their children to term instead of terminating them? What if? And I say what if because I don't know the answer, right? And that's, that's weird for a political candidate to tell you he doesn't know for sure what he's talking about, right? But we know that, right? We come up with courses of actions and then say, okay, we're gonna do this and then we try to anticipate what our adversary is going to do if we do x they'll do y and then this is how well that's this is how we have to war game all these things right so if we sit down and say okay because here's a here's a really bad thing about the adoption process in america today me and melissa are not married right we see marriage as an agreement between she and i and god not the state of north carolina also she's a very pragmatic practical person and she wants to hold the whole thing that if she gets tired of me, she can just boot me or walk away. <laughs> How long y'all been together? Ten and a half years. Sure. We're, we're married. In my eyes, my heart, my soul, I'm married to that woman, and she's the most precious thing on this planet to me. Right? Like, precious. She's the only one. That's how precious she is. So, if she and I wanted to adopt, it could take three to five years. If me and you want to adopt, right, <laughs> we could have a kid in a year. Or less. That's how our cultures evolve now, right? A, a gay couple can adopt very quickly. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Or me and Melissa could go out of the country and buy a child. We could adopt from Africa or China. Let's face it, you're buying a child when you do that because it costs a lot of money. But you can do it, and you can do it in a matter of weeks. <laughs> Typically speaking, when someone adopts out of Africa, Different countries, different way, right? But you go over, you visit, come back, you go back for the next trip, and you have your child. It's efficient, and it's a good thing, right? Like these are, these are parents who want children, who can't have them for whatever reason, and then there are these children that need parents. We have so many in America, but so why are Americans leaving America, the United States, to go adopt children from other countries? When we have kids right here, and we have a, an abortion problem, why? Because it's easier, you know. Like, let's face it, right? I mean, let's say, let's say Melissa couldn't have kids. Right? That's not why we don't have kids. We don't have kids because it's just kind of a choice. We've been busy. She's been busy with her career, and I've been busy with mine. And um, so, if we wanted to, it takes time, right? But we could go get a kid. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So my point to all that is, whether it's the border or abortion or name it, you've got all these candidates and these politicians, right? Because right now a lot of politicians, sitting already elected politicians, they're now candidates again. Midterms are coming. They have these one-liners, these talking points. And then they go back to D.C. and they don't really do anything. It's so frustrating to me, man, because let's face it, right? We're problem solvers. 
you know, we're given problems every single day, whether it's how to fit that much equipment on that one truck, because that other truck is deadlined, <laughs> right? Or supply won't give us another truck, you know, because some sergeant major needs that truck um, for his ride to the chow hall or whatever, you know. We solve problems with very little. And, and at this point in our nation's history and future, present and future, you know, we, we need those type of people. We need guys from our community and, and, and gals from the global war on terrorism, those type of veterans who are problem solvers, who have seen, you know, the neglect and the abuse and the, the fraud, waste and abuse. That's what these wars have been. You know, Afghanistan highlights it, but people don't realize how many billions of dollars of equipment we left in Iraq, too, that we had to destroy in Syria because they ISIS took it, drove it across the border, and then fought us with it. But there's still billions upon billions of dollars of equipment in Iraq. Now, we haven't abandoned Iraq. We abandoned Iraq, too. It was just less publicized, less emotional um, for a lot of the servicemen and women because of just the way Afghanistan happened so quickly, it was really easy for the media to cover, so on and so forth. And then all the debacle in Kabul at the airfield, that was definitely, the media loved putting yeah, that on the TV. Media. Yeah, it was a, a disastrous you know, show. Iraq happened over a course of nu numerous years, and they're not interested in covering that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I mean, anyway. <laughs> the uh, one thing I talk about a lot when I talk about leadership, I wrote about in one of my books, iterative decision-making process, which means you don't know necessarily what's gonna happen and you don't necessarily have all the information. So what do you do, you sit there and just do nothing? No, you go, okay, well, here's a step that I think this might have an impact, a positive impact, let me try this one step. Right. You try that one step. Then you get what the feedback is. If the feedback is good, you say, Continue. okay, well that was good, let's do a little bit more in that direction. Okay, great, oh, it's still yeah. working, that's super. Yeah. Oh, let's try a little bit more in that direction. Oh, wait a second, now we're getting negative feedback. What we thought was gonna happen isn't happening. Do we double down? No, we actually say, oh, let's make some that's adjustments right. to what Absolutely. our plan, what our strategy is. Yeah. And that, that's what was, as you look at uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam, you can see inflection points along the way where the, the direction we were going was not clearly giving good feedback. Now, do you um, immediately abandon it? No, maybe you press, okay, let's try Adjust. a little bit more, let's make some adjustments. Yeah. Oh, wait a second, oh wait, it's definitely not working. Right. Okay, so what should we do? We should try a different plan, we should try a different strategy, and we shouldn't be afraid to say, you know what, we were wrong about this, and we are going to back out, and we are going to provide a different type of effort to try and solve this problem. So, like you said, a lot of politicians, a lot of, not just politicians, Man. people, human beings, don't want to say, hey, wrong. I'm, I messed up here. I was wrong about this. Here's my adjustments. Here's what we're going to do. I'm open to ideas. COVID. Classic. When it first happened, all of us were like, whoa, okay. Um, yeah, man, I started carrying some hand sanitizer. I, you know, I put Melissa go bag together for the first time, right? I'm not a, I'm not really a prepper. I'm more of a, well, if shit hits fan, I've got enough that I'll be able to make it, right? You've been prepping. <laughs> I'm good, right? I'm mentally prepped. You know, um, she drives back and forth to Wilmington, you know, an hour. So I was like, mm, you know what? You know, she, she competes in three gun and she's doing some of the tactical games and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, she can shoot, right? She goes to the range by herself and all that, you know, she's got her own M4 and all that kind of stuff. So we actually packed it up through a little 72 hour go bag mm -hmm. in her trunk, right? We were all like, this pandemic might be something. Mm -hmm. Within about six weeks, we were like, mm. and we all knew like these cloth masks, right? Like we, we've all done sea burn, right? We've all done some counter proliferation of biological nuclear and, and those, those suits and the gas masks and all that stuff, right? It's like, that might stop a yeah, virus. That might. And now you're telling me this mask is what <laughs> we all knew it was just horse shit. Don't worry, I got a handkerchief on, I'm good. Right. <laughs> and, and and I think maybe like you said, like with Iraq, we you know, I don't think they really like it didn't it started out good in intentions. Yeah, and right? like you said about Afghanistan, when we when we got to Iraq, there was there was Iraqis waving American flags yeah. and welcoming us there. And they wanted us to be right. there. And even I was there in two thousand three, two thousand four, two thousand six. All the way that through that time, there was the the local Iraqi populace wanted us there. And by the way, in 2012, 13, 
And when ISIS started to, to flex, there was, there was plenty of Iraqi government officials and people on the ground saying, please America, please come help, help us. us. Hey, we need some help over here. We weren't thinking that these guys would come back, but here they are and we yep. need some help. Please come help us. Right. So we can't but, ignore but the part of the population you know, it, that, you, that wants that. Right, when you cause a problem, you're kind of obligated to mm-hmm. deal with it, right? We caused that problem in Iraq. I'm, I was all for with the withdrawal and, and the Obama administration the withdrawal. But once they decided they were gonna withdraw, there came a point when ISIS rose up that we needed to halt the withdrawal, deal with ISIS, and then pick back up with the withdrawal. But since they started the withdrawal, they couldn't say they made a mistake. Americans will never, we just don't like to say we're wrong. I told somebody the other day, I was like, I will kiss your white ass live on whatever social media platform you wanna go live on. If you can find me a politician, an elected official that has said, you know what, I realize now I was wrong and Find me one politician who has said that. Yeah. And the, the, the crazy thing is, from an ego perspective, people think if I say, hey, guys, I was wrong about this, you think everyone's going to think you're a loser now. No, they actually go, yeah, well, cool. I, I'm glad you admitted that, and we didn't know either. Yeah. Like, like you were bringing up the example of COVID. Hey, okay, it looks like a bunch of people in Italy are dying. They're showing these pictures of people uh, dying in the hospitals. They're all overcrowded. This looks like it's going to suck. Cool. Oh, you want us to stand down for a few weeks here? Cool. We're going to flatten the curve. What does that mean? Oh, we don't want our hospitals overwhelmed? Okay, got yeah, it. We need they, time to yeah, prepare. Sure, sounds good. Okay. Now you need another two weeks. Okay, hey, you know what? I'm American. I support America. I don't want us to have people get hurt. Okay, cool. Got it. Well, now you want another two weeks. Now you want another two months. Now you want another six months. Now you want another year. And then after a year, we find out that the death rates, <laughs> you know, most of the people aren't dying from COVID. They're dying from something else. Yeah. And, and COVID accelerated it. And, and that's fine. I get it. You know, it, but it, we have now have information and data, right, that says all the measures that we did, they didn't help. We've got a vaccine that really isn't, right, by... You know, they had to change the definition yeah, of vaccine, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, could you imagine getting three polio vaccines and then getting polio? Yeah, that's not right. We got rid of that. <laughs> that vaccine got rid of that disease, right? This vaccine supposedly makes your symptoms less, but it could kill you, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it, it, that's one. That's this, this one. Um, one drug we haven't seen commercials for, right? Because all those drug commercials on TV is like, when they when they get into the fine print, they start <laughs> speaking really fast about all the, the side effects. It's like, and it could kill, you know, you could have crazy diarrhea and you could bleed from your nose and maybe your <laughs> anus and then you might very well die from this. Kidney failure, yeah. you know? And people are like, oh, okay, but ask your doctor. <laughs> but your skin will be clearer after two weeks. <laughs> right. Could you imagine what the you know, Johnson & Johnson vaccine got pulled, right? Why? Let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about another vaccine because va- Jay, Jay's vaccine killed some people. American people don't even know. So many people don't even know that Johnson & Johnson vaccine was pulled and that it had killed people with strokes and, you know, fancier medical terms than I know. Huh. Right? Like, we won't just step back and say, hey, we now have different information. We're going to adjust this plan. Yeah. And by the way, on that, you can say, hey, there are, here's the fine print on the vaccine. Here's what it can do to you. Here are the side effects you can have. And go, make a choice. You know, as a human being, if you have some compromised immune system or you're living in some situation where this COVID, according to all the statistics, could be really bad for you, maybe that vaccine is a godsend. That's right. awesome. Maybe a mask is great for you. Yeah. But if yeah. you're a person that's young and healthy and you feel like you could, oh, and you know, uh, a bunch of people that have had it and it didn't impact them at all. And you say, hey, I don't think I'm going to need that vaccine. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk. So that's my decision. Right. So you let people make a decision about what they're going to do with their health. Right. That seems like a much smarter move mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. trying to impose things on people, which I've gone well, off on this a bunch. When you try and impose things on human beings, we fight, especially Americans. They don't like it. We don't like it. That's right. But all human beings don't like it. Right. All human beings don't like to have things imposed on them. And the only way you can impose things effectively is to do it through force, through violence, or now we're recently finding out that you can also do it by by taking their money and seizing their assets right. before they can even know what's happening. Right. Which it's I never I, I never really thought of that before. It didn't even occur to me that like what's going on in Canada right now, oh, you're gonna protest, cool. We're not just gonna arrest you, we're gonna seize your assets. 
That to me is like when you come to my property and you say you're going to take, take my, my house, house. from it's me. The same, exactly. It's the same thing. Damn right. So it, that it, is a Canada, problem. Man, Canada, it's just so hard to watch. You know, you got law enforcement guys who just a few years ago, or not even two years ago, they were being defunded and demonized. You know, during the whole Black Lives Matter thing, and now these same police officers are ones that are literally trampling on on people. And I was like. You know, please, God, don't let it come to that here because I have a lot of law enforcement brothers and we all know that good men follow orders and good men that need to take care of their children will follow orders. Good men that have to take care of their family and rely on that paycheck, they're going to follow orders. That is scary to me because it will be at that point when I'm like, hey, law dogs, I love you and I've always supported you, but we are now on two different sides. Right, like when you, like what's happening in Canada, man, they're siding with Trudeau. That little turd, and I usually don't, I try not to talk about presidents, elected, especially elected presidents of, of sovereign nations in that kind of derogatory term, but wow. You wanna talk about somebody that won't admit that he's wrong? And you double know, down on it. Every, every step, it's like I just won't lose. And he's got an, an arsenal. He's got a military. He's got a national police force, man. The national police force scares the shit out of me, dude. I don't like it when I see feds wearing multi-cam and military stuff, right? Like, it makes me uneasy. I don't like seeing local PDs wearing BDUs, right? I want I like some shine shoes. Like, North Carolina <laughs> Highway Patrol still wears a police uniform. They look like police officers, not military members. I still don't like it, man. Even though I want my law dog friends to have every tool available to them to do law enforcement but there's some things that i definitely i'm, I'm not cool with like no knock warrant, warrants and stuff like that yeah they're not necessary i no. mean we learned that yep. cqb is dangerous let's just not cordon yep. come out yep oh you don't want to come out okay cool just turn your power off yeah i'm gonna play some loud music maybe send a robot in with some gas you, you'll come out you'll yep. get tired of this right yeah the no knock warrant thing is <sighs> is definitely something that needs to stop yeah Stop. Our law enforcement needs some help, right? Yeah. It really does. Across America, law enforcement in general needs help. The average law dog is a good, good American. Yeah. You know, uh, and even up in Canada, I don't think that, I don't think it's going to continue in this direction. The, the direction that's going right now, I, I don't think it's going to continue in this direction. I think it's going to, yeah. I think it's going to stop I, pretty I soon. I think the only reason that that is what's going to happen is that the people that are pressing like Trudeau, they're actually just a bunch of pussies. Mm. They think they want to fight, but you know, do they really want to fight? Once the bullets start flying and stuff, you know, yeah. and things get pressed, I I think ultimately we're going to see Trudeau step down. I just looked at my uh, watch to recognize the date, so it's the twenty, it's the twenty first of February when we're recording this right now. So it'll be interesting, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how it all washes out. I you know I hope that's what happened. I do not want to see Canadians shooting Canadians no more than I want to see Americans shooting Americans. You know, do you even like you know Americans are still mad about the whole riots and the Black Lives Matter stuff, and rightfully so because it was all perpetuated and funded. You know, Black Lives Matter is that those folks on the streets rioting they were pawns of rich people and that's that's sad right because sometimes i feel like we've been a little bit of pawned out in the war so i can kind of relate i'm not mad at young black or young hispanic or, or whatever group or even even young antifa you know white kids who are rioting and breaking stuff they're pissed are they going too far absolutely right you know, we have the right to protest peacefully, but not break shit and set it on fire. It's wrong. That's rioting, not protesting. Again, root cause. That whole mess was perpetuated. It was funded. I mean, there were pallets of bricks that just mm. poof showed up, and you know, what's the root cause? What's the root cause, man? What's really going on? How do we reach out to even more so? You know, like. Our poor communities, poor inner city communities, which oftentimes are predominantly black, but also Latino. Your your poor white communities tend to be rural, right? Well, why are these things happening? What what is the perpetual process that 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 keeps these communities in their situation? Well, 
the modern welfare system. And, and I don't mean the good kind of welfare, like wellness of society. I'm talking about our the EBT and, and all these things. There's no, there's no, it, it, it doesn't help people get out of those situations. It perpetuates it. It, it, it destroys the nuclear family. And, and it was, you know, we can go back to LBJ, you know, with the modern welfare programs. And there's plenty of quotes out there that they did it on purpose. They knew what, they, they actually planned that stuff, right? Like, I think back in the 50s and 60s, the intelligence agency and our government, they were pretty sinister and they were thoughtful. They weren't just meandering, right? And you can go back and look at what they did and how they approached it. And Lyndon Baines Johnson, Nixon, that whole bunch were raised out of World War II in a fear of socialism and communism. You know, that FBI, Hoover's FBI, that CIA, you know, I mean, man, it, it was, they were proficient. I feel like they knew what they were doing. And so they created that welfare problem. And here we are today, no one's ever really came up with any decent solutions. The only real welfare reform our nation has ever seen actually came from Clinton. He actually proposed some things that would help the inner city become more productive, involved citizens. And then all that expired, and no one's done anything since. And I think it's funny, you know, you got the Democrats who manipulate and coerce those communities for votes. And you got Republicans who are just like, meh, it's not even worth it to talk to them. They're just going to vote Democrat. And I'm like, Recruitment 101, folks. You've got young, angry people that the system's not working for. Let's go talk to them. Let's come up with a real welfare reform. I had a young, you know, root problems. Right? That's another one, right? Just cut off welfare, tell them to get jobs. That's the average white man in America's freaking answer to welfare and poor inner city problems. Just cut it off, tell them to get jobs. Yeah, okay, but no, we're talking about decades and generations, cultural change. We have cultures that are based around this problem. You think you can just turn off welfare and just tell them to get jobs? There's your answer. That's it. Okay, and then what? Okay, and then what? I had an awesome, I met a fellow who's running for uh, Fayetteville's mayor, Fayetteville Fort, Fayetteville, Fort Bragg, in North Carolina. And I had never thought about it this like this. And I've only had a few days to even think about it. But his proposal was this. And this guy is um, uh, an, an immigrant. He's Puerto Rican, um, which, you know, part of the states, but not a state. So still an immigrant. Raised poor. Um, nine brothers and sisters. Right? Poor family. Anyway, he said, hey, man, what if? Let's say you've got a mother, a single mother with four children, All right? And some people say, well, she just keeps having more children to get more welfare. Okay, maybe that's true in some situations. I don't think that's true across the board. I think in a lot of cases, these mothers have more and more children. Maybe they don't have access to birth control. Maybe they're not super educated on, on just on sex education in general, right? Whatever that problem is, we have this person. They're a reality, Right, they exist. This family of the single mother with these four children, it exists. They exist. How do we help them? How do we fix them? How do we get those four children to grow up to become productive, involved US citizens? That's the question. Well, his answer was this. And let's say she's getting fourteen hundred dollars a month. Um, from all the different programs total. That's about what she's getting. Fourteen hundred. It's poverty, bro. But if she gets a job, she loses all of it. Mm -hmm. If she gets a job that only pays her $1,000, now she would be at $2,400 a month. Now she's just barely getting by still. She's still in the poverty. Mm -hmm. But the second she takes a legal dollar, something that's not under the table, she loses every cent of her, her welfare funding. How does that incentivize her or her children to, to go do something? So here was his plan, and I was like, huh, huh. He said, let's lower it to take some welfare away. I'm like, hmm, I wasn't expecting you to say that. But here's how he said it. He said, okay, let's knock it down. Let's cut that, that 1400 to 600 She doesn't get a job. She gets 600 She gets a job. 
and maybe she makes 500 a week, she gets an additional $100 a week from welfare. So as she makes more, she actually starts getting more. So let's say she goes from that 1400 now she's making 2000 uh, in addition to her own, like she's making $2,000 a month at her job. She's, um, she's gone from that 500 or whatever initial, instead of the 1400 now she's at 1000 Well, there's a certain point in which she makes enough money to actually pay for her own welfare on tax dollars. It now pays for itself. The incentive is for that lady, that young woman, to go work harder to make money, and now she will actually pay for her own welfare. It's a zero-sum game for American taxpayers. And I was like, holy shit, I've never heard that before. I've never thought about it like that before. I always thought about it like the more you make, the less you get from welfare, right? Like if you're making 1400 on welfare and now you're making two grand, you're only going to get seven. He's like, no. I mean, it's capped, right? It's not like she just keeps making, now she's making $200,000 a year, she gets 50000 in welfare, right? No, it's capped. There's a point in which it all goes away. And he even said, he goes, now maybe there's actually a pyramid where it goes up to a certain amount, and as she continues to make more, it goes down a little bit, and then it's ended. But it's all based off of, and he's like, it would take a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Because everywhere in the nation, the cost of living is different. So... You would have to build it around all of that. He's like, but it would work. And it would fix the whole problem. He's like, you would be addressing the animosity and the resentment that tax paying hardworking Americans have against welfare recipients. That stigma, right? That whole uh, just cut, cancel welfare type. Well, now the welfare recipient is paying for its own welfare, for their own welfare, not its, right? That's dehumanizing. I didn't mean to do that. But that person is now paying for their own welfare. I was like, wow, bro. <laughs> I'm like, you can't be the only person. You're, you know, this, you know, Puerto Rican American that's running for mayor in Fayetteville. You mean to tell me you're the only person that's ever thought of this? And probably not. He's just the only person that ever told me about it. And I was like, I've just never thought about it, right? It's never been in my entire life have I ever, I've never had to sit down and start thinking about viable ways to end the welfare state in America. It's not been a problem that I had to address in my military career or my small business, right? You know, it's not a problem. So now that I'm running for House of Representatives, it is something that I gotta start looking at and I was blown away. So again, back to my point of, Problems are never two plus two equals four. No, nope, so, it ain't that easy. No, it's never that easy. <laughs> and when we when we have that conversation and we sit back and say, "Hey, man, yeah, this isn't working. We need to adjust." Just like man, if we're in route to a target, you briefed your platoon, or I briefed my, you know, troop, and ISR reports back, "Ooh, no, there's not fifteen mofos on this target." Man, they're having some type of get together. There's 40 Muldoons on this target, you know, and trucks and what appears to be some PKMs in those trucks. We thought it was going to be an easy target on and off, right? Nice little fun Tuesday night. I saw us reporting something different. Do we go, yeah, Roger, that click and hang up? We're not talking about it anymore. I'm not even going to brief my, my troopers. No, we probably come to a little tactical halt, <laughs> huddle up, and let's discuss this. If the key leaders are going to sit down and chat, right? Is this assault force even able to take that target? Well, probably not. Okay, well, let's head back to the house. We made a mistake, right? Based off of information, now, we didn't make a mistake. Based off of information, <laughs> as it changed, let's just hit pause, you know? Or maybe we request more air <laughs> and we pers- go on up and we don't hit the target we let the air force do it for us or or the navy or the marines or whoever's flying for us that night you know it's so frustrating man because it's like you know there's there's eight sf guys running for for uh, u.s house of representative there's seven seals um and like i said 25 30 global war on terrorism veterans you know, somebody asked me the other day, well, what sets you apart from these other candidates? We're all conservatives. We all pretty much agree on how to, you know, the, we all have the same stances on everything. The difference between, the first difference between me and some of my opponents is spine and shoulders. <laughs> right? And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, I mean it in like, because they're good people, right? The, the folks I'm running against, 
Um, Sam's probably one of them, are, are good people. Good people who really want to go change. And if you ask them, they're going to Capitol Hill and they're going to save the planet. Here's reality. The reality is a freshman, brand new representative in Congress has zero influence and no friends. Lobbyists don't even knock on their office door. They got a little cubby hole of an office over in that other building. They're nobodies. So they look for friends. They make friends with lobbyists and other little groups and caucuses, right? And the incumbents, the three, four, five, twenty term representatives, they recruit them. They do them favors. Now we got clicks. And this is politics and it's the grossness of it. Here's what aside from me not being willing to compromise, right? I've said straight up, four terms if Amer if America or North Carolina if District 13th or whatever, whichever district I wind up running in, four terms is all I will do, period. We need term limits. Whether or not we can get that pushed through or not, if when I'm up there, different story. I'm still not going to. I'm going to self-impose my own term limits. I don't want to work in D.C. And I was, one of my opponents recently told me I was a um, ignorant wannabe. And I was like, yep. <laughs> Except for the differences, I, I was like, you're absolutely right. I am pretty ignorant to exactly the kind of bullshit you guys are doing in politics. But you're wrong about the wannabe part. Not a wannabe. I don't want to run for Congress. But because of people like him, America needs us to run. Well, I'm not willing to compromise. That's the biggest thing. I'm not, you know, I say this all the time, right? I'm not even mad at Democrats. I'm pissed off at Republicans who have compromised our rights away. They keep thinking somehow that they can negotiate, or not even negotiate, because I'll clarify the difference between negotiate and compromise. They keep compromising with, with the, the left and the Democrats, thinking they're all going to get along and come to some type of agreement. Democrats just, take, just keep taking that shit, putting it out back, piling it up. Yep, we got some more from them. We got some more from them. And Republicans go, well, if we, we keep playing nice with them, Maybe one day they'll be our friends. No, man. The Democrats are hell-bent on creating a communist regime in this country. Right? <laughs> they, they don't care what you think. They don't want to be your friend. They want to get rid of you. They want to replace you. And we see this playing out in this whole politics right now, right? All of a sudden, you, know, you keep seeing everything like, what's the, what's the cure for COVID? Midterm elections. <laughs> All of a sudden, the mandates. Yeah, the science says, no bullshit, man. Freaking, it ain't no, there's no, there's no, the, the COVID numbers haven't changed at all. The science hasn't changed at all. Midterms are coming, and Democrats know they're about to lose. And they, across the country, through boards of elections and every different means they can, they're trying to protect their what they have left. And we see it in North Carolina with the redistricting and all this nastiness. But anyway, the number two thing that sets me apart is that group of veterans, those Green Berets, those SEALs, when we show up, let's say half of us, right? Let's say there's, there's 30. It's just over 30 global war on terrorism veterans. Young, vibrant, not old gray hair, crippled old men. Hey, easy on the gray hair, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you're not old. You're still vibrant, you know? There's, uh, I keep looking at it like this, right? We're still young if most of the 20-year-old troopers, the, the 20 to 30-year-old troopers in the teams or on the ODAs, don't want to fist fight it. <laughs> the second they know that we're we're not able to you know hold our own, then we're that old line that gets pushed out of the Roger pride. That. You know, <laughs> but I would say right now the average twenty to thirty year old soft trooper doesn't really want to throw down with either one of us, right? I mean, some of them would, and they probably whoop our old asses. We're going to be sore the next day, no matter what. But the difference is, they know we got this old, knowing we're either highly aggressive, or violent and smart, right? <laughs> like you don't get through 20 some years of war just being lucky, you know? And I always tell them that, you know, I'm still in 20th group, man. I teach down our SFI course and I'll pick on the youngins and I'll be like, okay, whatever, man. You know, that, that fun, you know, shooting the shit, shit talking, whatever you want to call it. And I'm like, okay, whatever, man. You want a fist fight? And they're like, <laughs> on the outside, I look like I'm ready, you know? Ready to get after it. On the inside, I'm like, please, Lord God, don't let this dude fist fight. <laughs> don't let this kid, yeah, don't let this kid actually want to take me up on this offer because it's going to hurt so bad. Um, but, yeah, man, could you imagine 20 
global war on terrorism veterans, right? 12 of them, special operations guys. Swearing an oath for a second time on Capitol Hill. The Democrats shaking in their boots because they know they just lost, and the Republicans going, uh oh. Hmm. We're going to have to ask those guys, those newbies, these freshmen. We're going to have to really team up with these guys and work with them. That's some stuff that could change America's trajectory. And that's the difference in between me and some of my really good opponents, good people, right? I, got, I mean, I got a guy that's running in the district against me. Man, he's a good old boy, good old country boy. We talk. After a meeting, we hit it off, and I was like, man, in any other time you and I met, we'd just be hunting fishing buddies. <laughs> He's a good Carolina boy. And I told him, I was like, hey, man, I tell you what. Why don't you just let me and my buddies go up there for a couple of years? I told you I'm out. I, this is not a career for me. I'll do everything in the world to, to help you run after I'm done. You know, of course, he didn't take me up on that. Yeah, I was say, he's he's still convinced he can beat me. Um, and, and, and maybe he can, but that's the cool thing about democracy, right? I have to show the people in this district that I'm I'm the best candidate. Um, I can't just say I am. I have to go show them. And uh, so anyway, man, it's uh, some interesting stuff. Not so much. It's like so simple, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh. So, little sidetrack right there. You get <laughs> you get done with Afghanistan. You go do some stuff working with law enforcement whatnot and then when, when do you end up going to iraq um just before the invasion um and so iraq happens all that goes down i'm up north and made more friends more curd friends more friends over at the uh at the agency and because we were basically doing that uh advanced prep uh, for northern iraq with the kurds and everything so you got there before the invasion, mm-hmm. and you're up with the Kurds, yeah. and you're prepping for what's going to come. The war's coming, right? Yeah, so, you know, invasion goes down, freaking, I was running around like Mosul, Kirkuk, Crit, all that stuff. Um, Are you with the ODA team? Uh, I'm actually with one of the um, with one of the SAD teams. Okay. Because I'm that young kid that doesn't look like an <laughs> SF guy, right? So, really cool. Um yeah, Iraq happens, and then in my next trip to Afghanistan, I got bumped off a cliff, and I broke my back. How'd you get bumped off a cliff? One of our partners tripped. We were walking down, and he was above me, and he tripped. 80, 90-pound backpack, you know, mm-hmm. nice, you know, <clears throat> freaking offset infill. Yeah, thought I, I. How far? How high was the cliff? Probably fell fifteen feet. You know, enough to, you know, and basically, when when he hit me, you know, I kind of like feet went out and landed basically on my ass. Like my feet were kind of out in front of me, a little outcropping, and it that rucksack just buckled me. Right, it just mm-hmm. split my uh, L five. How much did you weigh at this point? Mm. Were you jacked yet? Because you keep yeah, I'm talking about to, I'm starting to put on some pounds. You keep talking about being point. the skinny, yeah, freaking no, I, college I, I, kid. You know, now we're you know three years into the, into the war, four years into the war, man. I've been hitting the weight pile like everybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm probably like a buck eighty five, and um, yeah, man, it just bent me over, split my vertebrae. Part of the vertebrae hit my spinal cord. Uh, the prognosis was you might walk with crutches one day. So, so were you like paralyzed on sight? That whole, I can't feel my legs, yeah, I didn't experience that because I could feel it and it hurt like <laughs> hell, right? If, if you took this dude, put it in a fire, got it nice and orange, and stuck it in the side of my spine back here, that's what it felt like all the way to my toes. It was, it was like I was on fire. Did they cast a vacuum? Oh, yeah. Um, spent three or four months in a brace doing the wheelchair thing, freaking uh, got better. Uh, really fast. So within a year, I'm running again. Well, my ETS date came up, and I had a flight packing in. I what, to be a pilot? Mm-hmm. I want to go. I thought, you know, my <laughs> ground-pounding days was, I had already done everything we could, right? How many more countries are we invading? You know, I thought my <laughs> ground-pounding days was over, and these Apache gunships keep flying in and just doing all our work. I'm like, 
I mean, I grew in up in air nice. condition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They got like they could only work a few hours a day. I'm like, man, these these warrant officers, they can fly for the rest of their lives, you know, because the, the army has a warrant officer program. Oh, huh. So I put it in a packet. All I had to do was get home and go to flight school. It's going to be awesome. Well, that clearly changed. I thought my career was over. So luckily, those friends that had made it to agency, I got out, and I initially did. You, did you get medically retired or? Well, Young and dumb, man. My intent, I thought I was going to go contract for a little while, get better, and then I would come back in the Army and fly. Uh, just take some time off, and there's all these awesome contracting jobs out here. They're paying awesome. Oh, and My this is because you're in the National Guard, so you could say, hey, I, I'm non-deployable for a while. Right. I'm, I'm going to heal up. Yeah. But you'd still be in the National Guard. Mm -hmm. But I got out. Contract. I got out completely. Oh, you got out, you got yep. out completely. Yep. You called um, it. Because at this point... The guard has figured out that they're just hemorrhaging dudes to contracting. So you got all these uh, battalion commanders what and group commanders. This? So 0405. Oh, 05, yeah. Right? This is like 1500 have, bucks a day yeah, for contractors right. and stuff. They're shutting it down. And they're like, nope, you know, you still got to be at your drills. You still got to meet your commitments. Whereas in like 0203, you had company commanders jumping in and they were like, yeah, I don't care if y'all show up or not. And if you think about it, right, like you've got your troopers overseas doing, you know, at least combat-ish type stuff, you know. It was a good thing for the guard. You, you had guard guys that were getting exponentially more combat experience through contracting than the active duty groups were doing because they were just rotating, you know. Mm. So it was a good thing for the guard, but it wasn't good for their numbers, right? It didn't look good. They, they had guys that weren't getting their – uh, online training done, you know, <laughs> right? Like you got to do your EO and your sharps yeah. training, right? And it was killing those numbers for these commanders. So they shut it down. So I was like, screw it, I'm out. I'll just come back in, you know, I'll go make some money, whatever, buy a house or something, which is, you know, is exactly what I did. But as I got better, you know, I went, became operational again and started doing cool stuff, way cooler than the army ever was going to let me do. This is as a contractor. Yeah. So I never went back in, or I didn't go back in to fly. Um, and at one point, it was kind of funny, because I did go back in and join 20th group uh, in like 2012, which I'm, I'm still in. How long? And, uh, so, But that's a pretty big gap, though. Yeah, you got like seven, almost eight years. Seven, eight years. Yeah. And were you contracting that whole time? Whole time, nonstop. I stayed really busy with that. Of course, I started the gym. I would come home. I got lucky, man. You know, teamwork, right? Teamwork mm -hmm. makes the dream work. When I started my gym, which I opened it in January of 2008. That, that That's year, when this gym opened. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Uh, you know, 2008, I was gone nine months. I opened a gym. Luckily, the, the team that I put in place ran it like it was their own. Yeah, they did an amazing job. Amazing job. Good friend of mine, Darren Kanzler, man. He just did it. Uh, the young lady I was dating at the time, Julie, they they ran the damn thing. And and so I could come home and be the war hero that showed up to run the gym and take over for a minute and ruin their lives. You know, they had a plan the way they did things. Nope, I'm going to do it my way. You know, like, no, I, hopefully I wouldn't like that. But, uh, you know, intrinsically that'll happen. But they just did an awesome job with my gym. And I could, I could, I could stay deployed, and I did. And um, the gym grew, so that was cool. There's kind of a parallel there, and um, the gym was great. You know, it was supposed to be just a little CrossFit gym that you know guys like us, Marine Recon boys, and Marsoc dudes, because we're just south of Lejeune, come in there, take their shirts off, spit on the floor, throw up if they want to, and we'll just thrash ourselves. And then regular people started showing up, <laughs> right? Like soccer moms and stuff. And, you know, hell, I'm still at this point in my life. I'm like, hey, you, you know, you, you know, stop being a puss and, and you know, maybe stop eating so many donuts, fatso, and, <laughs> and you could daggone be a PT stud, too. <laughs> well, when 33-year-old, 36-year-old mother of two or three that drives a Suburban pulls up, you can't talk to her like that because she won't come back. And those are also the people that have the money to pay their gym memberships. <laughs> those college kids that are studs that you want to train, they ain't got no money, mm -hmm. right? You got to at least pay the light bill. Um, so I quickly figured out how to talk to regular people. You know, you can't be like, hey, Sally, <laughs> maybe cut out that bottle of wine and that box of donuts every night. You might be able to do a pull-up. <laughs> yeah, she's Not never going to do a pull-up. encouragement she was right. looking for. <laughs> so you, now you have, you know, I had, I had to... I was real adamant about not being that uh, creepy gym owner and, you know, who was like, 
you know, um, having any type of fraternization with clients and stuff like that. It was a big deal. And I did start that gym with a partner and it quickly figured out it wasn't going to work. Um, not a bad separation there, just like he couldn't move to Wilmington. And, um, but yeah, man, it, it was that gym taught me a lot about teaching, you know, just how to talk to people. You couldn't, hey, Ranger, you know, <laughs> hey, Sally, come here, what's going on? You know, you, um, hey, when you're ready, if you'd like, um, let's sit down and you know, maybe line out some nutrition and diets and stuff. You know, nutrition, not diet, right? Those words mean something. Because if you say something to a lady who needs to drop 20 pounds, you know, if you say, hey, let's talk about getting you on a diet. Oof, oh, my God, bro. You just, <laughs> she's gone. She hates your guts. But if you're like, hey, look, let's tune this up, man. You know, man, your shoulders are starting to get really defined. You know, you're looking great. And that was a cool thing about CrossFit, right, is that women's upper body started uh, to develop. And, you know, you clearly can't be that creep and, and talk to her about her legs or any other, you know, lady parts or whatever. You know, you, you can't be like, hey, Sally, you know, your, your bum's looking great. You know, that's that's inappropriate, right? It's not professional. And uh, so, you know, I really learned how to, to talk to people and then motivate them and bring them into the fold. And, you know, before we know it, that was one thing my gym was so well known for. I'm so proud of it is that our women monsters. And I mean, people would come to me, like other gym owners and stuff, and like, what are you doing to motivate and turn these women into these these monsters? Like, we sent, like, uh, I don't know, um, 18 different athletes to the CrossFit Games out of a, a town of only 150,000 people. Damn. And it, it was just, I didn't even have to recruit once it started. We had one of the original super strong females. She just showed up. She was a, a volleyball player, powerful, right? She could, very coordinated. I'd talk to her talk, in Oli lifting. Before you knew it, she was like throwing weight over her head that most of the dudes in the gym couldn't touch. And um, so people started hearing about her, and then it grew, and then uh, her, and then a handful of others. And next thing you know, I've got these, I'm looking for dudes. Our, our thing was the team events. I love the team events. I don't know. The individuals is cool, right? And mm -hmm. a whole different level. But the team was fun. And I'm all about building a team. So our teams did really well. But there were years where, you know, a couple of years where we didn't, the team didn't go to the games because the guys on my team weren't strong enough to get us <laughs> on the podium at regionals. It was never the girls, man. Um, I trained one young lady. She came in the gym of, of phenom, right? Like just this diamond in a rough, fast twitch, powerful. She'd been a soccer player, a swimmer at ECU. God bless her heart. She's just a, <laughs> imagine the most hard-headed ranger, young seal pup you ever <laughs> dealt with. This was her, man. But like the first time she ever deadlifted, she picked up over 300 pounds. I walked in and was Damn. like, stop, stop, stop. What are you doing? Who is she? Why is she picking up that kind of weight? She's clearly new. Right, horrible firm, but just powerful. So anyway, that's impressive. She quite she she could have been a, a, an individual athlete. She had that type of genetics. Um, she went a different route that year. I couldn't put her on my team. She just wasn't ready yet. She couldn't work with the team. She came in a little late. She had everything going for her. And I was like, hey, in the interim, um, let's play with strongman. Right, we just started getting strongman equipment. It was getting more and more worked into the CrossFit stuff, and we kind of did a pure thing. And some of the gym members, you know, I was that guy who was—I was like the most anti-CrossFit CrossFit gym owner on the planet. I was like, CrossFit was supposed to be to get you in shape so you can go do cool stuff. You want to try a triathlon? You want to try? You, know, you want to? You know, whatever. You know, um, I never really saw CrossFit as like becoming a sport, but I can't help it. I like to compete. You know, let's get in it. Um, so anyway, this young lady, Kimberly Lawrence. She, I said, hey, let's try Strongman. So she did like a local event, crushed it. This chick was, and still is super strong. Well, that event qualified her for the Worlds at the Arnold's. Damn. She weighed 165 pounds naturally. She never touched any drugs. And Strongman is not a tested sport, right? <laughs> so the middle weight class in the females are the, is the most competitive. And it's 140, 180 pounds. And most of the girls cut from 200 they're you know five eleven, six foot tall, two hundred pound females, and like I said, not tested. <laughs> Kimberly goes to the Arnold bro and wins world her second strongman competition. Damn. Wins it, and she didn't cut. She walked on walked into the competition one hundred sixty five pounds. That's just what she weighed at the time, right? I mean, she's you know probably five eight or nine, five eight or nine. 
just naturally a mus- well not naturally she had been an athlete in college right but just explosive and you said she swam and played volleyball is yeah. that the one and, and soccer oh, okay just aggressive too man just like just hostile <laughs> <laughs> she should it at the time there wasn't a good mma presence yeah. in wilmington that's that's where she should have gone where she should have gone. Uh, as one of the gyms, um, Salter and those guys stood up the MMJ, uh, MM, MMA gym there. And had that been stood up, I'd have sent her over there. Mm. I mean, go kill with, people. With a little bit of training, <laughs> this chick would have been scary, right? She was, and, and she would go over there and train and play. And she went through a little phase where she was doing some striking and stuff. And I was just like, good God, man. Anyway, long story short, with her, she kind of got involved in the wrong people and stuff. And, um, I didn't coach her anymore, mm-hmm. freaking, but what an amazing chica. And like I said, man, it was just so cool that our females were so well known when like every lady on the team is snatching 200 pounds, deadlifting three plus. Like Kimberly was deadlifting 500 pounds at a buck 70 and had abs. You know what I mean? She did not look like a power lifter. Damn. And this is just the ladies we had. They were just badass. You know, Melissa went to the games. Um, she was just the small one. She was the body weight one. Um, and as CrossFit matured, now the average CrossFit female is like a buck 65. Man, those, are, those girls are big. So Melissa, she can't compete with them. She can't move the weight that they do. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, man, the, the ladies. And Melissa was instrumental in helping. Once Melissa realized she wasn't big enough, because our last time we went to the games, you know, D- Dawn was, you know, probably at the time 160 165 my girl amanda 150 pounds another volleyball player um and um jordan probably 150 pounds and every single one of them were instead left in 400 pounds clean and jerking over two i mean these these chicks and running sub six minute miles like what the and i mean you know, luckily that last year the boys were all big boys and studs, but <laughs> Melissa was, you know, a, an amazing, amazing coach to those ladies. Was once she, you know the deal. Once you realize you ain't you ain't ever gonna be in the ring again, right? Like you can either, you know, what is it? Those who can't do teach, um, <laughs> and that's just reality. Same for me, right? Like as I got older, I was like, I don't stand a chance of being, you know, involved in this sport, but I can damn sure coach some people to it. But yeah, the gym was amazing, man. Freaking. It was lucky that I could run it in a parallel. Once me and Melissa started dating, I started. I went through a phase where I didn't deploy a whole lot. What were um, you doing, like teaching stuff stateside? Mm-hmm. And uh, a highway patrol friend of mine asked me to start helping uh, him like teach some firearms. Uh, his, his father had a, a nice range and stuff. I'm like, yeah, man, why not? You know. He was going through a divorce and needed some money. Um, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, you know, he's like, yeah, I think, you know, with your background, you know, we can we can bring in some people. And that's how the, sh- the whole shooting part of my business kind of started was just trying to help a, a buddy that needed some you know money because he was going through a divorce. And um, so that turned out, man, I I just don't know how to do anything half ass. Right? <laughs> if I'm going to do something, I'm doing it, you know. Um, that's why I like all the physical stuff, the triathlons, the ultra marathons. Hell, I put myself in the hospital after the Bigfoot 200. Not after, because <laughs> I didn't quite finish. Mile 177, I'm pissing blood. Rhabdomyolysis, freaking, I was in bad, bad How shape. How many hours into it was that? Probably 70 some, day three. Yeah, um, you, you uh, familiar with the company uh, Softleet? Yeah, those yeah, guys? yeah. So Brent, I don't know them, but Brent, I know I know who they are. Yeah. So uh, Brent, one of the the founders and owners, uh, Marshak dude, good friend of mine, he joined me at mile one twelve of that race, and I was already in bad shape uh, from like a section of the race. It was a lot of downhill. Well, first, we don't have mountains where I live in North Carolina, so I was trained uphill on a stair mill. Dude, I would go to the gym and spend four and five hours walking on a stair mill. Miserable, <laughs> miserable, stupid. But I set a goal. You I don't want, like running. Uh, at this Now, at this point in my life, I don't like running anymore, right? I decided I'm going to go run a 200-mile race. Why? To say I did. Well, yeah, man, that race, one of the sections, about 11 miles, all downhill, and I ran the shit out of it. And your muscles weren't used to that? Quads destroyed them. Destroyed them. At mile 112, I was already pissing blood. And, and that's from that Rabdo? Was, yeah. My kidneys were hurting. I could feel it. It felt like somebody just worked on my freaking back, man. And um, by my 150-something at that aid station, that was the last time I could even keep water down. I was 
Um, my TBI was definitely flared up. I had a lot of uh, damage to my brainstem and stuff when I got blown up in 2009. And yeah, man, I um, <laughs> I was in bad shape and I wanted to sleep. He wouldn't let me sleep. Come to find out later, he was like, yeah, I was worried you were going to die because I was having a seizure and I was laughing about it. You know, <laughs> I had convinced myself, you know, you know the deal, man. You know how we, we can be. And I just took it too far at... By mile 177, man, I'd gone, you know, on an, almost an entire night, 20-some miles without any food or water, no sleep, just, you know, Brent was just trying to get me to the next uh, uh, aid station because it's in the mountains of Washington State around Mount St. Helens. They have no evac plan. There's no way, that's, right? <laughs> and I'm probably that, the that biggest runner on the course, right? I'm doing these 200-mile uh, race at, like, 215 pounds, you know, and I had lost weight to do it, <laughs> you know? I think I usually walk around at about, you know, 225, 230-ish or whatever, and I cut some weight to go run this race. And How many um, months did you prepare for it? Like a year, year and a half. The So we trained for about a half a year for the 2007 Bigfoot. Melissa tore her meniscus at, like, mile 120. And so we, we stopped at mile 133. We were doing it together. And I had time, but during, during that last trek, I didn't want to leave her. It was cold, way colder than it was supposed to be. So we didn't, I mean, teeth chattering. We were, we're both hypothermic. Mm -hmm. And she's busted her knee, can't move fast. And uh, so at like mile 132 or 3 at that aid station, we got there in time. And I could have taken off with no rest or whatever. And got to the next one, but I probably w wouldn't have finished the race, right? I was just, now I was behind. And uh, I would have never left her on that mountain, right? Like, especially hypothermia, you know. She's she's never had hypothermia to where she was, you know, freaking disoriented or something mm -hmm. like that. And, and, you know, just clearly, I wouldn't have left a runner I didn't know mm -hmm. in her shape, much less I'm not leaving the most precious thing on this planet to me. <laughs> So we got to that A station. I'm like, you know what? Screw it, honey. We started it together. Let's go get some breakfast together. You know, the sun was coming up, so we drove back to Portland and had some breakfast. The next year, she decided to do it, but we made a deal that we wouldn't do it together. No, no preconceived notions. Her knee was still not healthy. She's like, I'll try it. I mean, that says a lot about her, man. She's like, mm, I got this energy. I'm gonna give it a whirl. She did like 77 miles and dropped. Only 77. Mm -hmm. on a busted <laughs> knee. She's she's probably worse than us, but um, yeah, man. At my one one seventy six, one seventy seven, whatever it was, Brent was like, "Hey, man, I'm gonna run ahead and uh, make sure the crew's ready." Nah, he was running ahead to make sure the medics and the doctors were there so they could drop my ass. Two hundred five miles, man. You know, so I had you know whatever it was, twenty nine miles or something left, and I get there and they're like. Yeah, here's the drop paperwork. I'm like, I'm not signing that. <laughs> I'm twitching, having seizures. My trachea is freaking, like, not working correctly. You know, my so some of my damage and stuff, I used to be left-handed. I'm right-handed now because this didn't work for a while, right? Like, I couldn't hold on to things. I definitely, but worse, I would have a seizure. Well, if you're holding the Glock and your hand seizes, probably not a good thing. <laughs> so I switched to being right-handed if all that was happening. I'm like seizing, and, and it's a it's not a muscular seizure; it's a CNS seizure, and it's just weird. It doesn't hurt, but it, when, when it happens, it looks weird. I was gonna like, say you ain't looking you know? good at this point. And bro, the pictures of me—I'm gray, right? That whole dehydrated. My body temperature was 96.4 degrees, and my heart resting heart rate was like a buck sixty. Oh, laying down on a cot. You know, when you lay down, your heart rate should drop. Mine didn't. My body's freaking out. And I'm convinced I got to know it's only 29 miles. I'll, I got this. And luckily, luckily, one of those five people I told you I'm kind of scared of was helping me. And he was like, hey, Bubba, you can either get your ass in that truck or I'm going to put your ass in that truck. <laughs> either way, you are done with this race. The next thing I remember, I woke up in the, in the hospital in Portland, Oregon. How long was the recovery from that? Yeah, that's a that's a more fun story. Um, three weeks after that, on the last day to register for the Moab 240 miler, I went and got my blood work done. 88% kidney function. I'm like, all right, I'm good. And I signed up for the Moab 240. And how far away was that at the time? 
as far as like how much time did you have before that? Before two weeks. The, uh, oh, it was only two weeks away. Oh, last day to register damn. for the Moab. And here's my thought process. Oh, I gotta hear this. <laughs> Because it hurt, man. Rabdo hurt a lot more. I'd heard of Rabdo, right? You know, CrossFit made it famous. Everybody you know, knew what Rabdo was. And, eh, you know, but we all give ourselves micro cases of it, and then we take days off. The reason I, there's no days off in a four-day, 200-mile race. You don't get to recover. You know, it gets worse. Well, three weeks after it, I go in. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to figure out, do I train another year? Because this is the first thing in my life I've DNF'd. Mm. First thing I've ever did not finish. You know, man, I've been like first time goes in every hard course they ever sent me to, you know, and like this isn't this isn't making sense to me. Voluntarily withdrawing the year before because Melissa was hurt, I was okay with that. Like it didn't hurt my feelings, you know, it didn't feel like I had somehow compromise, you know, my soul. Your integrity is a man. <laughs> now, but now the Bigfoot, you know, this thing almost tried to kill me. And I'm like, mm, okay, there's this Moab 240. It's all ran by the same people. I'm like, this Moab 240 mile race. It's actually 243 miles. Just like the Bigfoot 200 is 205. I'm like, y'all need to fix your t-shirts because last time I checked, a five miler, that's like a race in and of itself. So give me credit. I want credit. So the, the Moab 240, 243 miles. In my head was, okay, do I train a whole nother year? And when you train for a 200 mile, you're talking about going out at midnight yeah. and training until 6 in the morning just to get training under your headlamps and stuff like that. It's miserable, dude. At this point in my life, I'm not a runner anymore, and I don't enjoy training it. I, shit, since then, I think I've ran about six miles. And that was 2018, <laughs> right? And that's all been like three different Army PT tests I had to take, you know? Um, yeah, I ride my bicycle now, my mountain bike and stuff. But anyway... Yeah, man, I'm like, okay, I can train a whole nother year, or maybe I go knock out this 240 and just check this box and say I did a 200, right? It's 240. It should be good. Make up for this disaster silliness of the Bigfoot. Last day of registry, I was down in Alabama teaching 20th groups of Falcors. course. I drove to one of those local uh, blood work places, had my labs pulled, interpreted them myself, pretty much qualified <laughs> for that. Because um, you were going to be an 18 Delta right. at one point, yeah. so you're good to right. go. Close, man. I've done some nutrition counseling for people at the gym, right? I can, yeah, create and kinase levels are almost back to normal. Almost. Mm. Right? I'm like, nah, all right. Walked out of the parking lot, signed up for the 240. Clearly, I know it's not a good idea because I didn't tell anyone until a couple of days before. I already had an 18 Delta mine that was going to um, you know, crew me at the race, and that just basically means drive the truck from one aid station to the next, and the truck is a place to sleep. And um, so, yeah, man, I got the Moab 240. So I always say that, you know, dumb, dumb Ranger Tony did Bigfoot, where I was like, I'll sleep an hour a night, and I'll just keep moving, and I'll keep banking extra hours. Well, the Moab 240, I just approached completely different. I'm like, I'm going to sleep two hours to three hours every night, and I'm going to use every second of time to make it from here to here. I was trying to bank time and go fast. Now you build up this extra time. Do you know how many people remember my finish time of that Moab 240? Zero. I don't even remember what it was. All I know is I finished it and I got a picture of me walking underneath a finish line, <laughs> right? And I do know I, I did have about six hours to spare, six to eight hours to spare, whatever it was. But the point here is, unlike the Bigfoot where I was trying to go so hard and not sleep, I walked every step of the way at the last, except for the last 13 miles of 243 miles. I rucked it, you know? And you're just wearing one of them silly little mm -hmm. vests, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. maybe 10 pounds. Enough to get you, you know, in between aid stations, which, you know, are, they're pretty considerable. I mean, you're talking about an aid station, aid station, 20, 25 miles, you know, like marathons. It's not like a marathon where there's an aid station every mile. This is the middle of nowhere, nowhere, Moab, you know. So, yeah, man, I knocked that crazy shit out. And uh, <laughs> freaking, um, we, heck, I was so fresh and, and okay that hopped in the truck instead of staying in Moab, drove back to Denver, you know. And um, so, yeah, man, freaking good experience. Don't necessarily recommend it to anyone. <laughs> um, but if you do get a wild hair and want to run at one of those races, give me a, a ring or a, a DM, and I'll, I'll tell you my strategy. My strategy was ruck march the whole way. The only reason I even ran the last 13-ish, and we didn't run the whole way, is that I linked up with a dude that I had met at the, the Bigfoot, and we trekked it in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, But I wouldn't say that we ran that whole 13. We just – 
I picked up the pace, did some jogging, mm-hmm. blah, blah. But yeah, man, um, you know, like I said, you just gotta get after it, you know, and <laughs> purpose. You know, like, like we talked about, that whole having something, I don't know if you get dramatic and say having something to live for, but that's ultimately what it is. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I stay busy. These days, I'm over the craziness. These days, my PT is all about just staying healthy so I can go hunting. You know, <laughs> that's it. I just, that's my only real hobby I have left. Um, as long as I'm fit enough to throw a 60 pound backpack on and go hike around the mountains and, you know, um, that, that's where I'm at in life. I'm, I'm done. You know, Melissa's still getting after it, just crushing herself in the gym. I'm in there like, I think I'll do back and by. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe just, you know, chest and tries a day, you know, and then a nice little light leg day. Like my deadlifts, man. Uh, so I just turned 46 and I was like, all right, you know, for fun, let's put some weight on there. 500 for three on a deadlift. I'm like, mm, I'm still not old yet. You know what I mean? I'm still kind of young. But typically speaking, man, 400 on the deadlifts, all I do and just do some reps. I'm not trying to hurt me anymore. Because through a lot of the stuff that I did, man, my back hurt, my you know, TBI hurt. Always on that edge. And, and Where'd you get blown up? In Iraq. Yeah, um, freaking armored sedan, IED meant for a striker. Yeah sucks man i was the only one of four in the vehicle to walk away and i didn't walk away um yeah um suck man freaking we just happened we were we were the mark car for the ranger regiment they were they were going to action a big target for us uh, where was it in iraq uh mosul and so we basically we were going to identify we were going to identify the gate that they were going to drive the strikers through just by simply pulling just past it and parking. And at that point, by the time they got there, I would already be out of the vehicle. Last thing I remember is buckling my helmet, putting the buckle on. I just put my helmet on, and uh, so yeah, it was a um, you know it was a, a level seven BMW, but it's you know they're bulletproof, not blast proof, not definitely not EFP proof. Ooh. EFP hit um, right behind the rear seat. So the two boys in the back seat, man, they were DNA'd. And uh driver, I guess he, he died, you know, eight or ten hours afterwards. The um a funny story, man, like, you know, talk about small world stuff. A few years later, I'm running one of the um training courses for the NSA, for them for their security guys, participating in that. And uh, it was the end of the class, everybody got picked, and this one young ranger or whatever, you know, throughout the class we had talked about, yeah, I worked for these people, I was in Mosul, blah, 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 and, you know, because he's a student, he didn't ask until afterwards, you know, everybody graduated, let's go get a you know, steak and some beer, and he's like, hey, uh, hey, Tony, um, did you know that, that team of guys, the, the agency team of guys or whatever, um, up in, in Mosul, that, you know, they got blown up, the whole team died? I was like, Mm, you mean in 2009? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we were up there, man. We were, I was in the range regiment, man. We helped recover that. We were on target for that. We were going to do that. They, when they threw me in their strikers, they thought I was dead. Mm-hmm. Because the reality is, right, man, it blew that car across three lanes. It was a main highway one, <sighs> called it Broadway. We were in the right lane, about to make a right turn into the neighborhood where the target was. Hence why I just buckled my helmet. And uh, that EFP blew that car all the way across three lanes, big medians, you know, the medians are there and stuff, right? Across that, across three lanes and down the alleyway. Yeah. Hitting other cars, right? It wasn't a small ID. And how I live, man, I can only chalk that one up to God, you know? And um, man, it hurt. The blast injuries hurt. I, I came to in uh, Germany, and it hurt. Everything hurt, man. Like I, I'd say, like my fingernails hurt, my gut, splash gut, my lungs. I had edema in my lungs, and if, you know that armored car probably you know clearly saved me. Blah blah blah. But yeah, man, my whole left side was screwed up, freaking just from damage to that and brainstem and all that stuff. And yeah, and that was while you were a contractor, because mm-hmm. you ended up going back in, right? Yeah, I um. <laughs> I what 2012 I was like you know what you know freaking I did these you know this eight years maybe I should go back in the guard I could help the next generation right you know 
what's that thing about good intentions? <laughs> I say that if you get out of the military and then go back in the military, it's like taking your car, driving it into a parking deck, putting it in reverse, and then backing over the spikes and blowing your tires on purpose. That's what going back in the military is like. And I joke. I, I do joke, right? So the uh, – I'll try and keep that in mind because you know all the time I you know those mornings when I wake up like you know I can probably you know I call some people yeah. you know take me back yeah. there. <laughs> ready to rock and roll. No, I um I, I went and so I work for our ASD Advanced Skills Attachment the group level ASD. So I, I get to teach the courses like our CQB course of Falc, and it is worth it. But the guard is its own beast, right? There's like all the BS that you would put up with with the active duty military. And then there's the guard. It has its own personality, its own type of crap. And because it is a part-time thing for so many people and the few full-timers that they full -timers that they have, they're trying to manage, you know, on half staff, all these guys who all have problems, who are all the most important people in their own lives, blah, blah, blah. Luckily, I have an amazing admin staff where I work and stuff, and they keep us squared away. But, you know, it's still the military. And because we're not full-time, we have to jump out of our asses to do stuff. You know, the budget, blah, blah. Hell, Alabama National Guard sent a bunch of people to D.C. after the January 6th thing. The federal government has still not paid Alabama back for that, right? And that's across the board. There are National Guards across our country that don't have funding to pay people. So, like, some of our full-time guys in October when the fiscal year rolled around last fall lost their jobs for, like, three weeks. <laughs> it's like, what? Um, and these are people with mortgages and families and stuff, you know. It's their job. Like, oh, no, we don't have money because, you know, Joe Biden don't want to, you know, send us money. Right? Of course, you don't. Actually, who – Besides the budgets, of Congress. So is it Joe Biden's fault, or is it our representative's fault? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I always go back to this, right? First page, Ranger Handbook. The leader is responsible for everything that does and does not happen on a mission or a patrol. So anyway. Um, I digress. But, yeah, the guard, man, it's good. I get to interact with the young guys, uh, the, the up-and-comers, share some um, – Lessons learned, and uh, it, it's worth it. But, you know, if I go teach stuff out for four weeks, I'm back to making Army money. So, you know, you, you lose money doing it. And sometimes you ask, is it worth it? I got to go put up with this BS and, you know, whatever. Um, but then I remember, like, hey, man, we now have a service full of all the combat vets got out. There is no combat veterans left in special forces for the most part, right? Same with the SEALs, man. I got some guys from up Virginia Beach that come down and, and use my long range. All young, young pups, and they're snipers. I'm like, I thought snipers were supposed to be, like, the most experienced dudes. They're like, we are. <laughs> I'm like, aren't you, like, 22? <laughs> they're like, 26. I'm like, so you mean to tell me you are one of the most experienced dudes in your platoon when you're in the team? You're not even 30 yet. I'm like, yeah, man, everyone with any experience left. Hmm. I'm like, well, crap, it's the same in the Army, same in the Marine Corps. So I look at it like this, man. I feel a little obligated to give back. You know, for whatever reason, I am still here with all my fingers and toes. I still can shoot. I still can teach. And, um, man, I get down there. I can't help it. I'm not the dude on the catwalk. It's not how I teach. <laughs> I put my kid on and go and, and, and do CQB with the teams. And I'm like, all right, check it out, guys. And you're doing that as an act as a, a guard. Guard guy. Yeah. And you when did you go back in the guard? 2012. 2012. Yeah. Did you go on any deployments once you hit 2012? I haven't. Not with them. Got it. Yeah. That's that doesn't pay good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if you so I, I weigh it out like this. Um, since I've blown to ASD, we're not a deploying unit anyway. We're a training detachment. Got it. Um to go do an eight-month deployment with SF, the return on investment just isn't there for me. A, it doesn't pay well enough. It's too long. Um, whereas I can do stuff, you know, with the agency and projects and stuff like that that are shorter, and we actually get to do. So you still been contracting the whole time. Mm -hmm. Did you go to Syria? Mm -hmm. Wh who are you with over there? Were you a contractor? Yeah. 
What was that like? Hmm. I mean, it, it's cool because, like I said, we're uh, – that, that would be the wrong – I was going to say our ROEs are different. The ROEs aren't different. We have a much more efficient chain of command. Um, I don't have to ask for permission to, you know, take a potty break. Whereas, you know, uh, teams typically to move from here to here have to ask permission. We are given a mission we're allowed to go execute. We send up sit reps. We don't have to ask for permission most of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we always have our market yeah, managers some too, right? Because, some time. yeah, you know, it's not for free for all. But we get a mission and we go do it. Um, a lot of our stuff is, you know, um, you know, the ASO type stuff, the source operations, and then uh, AFO, you know, doing the reconnaissance and and um, especially with with the the lay of the the ground as far as the local population and a lot of permisi type stuff. Um, and you, you told me not to do that. Here I am with an acronym, right? Freaking um, <laughs> Parisi is like that that area study of of all the equations that make up a an area, whether it's you know population, resources, and all that sort of thing. Not not just like combatives, right? The entire area, what's going on in this area. So we do a lot of that, um, and of course we can. We can action targets if we need to. Typically, like in Syria, since we were working in such small elements that, you know, it was like, hey, got any rangers not doing anything tonight? Mm-hmm. You know? You know, we got, is there an ODA around here that can come do this? You know, where are the SEALs at? You know? But, um, yeah, man, that 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 type of work is really cool. I've, I've done stuff in, in Haiti, and, you know, we've got a lot of things going on that, that are, like I said, more more U.S. interest mm-hmm. than national defense. And one definitely leads to the other, right? Like, it's important. If you talk to a lot of people, are like, oh, we need to withdraw from around the world. Well, if we want to continue to be a superpower, we have to continue to influence in a positive way around the world. This is why Ukraine is so hard to figure out right now. My take on Ukraine is, hey, man. Europe is full of a bunch of really well-powered, modern nations. It is their AO, right? Yeah, with modern militaries. Very modern militaries, right? We, we help with that. Russia wants Russian land back. The, the parts of the Ukraine it really wants. I don't, and maybe, maybe Putin, I don't know what Putin's thinking, right? Like, maybe he wants the whole nation. They've shown us since, you know, even four, since 14 when they took or they didn't take Crimea, right? Crimea allowed themselves to be annexed. There's a big difference. Yeah. The Ukraine, you know, the south and the east, I mean, they're native Russians, right? And that's, again, Americans, we're too stupid to know that there is a difference between Russians and Ukrainians. They speak two different languages. Yeah. Right? And do they, a lot of them speak both? Of course. You know, it'd be no different than like the border of Texas. Lots of people spoke, speak both. But there is a clear difference between Americans and Mexicans, right? And that's what's happening here. In, in Ukraine, they, Russia wants it lands back. Does what Russia also want a warm water port? Well, yeah, Russia's wanted a warm water port for decades, a century or more now. Probably longer than that, since navies have been navies. They've wanted warm water. Well, okay, I get it. Are we at a point in our, so we have two things, right? Like this president, who is weak, clearly, could stand up to Russia, draw a line in the sand, and be the heroes, and Russia doesn't get to invade. Or we can act tough, Russia invades, we look like a bunch of pusses, and now we're obligated to fight. That's the wrong answer, man. American boys and girls don't need to go fucking die in the Ukraine. The Ukraine is one of the most corrupt nations on this planet. Now, that is partly due to Russia keeping them that way. A corrupt Ukraine can't get into NATO. Right? NATO's not letting them in in their current state. It's just not happening. So that's part of it. It's like, well, we want them in NATO. Well, if we really wanted them in NATO, we'd let them join NATO three, five, ten years ago. They're not eligible. So... I mean, come on, man. We got to, you know, like there's a difference in messing and meddling and getting ourselves into it. And you got to, you know, again, not a conspiracy theorist, but with everything that's going wrong for this administration, one can't help but to 
at least entertain the idea that it's a distraction from all the other crappy mistakes. Now, all of a sudden, Biden wants to look strong. Well, there's Biden and there's Putin. And I don't think Putin is ready to step back from Biden. I think he's calling his bluff, man. You know? And I don't think that Biden has that, hey, let's sit down and hash this out type of freaking mentality. You know? Well, un- unfortunately, in that case, like, I, I unfortunately, tr- truthfully, I have a hard time thinking that that Biden could carry on a logical conversation and negotiation with Putin. Like, right. it just doesn't seem like that's a feasible thing. Right. I mean, he has a hard time. He has a hard time, unfortunately, as we watch him, he has a hard time putting together sentences, right? I mean, putting together legitimate sentences that are prepped for him. Right. That's, well, that's really, really, and, really disturbing. Really, really he, horrible to see. Yeah. And you think he's going to go in with a freaking KGB agent and and be able to carry on a conversation and not get manipulated and right. taken take advantage of? It's very a, disturbing. A KGB agent that for the last 20 years has not been distracted by some wars in the Middle East. Yeah. And we have been. He's been preparing and preparing for whatever he wants to do while we've been messing about. In the Middle East. Yeah. And that's, you know, talking earlier about iterative decision making. Here's another bad move when you're in a leadership position is painting yourself into a corner. Right. You know, don't paint yourself into a corner. The world changes. Things change. Things happen. And don't put yourself in a situation where you can't say, hey, this is the direction we're going now. It's a little bit different than where we were heading, but it's okay because I the whole time was saying I might go in a different direction. That's okay. And you know what? Let's say we have this amazing, charismatic, badass leader, which we don't, that allows us to look like we're letting Russia paint us into a quarter and then poof, he's got a whole nother plan. That would be cool, but that's not what's <laughs> happening. That's not what's happening, right? Like that's that old, what's the, uh, everybody likes to quote the whole, um, you know, um, what's the Chinese book? Uh, Sun Tzu. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I always laugh. I'm like, whenever somebody wants to, uh, you know, sound like they understand war. They're going to quote that guy. You know, feudal Chinese battle and and you know war theory. Uh, okay, cool, but great. Some of us have actually participated in war. Thanks for quoting that. Um, but there is a good, the whole thing of you know the ruse: appear weak when you're strong. You know, appear strong when you're weak. Right? Like always give missed signals to your um, to your enemy and adversaries. Yeah, that's not what we're doing. Our adversaries clearly understand that we have a very broken leader. I don't even want to say weak. Um, Because I would say that probably uh, Biden, as goofball as he has been throughout his career, I mean, Biden in the 80s and 90s was definitely an intelligent person, Mm -hmm. right? Um, That guy, as a president, probably could have been decisive. But this Biden we have today is just an... You know, an old, broken person, um, and, and you know that. You know, I, I talk about term limits. How about a retirement age? That would be nice at this point. Yeah, I mean, we have eighty plus year olds running our country, and I always ask people, "Yeah, would you trust your eighty five year old grandma to walk your dog?" Right? Like, put that into perspective. What would you trust your eighty five year old, your eighty year old? grandparents with and i'm sure there are plenty of outliers right there are 100 years old yeah. out there that are brilliant outliers never prove a rule military's retirement has a retirement age every industry has a retirement age our government 65 why are our justices why are our representatives why is our president allowed why i mean it's socially acceptable to have a retirement age on these things you know and of course, term limits. But it, it 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 scares me that we are literally at a point right now where this this president and this administration could lead us into a world war, and we're not ready for it. I mean, I'm sure. Don't get me wrong. How many how many weeks would it take for American soldiers and the, sailors the, to get yeah, ready? Yeah, the military is ready for it. The, the military is ready technically to fight, of course. Right. But are we ready to? start losing people in Ukraine, which a lot of people couldn't even figure out where it is on a map that we don't understand. We don't care about that much against Russia, who's Russia. So who's ready for that? When you say who's ready, I'd say we're ready to fight, of course. But are we ready to go and die and kill a bunch of people that we don't know and civilians that are going to die as well? It's like, "Mm, we may want to think through that a little bit. I'm all for helping our allies. Right, that's a good thing. We need a strong bunch of allies. 
But the Ukraine has known for well over a decade, right, that Putin wanted that land back. So my question is, what has the Ukraine, what has Ukraine? I've, I've been told that you're not supposed to call it the Ukraine. Do you know, uh, do you know why? Because Ukraine, I guess it means frontier. Mm-hmm. And if you say the frontier, which is the Ukraine, mm-hmm. that's the frontier of Russia. Mm. So calling it the frontier, that's that's where yeah, that little, okay. that's I where had, that little I hadn't uh, heard thing that. comes from. Somebody told me like in a comment on social media that you know, it's not it's the not, Ukraine. And I'm like, it's just Ukraine. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I don't know that I, I'm not purposely trying to diminish that nation. Uh, no intent implied. Um, yeah, I don't know, Jocko, man. It's 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 so frustrating. It's like we have all these problems. And I again, I'm not the... I'm not the guy that says, hey, we have to completely withdraw from the rest of the world. No, we, we have to be involved yeah, that's not to maintain point. our status. But like to just to go meddle with the Ukraine when they've done very little to prepare themselves for this date, which they knew were, was coming. They've done nothing to get their allies in Europe to help them. They've, you know, like, hey. And again, any of these situations. Any of these situations around the world, just to say, oh, we're not going to get involved with anyone anymore, that's not a good move. No, that's not that's the not answer. That's not a good move. No. It's a good move to say, well, okay, what's happening? What would make sense? Let's try this approach. Let's see what happens with this approach. If this approach works, cool. We'll continue to invest in that approach. If that approach isn't working, we'll say, you know what? We didn't realize that there's a bunch of different, because Ukraine's got all kinds of different factions in there. Oh, we didn't realize that. We, 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 we looked at it a little bit too broad and we thought Ukraine was Ukraine. It was Ukraine against Russia. Doesn't really look like it's that anymore. Uh, we're we're going to stand down, right? right? Or we're going to back away. Or we're going to really support this group that yeah. we know is now come to the surface as being the, the prominent power there. Okay. Instead of saying what we're saying right now, like we don't understand what's happening fully and we can't predict the future. So don't, don't, over index right. on things that you can't predict. Don't right. do that in anything. Right. Well, and also let's you know, influence. Clearly, we are still a superpower with tons of influence. Even if our European allies don't respect our current leader, he still brings to the table an immense amount of tools that he can use to sway them. Hey, look. Oh, hey, Britain. You guys don't want to back us up with whatever we want to do. We're going to cut such and such off. Oh, hey, Germany. Right? All those things. Because those, those Eastern Bloc, man, they all love us, right? <laughs> they're, we're, you know, we're, you know there's, there, are, there are two allies now. You've got, you know, the Brits, the French, and Germans who are kind of, they've been flipping their middle finger up to us yeah. quite a bit for the last 10 years. Okay, guys, that's your stance? Cool. We're going to continue to be friends with Romania and Hungary and uh, Lithuania, Estonia. Yeah, we're going to back them up. Because they're, they're on the line with Russia. You guys, screw you guys. Take care of yourselves for a little while, right? Just like Trump wanted to pull funding from NATO. Like, you guys are going to start funding this, right? He took a little bit hard line with our allies. Like, hey, we're going to treat you guys like adults now. We're going to cut some of your funding. You guys are going to start contributing. That's not a horrible approach, right? Accountability. Uh, own it, right? You guys want NATO? You like NATO, don't you, right? You guys like that security of having us backing you up from across the pond, just like we did in World War II. Yeah, y'all know. So check it out. Here's some new rules we're going to play by. You know, we've been funding this thing. We're going to take a step back. We're going to let you guys take the lead for a little while, see how you do with it, right? There's nothing wrong with that. No. And I think Trump was trying to do that. I don't you know. Um, and, you know, let's face it. Those leaders in, in those countries, man, they 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 led the way. They're, they are the Bidens ahead of Biden. Europe, America likes to think we lead the way with everything. Like, we led the way with this crazy, goopy leftist presidency and all this stuff. No, man, Europe was way ahead of us on that stuff. Their leaders, right, have been crazy liberals for freaking, you know, five, ten years now. They They definitely got to jump on that for us, you know. Not that that's a good thing. So until we just take a step back and say, hey, guys, deal with it. I do think, you know, clearly in this case, war with Russia, war with China, man, you're talking something that would affect the entire world and be so expensive for all parties, right? Putin, here's the reality. Putin doesn't want war with us. It would destroy his country. They don't have the money for it. Exactly. So choke them out. 
oh, that means cutting off that pipeline we told them they could have. Shit, that's going to mean we have to freaking admit we were wrong. <laughs> Sanctions. Russia can't afford. And, and even more so, right? Like, if the rest of the world distances themselves from Russia, stops. And, then, and Russia's st- standing there with a China that's kind of their ally, but also trying to shove them out of the way at the same time. And Iran, that's your friends, Putin. <laughs> the rest of the world is kind of tired of y'all's crap. And they go back to behaving, right? And, and ultimately, again, root cause, why does Russia want this? Why does Russia want it? We just identify that. We can cut them off at the knees. It's just so frustrating, man. And again, you know, I always step back and say, you know what? I don't know everything. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get to peek behind that curtain, right? Like clearly Biden or whoever's running our country, um, <laughs> Vice President Harris, they know way more than I do. So I'm always going to give any administration a little bit of benefit of a doubt, right? Like, you know, I always, I, I, mean, I hated growing up in the military where some key leader would be like, well, you just don't understand the big picture. And then as I got older, I realized that yeah, I, understand I don't it. understand the big picture. <laughs> they didn't understand it either, dude. Yeah, of course, they didn't either, right? Like, that was their way of saying, like, yeah, we don't really know what the hell's going on either. But now that I'm older, I do have an acceptance that I don't have the big picture, and I never will, right? None of us will ever know what the president of the United States knows, right? Like, there's no security clearance out there that touches what that guy gets to know or that gal, presumably, one day. Um no, so you, as us, as the guys who work for that commander in chief, always has to kind of sit back and go, okay, they know more than us. So I always try to keep that in reserve, you know, like that to keep me from creating assumptions and assertions that are, yeah. is realizing that my assumptions and my assertions are always going to be less informed. Right. Right. right? Yeah, they've got massive. Intel networks briefing every day, sources all over the world. Like right. they got some, they got some information. Right. Still, I, I like to think that they do some good stuff with it. <laughs> Me too. I'm like, please God, um, because right now, man, what we've gotten ourselves into is scary. And and again, and, and especially yeah, if when China, you, like you're talking about China. What if China makes a move on Taiwan now? Like they're not sitting over there going, oh well, if it, it's America gets clear back in Ukraine, that the withdrawal from Afghanistan is what set this stage, right? Like, I don't know anybody except for, like, some staunch left supporters of... I don't even know if there's any Biden supporters left, but there are the the Democrats, right, who are just never going to say that they were wrong for voting for him or that he anything they've done is wrong, right? You know, this, this is how our system works. But the reality is any objective, synthetic thinker knows that this all started with our withdrawal from Afghanistan and the weakness that was just, you know, sent out across the world. Worldwide. So what was the, or was there a straw that broke the camel's back that made you say, I'm, I'm going to go and run? Because, I mean, let's face it. Here you are. How old you say you are? Just turned 46. Just turned 46. You got businesses. You got a cool woman in your life. You got a a nice place to live or whatever. Yeah. Seems like you could be going into actual literal retirement mode. Yeah, like instead like of enjoying your life swamp. mode, right? And and that's where I was at and I'd been working towards it pretty hard. You know, even living in Wilmington drove me insane. Stoplights and traffic and you know, heck, just I, I flew in yesterday and I'm mm-hmm. like, ah, traffic. <laughs> because you know, Melissa and I bought 62 acres about an hour outside of Wilmington. You know, it came with three donkeys and chickens and fenced-in pastures, and we turn our dogs loose. And, I mean, if I want to walk around my yard naked, you know what I mean? It's that type of country, you know? It's the same way I grew up. And I, I think, you know, whether that's genetic or not, I've always craved it. I like to be in places where it's just quiet. You know, growing up on the coast, you know, the water, and then because of a dare um, or someone talking smack, I went to dive school, wound up on a dive team. I wanted to be on the mountain team. I went to Afghanistan and fell in love with the mountains because before Afghanistan, I had done some training in Colorado, but not really enough to fall in love with the mountains and the thin air and all that. 
Well, we went to Afghanistan, man, and I was just, man, you know, I remember looking around like in Tora Bora and stuff and, and you know, um, like, wow, this would be some amazing snowboarding. Like, <laughs> what are they doing here? You know, and at the time, I didn't even realize that it actually was a destination back in the 60s. Yeah. My stepmother and her friends all went to Cabo in the late 60s to smoke weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my stepmother, she was, uh, it's so funny, my mom, you know, a North Carolina girl, country girl, farm girl, my grandfather was a farmer, um, and then my stepmother's from out here. Oh. Yeah, she was from like, uh, uh-oh, <laughs> I should say, uh, uh-oh. <laughs> where was she at? Uh, I forget her hometown, but um, um, between here and L.A. Mm-hmm. And uh, So she was like a hippie? A little bit in the mm-hmm. '60s turned into. I mean, like, if she was traveling to Afghanistan, yeah, smoking pop in the right. '60s. Got it, yeah. but hippie. not like a not like a, um, an anti-government mm-hmm. hippie. Just like a California young yeah. girl, you know, whatever. And so cool stories, you know. And, and I had no idea there was that part of Afghanistan that it was actually very Western and mm-hmm. modern during the '60s. You know, Kabul. You look at pictures. There's, you know, the roads are nice. It's clean. People are smiling. You know. So anyway, yeah, man, I'm just not into the city, you know. The, I would these days, you put me behind a tractor or a combine, and I got to go six mile an hour for ten miles, no stress. <laughs> I'm not even gonna uh, whatever, you know. I don't care because living out there, I'm rarely in a hurry. I have days that I have work to do and clients and guys to shoot with and classes, but on my days off, man, I'm my boss, you know. And don't get me wrong, I can be my own kind of a pain in my ass, but I'm flexible with my time. <laughs> So no stress, you know, um, got out of the city. Everything's awesome. It sucks for Melissa because she drives almost an hour every day one way to her practice. Oh. But, you know, she's she's chill. Um, you know, she loves to listen to her podcast and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, she's a dentist, so she works four days a week. And um, so Friday she gets to go and do whatever she wants or whatever. So, you know, before we did it, you know, I was like, hey, are you sure? Because our, our place is cute, man. And I found it by accident. I just happened to be driving down that road, took a different route home one day, and uh, saw the for sale sign. Pulled off the side of the road, pulled up Google Maps. You could kind of see the property lines. I was like, ooh, called the realtor, man. We closed on it. So, yeah, you know, there are days where, like, my most intelligent conversation is with a couple of donkeys and some dogs. <laughs> I don't even see people. <laughs> You know, my nearest neighbor, well, my nearest, nearest neighbor is like some meth heads that live like, I don't know, half a mile through the woods. Um, we basically have an agreement that um, they sat out of my business and, you know, I sat out of their business and their trailer doesn't burn down. Um, you know how meth cookhouses sometimes, you know, catch on fire. So we're good. You know, we're good. Every now and then I'll wake up and like, you know, I can hear their music playing at like four in the morning or something. But other than that, they don't mess with me. I don't mess with them. They're just redneck meth heads and uh, then the other neighbor man it's kind of cool she lives like 1.2 miles away and she's completely deaf so she can't hear the range <laughs> other than that no one lives within two miles of us you know so we get out there and shoot and shoot and shoot no one cares so it's real cool man yeah so we were planning on moving to idaho and as the costs were going up we we're starting to look at montana as well because a couple of years ago montana being really expensive Idaho was still like, all right. And the cool thing about Idaho for me is, while the Rockies aren't as high there, they're not, they don't have the same elevation as, say, Colorado or wherever, Idaho is like 60% public land. Lots of hunting access. And um, I, I like hunting, but I like being on those mountains, man. You know, just it's quiet. Most of the time it's just me and Melissa. But, um, yeah, man, we, we'd found a couple different places. We were looking at one place very seriously in Idaho City, just north of Idaho City. And uh, I was like, all right. And then everything in America started happening. Because, man, that's where I was at. You know, my business is doing great. I mean, Melissa's a dentist, so, like. Was she ready know, to uh, pull chalks, too? Yeah, yeah. And for her to do that is kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, clearly, like I said, I can I can pack a backpack and a duffel bag and move. Mm. You know, grab some guns out of the safe. Let's go. Um, she clearly, you know, I mean, she, you know, she's got eighteen or nineteen employees, mm. <laughs> all females. <laughs> um, they always, it's always fun because they've always got something going on. You know, um, 
I don't want to call it drama because that would be dismissing it, but the dynamics in that office are always fun to listen to, you know, because I have team dynamic stuff and then I get to listen to Melissa about her team dynamics and it's like a lot of the same stuff that we would deal with only with a, a hint of, you know, the lady stuff, you know. <laughs> And I'm like, wow, I don't envy her at all. Because at least like on a team, man, in theory, you could always go out back and sort it out, you know. <laughs> at least go in there and put the gloves on and sort that shit out, right? She doesn't have that option. So, yeah, man, um, we were really close to pulling the trigger on moving. And we had talked about it for years. Like our first date w that we claim is our first date, right? We were, when she and I met, she and her boyfriend had just broke up. Me and the girl I was dating had just broke up. And we were real skeptical of each other. We'd known each other from the gym and kind of looked at each other like, I don't know, who's that punk? Who's that punk? You know, both very strong personalities. She's her own boss. Same with me. I've been a boss for a while now. I don't really. And that dynamic was just so interesting as we came together. We kind of kept it quiet that we were seeing each other. So our kind of an announcement to all of our friends and you know how a gym can be everyone's mm -hmm. friends from the gym mm -hmm. and um we did a hike across the bob marshall wilderness out in montana Dang. but it wasn't supposed to be a hike across oh. it was supposed to be a loop back to the car two days 20 some miles well that night we hit our turnaround point and we woke up in the morning and there was smoke everywhere largest forest fire ever in the Flathead National Forest and, and the Bob Marshall was inside the Flathead. Uh-oh, now what? So now we are running from a forest fire all the way across the Bob Marshall. So it was like 70 or so miles and we didn't even have the food for it. And right now in the console of my truck are protein bars. They're not mine. They're for her. Her favorite protein bars because the last thing anyone wants is for Melissa to get hungry. <laughs> we, hangry? Is she a hangry oh woman? <laughs> so Melissa is uh, Melissa is half German and half Japanese. <laughs> I live with the Axis powers. <laughs> Keeping her fed is a priority. We, I'm telling you, man. And, and it's not like a gradual descent. It's, <laughs> everything's cool, and now she just wants to tear your throat out. <laughs> and, and you, you don't know it. Yeah, and you don't even know it's coming. I'm like, I'm blissfully, you know, like, <laughs> do, 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 you know, I'm not real crazy or anal about my diet anymore, right? Like, my thing is, like, I just, you know, I started getting a little older, started not having abs as much. So I just quit eating breakfast and lunch. Simple. Some people call that intermittent fasting. I call it, screw it, less calories. <laughs> um, no fancy diet names here. And uh, no, dude, she needs to eat. So we have to keep her fed. But yeah, uh, we run out of food, running across the Bob Marshall. So you're one day in when the forest fire hits. <laughs> and how many, what's the total day? Uh, we wound up doing it in, uh, all in, in two and a half, two and three quarters days. And 70 some miles, man, we had to go across the Continental Divide. It's like, you gotta climb like 9,000 feet in, in like a mile and a half. It's like zig, zig, zig. I remember we were going up the, the, um, the zigzags, right? The switchbacks. And I remember looking up, the trail would go here to here. And on the trail right there were three or four mule deer. And I was looking up at their bellies, like right there, but I could still almost touch them. Dang. It was like this. Anyway, God bless your heart, man, on that, Trip across the Bob Marshall, she learned how to read a topo map. Freaking was running the GPS. She had never done that stuff before. She done, I mean, she had been ice climb, mountain climb, hiked in all kinds of national forests. Her and her buddy from dental school were like adventurous young ladies out. In some cases, they tell me stories I'm like, that was dumb and dangerous. You could have been one of those missing person stories. And they were like, yeah, probably. Well, anyway, just that type of person, man. And, um, we had to cross the White River, and it's in August, so it's snow melt, you know? And man, I made a huge mistake, freaking. So, because she's so physically fit, but dude, she's, she's 120, maybe 125 pounds at this time. And I'm like, oh, this is a good place to cross this river. I mean, it's rolling. It's like knee deep to me. That's halfway her quads. Mm -hmm. I got across, dropped my pack, and I could see she was struggling, right? and. I'm pretty sure-footed. I've been in the woods, backpacks, walking stick. She's got a walking stick, but it's got her where it's starting to leverage her off. Mm -hmm. And, man, I got back out there, and, you know, the rocks under that water are slick. And I'm like, get out there, man. And I put my hand on her backpack, and she slipped. We went in a drink. 
And I was lucky. I got underneath her, and man, it was like that whole push her up, get me some air, go back under, and man, I got scuffed up. My whole backside, my knees, this whole side just beat up. She's got her pack on, so she's pretty protected or whatever. And luckily, there's a curve in the river because a couple hundred meters on down this way is the Salmon River. If we had gone in that, go through those little bit of falls and into that river, we would have died, right? Luckily, a little curve, man, it washed us up on the shore, and we kind of crawled out, laid there. It's warm in the afternoon, but, man, the water was cold, real cold. And, like, cold enough to where I'm bleeding and scuffed up, but I can't feel it. And I'm like, ooh, I'm going to be sore. <laughs> this is going to suck. She rolls over and looks at me. She's like, oh, you saved my life. And I was like, yeah, we're going to go with that story. Because <laughs> I'd pick that river crossing, man. I almost killed her. Almost killed that girl, man. And I will never, yeah, it, it spooks me even talking about it, right? Freaking. Because and, and, who would have believed afterwards that I chose that river crossing, right? They'd be like, oh, he did that on purpose. He drowned that girl. <laughs> but no, we were new, and I was like, oh, I'm in love with this chick and stuff. And I, it, it horrified me that I'd made such a stupid decision. Just stupid. But we were running from a forest fire or whatever, freaking haste, all that. I did learn that she's not one of us. You know, I still have to be careful. She's smaller, so on and so forth. Anyway, man. We get across there or whatever, freaking out. It was like our first date coming out of the closet as far as us dating and stuff. And, and man, it was, ever since then, every vacation we took was to the mountains. She she wants to climb Everest. Hmm. Which clearly puts me in an interesting position because I don't give a damn about climbing Everest. But I can't just let my girlfriend you do now. Go, right? I'm like, <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to go up there too. Or I just suck it up and say, hey, honey, I'm going to wait for you in the base camp. Freaking hang out with these potheads. And freaking I'll talk to you on the radio. Are you dead? No, you're good. Keep going, right? Summit that thing. But no. So we start climbing the 14ers in uh, Colorado. So we're doing that stuff, man. Just falling in love with the mountains. Point being is we want to move to the mountains. Her best friend from dental schools in Colorado or originally talking about going to Colorado and then it – Got a little California on us. Um, lots of public hunting land there. Um, one of two states left that you can get over the counter tags for elk. No big deal. Um, and if you leave Denver, Boulder, right? Go up anywhere. Freaking, it's still Dodge trucks with bumpers. You know, it's still diesel pickups and good old ranch boys, you know. So I, I would do Colorado if she wanted. But we kind of figured on, on Idaho. A bunch of my friends moved to Idaho. and Probably a bunch of your friends mm -hmm. have moved to Idaho. It's like the where everybody's going. It's the last conservative holdout, I guess. Well, we were that close, man. We were getting ready to pull the trigger on moving. And, and like I said, a big deal for her with her practice. And then everything started happening. The pandemic, the weirdness. It's, it got to the point where like I was like, wow, one year ago, if you'd asked me how long it was going to take for us to get right here, I would have said 20 years. But somehow the U.S. got put on fast forward to its you know, progressive decline. And every nation has it, right? History tells us every culture fails. And we have some very distinct parallels to the last greatest culture, right? The last greatest um, city-state, Rome, right? The Roman Empire, you know, huge debt. A, a nation and culture founded on slavery, on the backs of slaves, right? There are many parallels a nation who cared more about entertaining themselves than protecting their borders, right? It's some spooky parallels. And I'm like, ooh. And then I'm talking to my very good friend, Alario Pontano. Alario, if you Google him, he was the Marine in Fallujah that shot and killed two terrorist dirtbags and then was charged with their murders. Lieutenant type, um, so, you know, he, um, his platoon, he had lost some boys the day before. So he was an enlisted guy, scout sniper, was working on Wall Street when 9-11 happened, doing great for himself and his family. Smart guy. Um, real smart dude. And 9-11 happened, and he got back in. And then in Fallujah, man, you know, for killing two very clearly terrorists, right? Remember Fallujah, get out or fight us. Anybody that stays, you're a bad guy. And they were bad guys. They had weapons in the trunk, so on and so forth. 
What got weird, for, or you can look his story up, but bottom line, they charged him with murder. Two counts of it. And for how many months of his life he was having to defend himself against a nation that he so much loved and went to war for. Well, Ilario ran for Congress in 2010 and 2012. I bet it right before then, 2008 time frame when I opened my gym. Mm-hmm. So I watched, and, and as he was running, I was still very apolitical, wasn't really interested, so on and so forth. Um, the primaries didn't work out for him. They were fighting him and another fellow who is now the incumbent, uh, a guy named David Rouser. They were fighting for that area. Um, and what they were really fighting was a 30-some-year Democrat incumbent. Well, between the two of them, they did finally oust him, And but David Rouser bested Ilario in the primaries. He just had more pull in one highly populated segment of that district, and, you know, David came out the winner. Um, since then, you know, Lario, he became the director of Veterans Affairs and stuff for North Carolina. Long story short, man, just, you know, has dedicated his life to trying to take care of service members. And uh, just, just a great guy. But last Easter day, we're sitting on the tailgate of my truck out at the range, and we're just chatting. He took a job at, at Syracuse University and, and was living up in Syracuse, down visiting. And we were just chatting about things, the nation, the state of it, and so on and so forth. And I was like, hey, man. So I was thinking about potentially maybe dude he hops off the tailgate and he's like he can get excited, you know, <laughs> like when he gets excited, he's really excited. He's like, Yes, if there's ever a time, it's twenty twenty two, the nation's ready for it, the climate needs you, it's this, this is he just got he didn't even let me finish. He knew what I was gonna say, and which I thought was pretty cool because I don't necessarily think I you know broadcast something like that especially something so out of left field for me but he just had a feeling and it was funny because it's easter day and he's like you know what i was like well i'm just kicking around i'm not sure he's like it's easter day and there's it's clearly god sent me here today to tell you that you must absolutely do this and i'm sitting there going (laughs) (laughs) okay not really where i thought this was going to go but now i'm like all right, all right. So if he feels this strongly about it, and he's the first person that I've even mentioned it to, maybe this is something I should look at. And at the time, I'm still like, I just want to move to Idaho. I just want to go hunting. I just want to be left alone, mind my own business. And then I realized that the reason we're where we're at is because dudes like me have been minding our own damn business while the left has rallied, protested, organized, and executed a subversion campaign that the world, like the world's never seen before, right? A very successful subversion campaign. And uh, so fast forward a little bit, so that was Easter day. Uh, Laria puts me in contact with the folks who are, are now my consultant team and all that. We start kind of exploring, right? Let's come up with some courses of action, see if they're viable. Let's see if this works. Well, North Carolina and the census picks up an extra an additional, not an extra, an additional seat. So we had 13, now we're gonna have 14 uh, representatives, U.S. House of Representatives. Yeah, man, Um, so we're like, okay, let's just, we're gonna have to wait and see, because right now I live in that same district with the incumbent, David Rouser, and by all means, a pretty squared away dude. Um, He hasn't, he hasn't done anything to really upset anybody, he's not a rhino, I wouldn't say he's like, you know, the champion of all things patriotic America either, but what he has done is take care of his district, which is agriculture. Yeah, I think he's probably going to become the uh, the lead on the agriculture committee. At least that's what I've heard. Um, well, so we decided, hey, look, if I'm going to run, I'm going to have to wait to see the new districts because challenging Rouser is probably a losing thing. I'm not doing America any good challenging an opponent that can't be beat. That's not a good strategy, mm-hmm. right? And you know, Especially a guy that's doing what he's supposed to do, representing right. his district. That's right. I am all for challenging Republican incumbents that suck. <laughs> they need to go, right? And I've said numerous times, reelect no one. Reelect no one. But the reality is there are still some good dudes up there who need some backup. They need a QRF, <laughs> right? Um, so the new districts come out, and the county I live in and a couple of others to include Cumberland County, Fayetteville, Fort Bragg, Harnett County, this little block 
this little, almost a square right in the middle of North Carolina, mostly rural, and I live in it. And it's got Fayetteville for a brag. I'm like, oh, okay. Now we're making sense and no incumbent. Damn. Right. Like it's ready made. It's just sitting there ready for me to go, woo, I'm going to run for Congress. <laughs> so we announced, man. And um, we had already put it together. We were ready. Right. We were just waiting on those districts. And it was like, okay, this this makes sense. Right. I can do this and, and hopefully go do some, be part of positive change, help correct this trajectory. I, I joke that it's like a 308 trajectory and we're trying to make it like a, like a, you know, a 375 enabler uh, trajectory, <laughs> you know, let's, 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 let's flatten this curve a little bit, not the pandemic curve. Let's like flatten this trajectory curve that America has been placed on by crazy socialists. Um, so yeah, man, that happened. We said, okay, cool. This makes sense. But you asked like the straw that broke the camel's back, man. I'm not usually a super sentimental type person or whatever, but that. Um, my, my father passed last summer. We held his memorial service over July the 4th weekend. My niece, my older sister's daughter, like I said, my older sister is a, a very successful uh, pediatric, pediatric endocrinologist. My niece has never known what it's like to miss a meal. Um, she doesn't know suffering. And in a lot of ways, I'm kind of that guy that's like, this next generation sucks and these boys need to learn how to change the oil in their car. Right, I mean, we all get into that sometimes. We're like, man, this next gen is just weak. But I'm looking at my niece, who is this beautiful young lady, lacrosse player. She's almost six foot tall, stud, freaking a year ahead in school, super intelligent, right? Um, not only is my sister, you know, more aggressive than me, she's a brilliant mind. So her son and her daughter got some of this. Well, anyway, they come to the house. My niece is playing, you know, the, she, my sister's in biotech, so she lives in Boston. So my niece is a city kid. So she's out on my, you know, property, riding the four-wheeler, playing with the dogs, freaking throwing, you know, the dummies into the pond for the, the retriever. And I'm just looking at her. And I'm like, she's never known what it's like to not have Wi-Fi. That level of luxury, right? Like, that's America. I mean, even the poorest people in America today have it pretty good, like, Homeless people in America, you know, have it pretty good. You know, we take care of even our poorest. But I'm looking at her, and I'm just like, huh, she's never known what it's like. Like, since she's been able to use a smartphone, they've had Wi-Fi on airplanes. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't want her to ever know what it's like not to live in that type of luxury. I don't want her to live in what Western Mosul looked like in 2005, 2006, and then for the whole entire Nineveh to be burned to the ground and crushed and the indigenous folks of Nineveh City to be murdered by ISIS, right? Like, I don't want her to know an America at war with itself. And if we keep on this trajectory, that is a potential course. And that scares the shit out of me. And I don't know that any of us will be alive to see that type of demise of our culture, but she might be, All right? She's 16 years old. And that was the day that I was like, all right, let's do it. July the 4th weekend last year. And it wasn't because it was July the 4th weekend. It just happened, right? This is kind of a, I guess, a cool story. And I'm not a very sentimental type person or whatever, but it was about my niece. It was the weekend that we memorialized my father's life. And I was like, okay, eight years is all I'll do. <laughs> that, that will put me at 55 years old. And then I'll retire. And I was hopefully, if I can continue the path that I'm on, I will maintain physical fitness. And at 55, I'll still be fit enough to go hunt whatever crazy animal I want to chase around a mountain. <laughs> but I was like, you know what? It, if not me, then who? I'm at a place where I can. Like I said, me and Melissa don't have children. And you know as well as I do, right? Like overseas, I, I had different times in my life where I wouldn't take a married guy with kids on my team. I would take that young ranger because I know he wasn't distracted. I built a team there for a while that was just, <laughs> they were some scary young men. They had no distractions. I have sent men home for being on the phone too often, too late, arguing with their spouses. Hey, go, go home, sort it out. I'll see you in a few weeks. Or bro, hey man, I understand if you don't want to come back, go take care of your family. 
but you don't get to be here running operations with us while you got that distraction on your in, on your mind. So I don't have kids, man. I can go and go to D.C. and be fully vested, right? While another person like me who might be considering a run that have, has two kids, they need to go to a ballet concert or a ballet recital, not concert, or a band concert or a soccer game or a lacrosse game or a football game or whatever. You'll be sitting at your desk. <laughs> I can get to work. Yeah. You'll be making shit happen. Oh, the, the whole desk image just ruined it, bro. Like, <laughs> can we not put me behind a desk? Um, yeah, you know, I, I was joking. I was like, um, I want to make C-SPAN the most watched news network. Oh, I like that play. <laughs> like, see what this crazy I want people, yeah, I want people to again. like be tuning in to see it. Like, okay, what in the world has Tony and the – so <laughs> this is kind of cool, right? AOC and that weird bunch, they call them the squad, mm -hmm. right? Clearly not an infantry squad. <laughs> so myself, Jay Collins is a uh, seventh grouper uh, who's running in Florida. He's an amputee. He's a stud, man, stud of studs. And uh, so he's running down in Florida. He's doing really well as well. And we were joking that, hey, man, if they can have the squad, we'll be the JTF, <laughs> the Joint Task Force, right? Yeah. And that's the thing, man. We were, we were trying really hard to put, get all of JTF America. Yeah, dude. JTF you know, America. That's a caucus, right? The JTF caucus, the Veterans Caucus, whatever you want to call us, right? But, yeah, man, that, that is how I made that decision. It's like, you know, hey, man, there is an entire generation of Americans that, that – that, that needs to be taken care of, that needs to be set up for success. And I feel like it's my generation, the, the, you know, the, the 40, the 60 year olds right now who have failed this last generation and allowed all this to happen because we were just hardworking conservatives that minded our own damn business. And by minding our own damn business, we elected these spineless cowards that went to DC and sold us out time after time again compromised our rights away, right? Everybody's heard to saying conservatives haven't conserved a damn thing because conservatives are good people and they think dealing with the left is a, is, is, is a rational thing. The problem is the left are not rational people. They only want what they want and they're not going to compromise. The right just keeps compromising bit by bit by bit. Every single right that we hold dear, they let it go. Piece by piece by piece. And that's how this nation can fall, right? There's clearly no nation on this planet that's going to invade us, right, and, and get anywhere. You know, the old there's a gun behind every blade of grass, right? The Japanese knew they weren't hitting this mainland, right? China knows they can't. Same with Russia. The only way we can fall is if we allow it. And we have allowed this country to get where it's at. And when I say we, I mean us, all of us good people. It's our fault. I made a post on social a couple weeks ago, a week ago, whenever it was, and I, I, I titled it, um, you know, the biggest problem in America, question mark. It's us, right? It's us not being involved. I ask people, who, who's your representative? What district do you live in? Who's your county commissioners? Are you involved in the local GOP? Are you, we're not, man, we're not. And all the while, the Democrats are organized, super organized. We're not. And that's how we lose. We don't even vote. The average voter in a primary on the Republican conservative side is 57 years and older. Young conservatives are not involved. And, and part of that problem is, is a lot of young people in this next generation, they, they don't realize that posting comments and, and things on social media, it's not real action, <laughs> right? And I'm not even being funny about it. It used to be, yeah. it used to be kind of a joke that, that, you know, like, okay, you think fighting on the internet, it's not like a real fight. And, no, man, it's like they really, they have begun equating saying things on the internet as if it's a real thing that somehow influences, right? Because we use the term influencers, you're not influencing a damn thing. You know, even with the, the little bit of followers I have on Instagram, I ask people, I beg, I say, I am pleading with you, please go join your local GOP. How do we get involved, Tony? Go join your local GMP. And like, well, how do I do that? Okay, I want you to get on your phone, <laughs> and I want you to pull up Google, or whatever search engine you're using these days. I want you to type in your county's name and the letters GOP, or Republican Party. 
and you will find their website and you will find out that they have monthly meetings and you'll go there and you'll find out that on average there's only 30 people there. No one. And they are the conservative, like, rahs. They want to be involved. But they're the ones that will tell you. Like in North Carolina, they want 15,000 volunteers to watch the polls, to sit at the polls. 15,000 people. And it's not enough. That's a very, very low number. They probably need double that because early voting, two and a half weeks long. Ooh, right? You got to have people watch the polls for four-hour shifts, two shifts per day. You need two people per shift at least, right? The the need is there. And, you know, I always, I always joke, this generation, if they want something, just like our generation too, if we want something and we want to get in participate in something and it becomes our hobby man we know everything about it because we youtube it and we google it and we and we it's all right here everything you want to know everything known to mankind except for classified information and some of that (laughs) is all right here it's in the phone right so if you want to know how to get involved man it's right here and when you go and you talk to those people at those meetings yeah man they're the fanatics they're the really passionate conservative republicans who really do want to change that Republican Party and the image of the old GOP, the rhinos and all that. If you go to these GOP meetings, man, they're mad at the Republican Party. They're the Republican Party, and they're mad at the Republican Party. They want to get rid of the rhinos. They're they're the people who want to renovate that party. Because, you know, I hear people say, um, you know, maybe we need a third party. Okay, that's not a viable course mm-hmm. of action. America's not ready for it. It would take the Democrats and the Republicans getting together and deciding that a third party was a good thing. Yeah. Getting pretty, together and deciding to surrender the, whatever power they that have, which happen. they're not going to do. Power is like uh, matter. It never goes away. It can be transferred, right? And we have transferred willingly power throughout our nation's history, right? A good example is when we gave minorities the right to vote. Right? So we are capable of doing it. We gave women the right to vote. Right? So we have transferred power willingly. Typically speaking, throughout, uh, not American, human history, power is transferred because it's taken. It's rarely given. But that's what makes America special, is that we have given power willingly in an effort to create this amazing country, you know? But yeah, man, freaking, uh, you know, it it's going to take us getting involved. The biggest problem on this planet today is that, or in America today, that's going to continue to lead us down this path and not change this trajectory is us minding our own business. And I get it, man. You got a job. You got a couple kids. And if you don't get involved, right? Because what happens when you go to the GOP and you're eight, 10 and 14 year old see you getting involved what are they going to grow up to do it's setting the example right set the example to exceed the standards all that military leadership talk it's not bullshit you know i know you know it's not bullshit you wrote an entire book about it a couple of them right (laughs) you know setting the example for your children is not just making sure they're taken care of right we we have got to get involved and if we don't man well, like I said, our adversary, they're very involved, they're organized, and they're scary. I ask people, I'm like, name one thing the left has wanted in the last six years they haven't gotten. One is complete reversal of the Second Amendment. Why? Because there's a bunch of people out there with guns that ain't going to let it happen. Other than that, every niche special interest they've ever wanted they've gotten it and now it's like they're just bored looking for shit you know what i mean like the transgenders freaking in college sports like all right we're just gonna make up some stuff that actually goes against our whole feminist movement like it's like they're bored like we got everything we want Hmm, what else can we take from them and but they're going to continue to take because whether or not most lefts truly want communism there are enough folks out there that do that believe that communism is the right path, well, the rest of them will follow them. Because they actually have leaders, right? You mean to tell me Hillary Clinton is not an effective leader? 
I'm not saying she's a good leader. I'm saying she's an effective leader, right? Like Putin is an effective leader. He's not a good person. She's definitely not a good person. She's effective. Name one thing Hillary Clinton hadn't gotten that she wanted presidency. And I don't know that she's done yet. <laughs> Scary shit, man. <laughs> well, we find that one out soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm hopefully I got a I got a factory down in Asheboro, North Carolina. I think it's the sixth district. Hopefully at some point when I get down there in the next several months, huh. we can link up. Definitely. And hang out. You gotta come check out the factory. For sure. I haven't been there yet, but um actually we have two factories. We're consolidating in the process of consolidating right now, but nice. uh hundreds of jobs, funny, hard working people. Funny um, thing, man, that district I think, because we've had so many changes, that is probably the district that Christian Castanelli is going to run in. He's one of those eight GBs. Oh, really? Um, Lieutenant Colonel type, seventh grouper. Uh, He and I have chatted quite a bit, uh, and um, it's going to be a real tough race for him as well. He had more county, and now they redistrict again. And and like I said, it could redistrict another time. It's going to the courts this week. It's frustrating. Uh, And it's, you know, do you know right now which. You, where you're running? For right now. Okay, but yeah. it could change. So, yeah, it was that new fourth, which was Sampson County, uh, Johnson County, a little bit of Wayne County, Harnett County, and Cumberland County. And now it's the new new 13th, and that's Duplin County, Sampson County, Johnson County, a little bit of Wayne County, and Southern Wake County. And it's so weird <laughs> because these new districts, they don't hold communities together. Mm-hmm. It was like, again, it was a, a the Republicans were trying to make the Dems happy. Get some stuff pushed through that would actually work. Meet all the numbers because the districts have to have equal numbers, right? And to do that, it you know you've got to get a city in here and a part of a city over there, and it's not like it's like okay, just pick this region. Yeah. You know, it's more complex than that. So this new district again, all right, man. And like I said, this goes back to Republicans trying to make the Democrats happy. The Democrats suckered them again. They, so we have an activist, very left-leaning Supreme Court in North Carolina. And uh, so when these new districts, they ch- the Democrats challenged them, it went to the Supreme Court, they booted them. They had to rewrite them, so they rebuilt them. The House did uh, a set, and I like that map pretty good. This new one, I don't dislike it. It's just not my favorite because I lost Cumberland County. I want to represent Fayetteville, Fort mm-hmm. Bragg. Yeah. I, it's it's kind of personal. So the um, this week they have to go to a three panel uh, court, three judge panel in the court, and that's two conservatives, one liberal. It will get the thumbs up there. Most likely the Democrats will challenge it again. But the the shysty, like sinister part is when they were building these maps, it was bipartisan uh, in the Senate and in the House, both parties working together. They created these maps. Dems gave them a thumb up. It went to vote. Dems all voted against it. Suckers. Mm -hmm. Now what? Because it's divided half and half. Uh, And one Republican voted with the Democrats. That sets the precedence for it to go to the court and then toss it out. They can be like, look. Y'all don't even agree on it. It's clearly bipartisan. This is supposed to be, or it's clearly partisan. partisan. They set them up again. And it's like, you guys are bending over backwards. When are you just going to draw the line in the sand? They could draw the line in the sand and take it to the you know, U.S. House or U.S. Supreme Court. That's expensive, and it takes a fight. And time. Lots of time. And they're worried about the time because we've already pushed our primaries back from March to May. They're probably going to get pushed back to June now. That's getting closer and closer to the general election in November. They could, in theory, move that, right? That you know, that November election date is not a hard set date. The state can choose a different date. They could push it to January, but that cuts off the whole next cycle. Mm-hmm. That pushes into the next cycle. What do you do now? And, and we're in such uncharted territory, and I just don't have faith that the Republicans right now know how to deal with this fight. Um, and the Democrats, it's almost like I said, it's almost like they're just trying to see what they can get away with. But they're panicking. The Democrats know, right, what's coming in this midterms. So these new, our new districts, they are so close to any other year. They, they would, most of them be 50-50 splits. Mm-hmm. 
they could go either way. They'd all be swing districts. But because of this anticipated red wave, they're, they set them up. It looks more like they set them up on purpose to be Republican, very much favor the Republicans. And of course, did they? Well, certainly. But the North Carolina Constitution says it is the role, duty, responsibility of the General Assembly to set the districts. So, of course, it's going to be partisan, right? Because mm-hmm. rarely, if ever, is your House and Senate 50 50. <laughs> right? It just doesn't happen. So there's a whole constitutional battle here and um, state constitution. And, and I think people really understand how important your state constitution is, right? Like when our government was set up, it was supposed to be, you know, all these states, these nations of the United States. And we've gotten away from that. The federal government's gotten too big. And that's one of my big things, man. Like, hey, let's return that federal government. Let's put it back in its constitutionally limited box and put the lid back on it. Because that monster has climbed out of that box and gone all over the place. And I would say, like, heck, man, if you could simply attempt, if let's say we got a, a 70% solution on getting our federal government back to its constitutional limitations, we would solve over half of America's problems with the federal government. Just return it to what that constitution says. I don't know, man. I I just feel like too often folks up in D.C., they use the constitution as toilet paper instead of reading it for exactly what it's stated. It's it's heartbreaking, man. (laughs) Well, like you said, it's going to be a battle. Um, It is a battle. Very I much. know you mentioned about how to, what to do for people to, to get to help out, you know, locally where they're at. How can people? I think this is probably a pretty good place to wrap up because we've been going for over four hours. But if people want to support you, um, we got tonycowden.com, right? Mm-hmm. That's the main. That is the campaign website. The campaign website. Um, you're on Instagram, you just said. Mm-hmm. Tony and, underscore Cowden underscore four, the letter four, or excuse me, the number four. <laughs> Is there a letter four? No. The number four, NC. And then I have two Facebook pages, my personal, Tony Cowden, and then um, the campaign, Tony Cowden. They're both me. All right. And then you've got a YouTube channel, which I saw. Yeah, I don't do much with it. I was gonna say you have one video, yeah, but you know, yeah. I didn't want to. Uh, never know. I think I've got like three. three. Tony go, Tony Gowden gets after it, so I don't know. Maybe tonight you're gonna post eighty-seven videos. I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, YouTube's just never been my favorite for whatever reason. Um, and I've had numerous YouTube channels, right? I've got the one right now, like you said, it's got like a couple videos maybe on it, and then like, but you know, YouTube was a big thing when I had the gym, had lots of mm. videos on it, and just something happened where. With the whole shooting gun thing, Instagram became oh. my main platform. And and <laughs> as much as I, I don't really like social, yeah. I don't like the whole idea of it. I mean, I'd much rather go back to just, you know, but the, it seemed that at least the evolution of it all, I don't yeah. know if it was even by design that, yeah, the Instagram page was what grew and funneled me business. Whereas it was when I had the gym, Facebook, mm-hmm. it's because Facebook's so local. So now I'm having to get back after Facebook because Got the it. campaign is very local. Got it. But yeah, man, the reality is, and, and this sucks, man, because I've spent my entire life being pretty independent. I, I've never had to ask anybody for money. And it's weird. The reality of this whole mess, and it is a mess because there needs to be campaign finance reform. The reality is, if the campaign's not funded, I don't get to advertise, and there's no face, or there's no recognition, there's no name, face recognition, and I won't get the votes. And you know, strategically speaking, you know, we're addressing, you know, fundraising, talking to donors, and then there are voters, and they're not always the same people. Um, We've done really well so far. The soft bro net, just like you having me on here, Um, been on with a bunch of different other guys, and. When I launched that soft network, man, just started sharing it. And we raised 132 grand in like 13 days over Christmas. And that's what got people going, well, wait, who's this dude? Where's, where's this guy coming from? And, you know, there's always this, the, there's some contention that, oh, you're not getting your funds from the district. Well, I don't even know where the district is. You know how hard it is to get someone to <laughs> donate to your campaign when they don't even know if you live in their district or not? Yeah. You think the Democrats don't know that? Of course they do, yeah. right? What they're doing is creating voter apathy, where it's like, whatever. So they won't donate. 
and they're not going to go vote. Yeah. It's it's a strategy. It's not new. I've done it before. So yeah, man, this is where I have, you know that's that's that asking for money thing is hard. But here's the cool part: that hundred thirty-two thousand dollars. The number one num, the number one donated amount was fifty dollars. We had sixteen hundred or fifteen hundred individual donors from across the nation, all fifty states, over Christmas when people don't have extra income because they're spending it on their right. Christmas presents. Donated this campaign. That's a clear signal, or it should be a clear signal to the folks up in D.C. and everywhere else that the American public is tired of their shit. Excuse my language, but that's what it is. And they they want normal people. Yeah. I don't know if I fall in that category that <laughs> well or not. They want real people who have never sought out politics. You know, uh, before we got on, I was joking and telling you about the um, – my opponent, who's a, a state house rep, and he, they they call him the Al Gore of North Carolina politics because he sold out North Carolina taxpayers and sent tax dollars all around the nation to invest in green energy and so on and so forth. Long story short, he didn't like it. Uh, I think I might have been with Andy Stump when I referred to him as the Al Gore of North Carolina politics. Well, the reality is that's what they call him, right? <laughs> like he's a North Carolina member of the North Carolina House, and all of his contemporaries, they all call him that, right? He didn't like it. Well, the other day, he charged up to me, and he was rah, 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 you know, he's like, you know, and ultimately, I was like, hey, look, man, you know, you, you can say whatever you want, but you sent that money out, and he told me, he told me I was an ignorant wannabe, and I was like, like I said, I might be ignorant, to how and why y'all do things as dirty ass politicians. I was like, but I'm not a wannabe. Like you created me. Men like you are the reason why men like me are coming for your jobs. <laughs> we hired you, you suck. So now we're gonna <laughs> fire you. And that's what America wants right now, right? Let's clear. Yeah. America wants. And like I said, man, we get that JTF up there. So yeah, ten bucks, right on. Right, hundred bucks. I mean, if you got twenty nine hundred, that is the max <laughs> contribution. I could stand some of those because that that new district's more expensive. Mm-hmm. But Southern Wake County, Raleigh, that advertising is uh, it's way more expensive. Sure. That market, right? A TV ad in Raleigh is expensive. But that's what I need. I need funding. People ask, what can I do? Ten bucks, right? Don't get your Starbucks coffee today. Give me five bucks. <laughs> um, and it's weird, man, asking for people for money. And then I came to the conclusion, I'm not asking people to give me money. This is an investment in America's future. Because I promise people, I will not become a politician. I would rather die than sell this nation and its people out. And I put myself in that position before that I would have died and almost did a couple times. I feel like I have that proven track record. And people are like, but there's this guy and there's this guy. He's this veteran and that veteran. They went up there and they sold us out. I'm like, I'm not those guys. I'm not those guys. What do you want? Here I am stepping up. Help me get there. And if I turn out to be some spineless dirtbag politician, fire me. Right? Get involved and fire me. But I promise I'm not capable of being a dirtbag politician. It's not in my genetics. <laughs> you know, it's not even close to something I could ever be. You know, corporations don't have things that I want. I'm not a gear guy, right? Corporations don't have things. I don't want a boat. I don't want a boat. I don't want, I don't desire money. I desire experiences. That's why I like hunting and, you know, with my girlfriend. You can't sell me that. I'm not, I'm not for sale. So, yeah, man, if you got a few bucks, TonyCowden.com. Oh, I will tell you this, man. One of the cool things is when you go to the website, when it pops up, there is a pop-up um, that, that has a video and stuff. You can watch it. It's a cool video. It's me telling you how cool I am or some shit. Um, <laughs> just move past that. And right underneath it, it says dirt bike prize. I'm not a something for nothing type of guy. So last year, I got this hair up my ass that I was going to get back into racing motocross. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and bought a brand new KX4 F50. <sighs> Rocking ship. I got an excavator and a 
uh, and 63 uh, acres. <laughs> and I built a motocross track <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> All at my girlfriend going, what is wrong with you? And uh, that dirt bike, it's been, I got it last November. So it's been whatever, a year and a few months. It still has a second take of gas in it. I haven't had time to ride it. So is she I, going up for auction? I donated it to the campaign. Nice. So it's a raffle, not a raffle. An auction. Raffle. It's you know a ten thousand dollar dirt bike that's never been laid over. Um, I was cautious getting back into riding, mm-hmm. so I took it easy. Um, boots, helmet, nice stuff, man. I didn't bullshit. I bought some nice stuff. Four or five sets of riding gear, Oakley goggles, all that stuff. You can buy chances at it. I'm not a something for nothing type of guy. I got an AR coming on board. Um, and a precision rifle, a custom precision rifle that my buddy who makes my precision guns freaking building for us. So point being is, right, I'm not a something for nothing type of guy. So if you donate to the campaign, at least you're getting a chance to win some cool stuff. So Hell yeah. All right. So, uh, Echo, you got anything? No, we covered it. Awesome, oh, man. Hell yeah. Um, hell yeah. Thanks for coming on, bro. No, thank you for thank, having me. Thanks for sharing your experiences. Uh, thanks for what you've done for America in the past. Yeah. And thanks for what you are Same. about to do for America. Awesome to meet you, man. Thank thanks you so much. Out. Thank you so much for having me. This is this is how we win. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Thanks, brother. Thank you. And with that, Tony Cowden has left the building, heading back to North Kakalaki, and I failed to mention, I failed to mention North Kakalaki. I failed to mention, look, I mentioned the fact that we at Origin USA have a factory in Asheboro, North Carolina, which is awesome, but I failed to mention, and it just, like these conversations, you don't know where they're going. I failed to mention the fact that when I went through BUDS and STT, SEAL Tactical Training, and then got to SEAL Team 1, and then I did three deployments and then I was in training cell with a with my running mate at the time mm-hmm. who I also he was my roommate that whole time mm-hmm. and he was from North Kakalaki <laughs> 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 and he's a freaking best guy mm-hmm. awesome guy and a total stud um, across the board but he's a super good athlete like mm-hmm. a ridiculously good athlete mm-hmm. like we had he played this is the guy who played basketball in North Carolina as a kid, mm. and then he got drafted. He was five eleven. He lost. He he missed a foul shot mm-hmm. and lost like the state championship. He did that, yep. you know. So he had he had that, but you know he was still he was in the state championship and he's obviously a key player. Right, uh, and. He got he got some he got drafted or whatever recruited to some D two D three schools because he was such a good basketball player, and he ended up he's like listen I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be a pro obviously so I'm gonna focus on my education so he ended up going to University of North Carolina, and while he was there he grew five inches <laughs> so he graduated at six four, okay. and this is a guy you know you go out and shoot basketball with him. And he would just sit there and hit three pointers all day. Yeah. So then, then we had Alton Lee Grizzard, who was the Navy quarterback, mm-hmm. and who's himself a stud. That's the guy who is a great friend of mine, and he ended up getting murdered in in mm-hmm. Coronado, which was awful. But just a stud, just a stud across the board. I mean, he played, he broke all kinds of records at the Naval Academy. Just a beast. Mm-hmm. And those two guys got in a little throwing contest of who could throw a football further. Mm. And my buddy from North Kakalaki <laughs> also played football. Oh, so okay. I'm sitting there watching because I I'm not even going to participate in this sure. competition <laughs> against these two freaking studs. And so they started throwing it back and forth, just backing up each time. Right. right. And uh, yeah, the kid from North Carolina, he threw it further. He it was like 65 yards, oh, bro. Man, that's huge. You know, I'm talking a wing. Yeah. And just a beast, man. Duh. But so whenever I hear North Carolina, yeah. I always think North Cadillac because that's how he, <laughs> and you know, yeah. he, he had this funny look he'd give people, me, yeah. everybody. Yeah. But when you said North Carolina, or if you said North Cadillac, he'd give you a look like of the most <laughs> affirming of looks, you know, <laughs> like, like that's everything, you know, like, mm, you know, as if you just said, uh, you know, 
chocolate peanut butter milk. Like, oh, that's so good. You know, it's just one of those things. So yep, I dig it. Uh, very cool to talk to Tony. And, you know, it's a scrap, man. Yeah, It's a scrap. He's got to go. He's going hard in the paint, you know, going yep. hard in the paint. Um, he uh, he said something that was that was interesting, and maybe uh, I don't know. I don't follow public politics as much as maybe others do, but he did mention something that I thought, hmm, that's that, that's that's good. This is a good thing to be talking about and mm-hmm. to be thinking about is the the lack of effectiveness of a linear solution. Yeah, because man, that linear solution, like, and that just in everyday club, bro. I don't know how to run a country. Everyone knows that. You know that about me. I don't know how to run a country. But I do think that it's going to be difficult to make decisions for, what, 300 million people or yeah. whatever. Yeah. You know, what's in the best interest for 300? It's, that's hard. I understand. But if you kind of simple it down or whatever, let's say, I don't know, for example, your kids, right? <clears throat> if you start implementing linear solutions with your kids, so the kids, I don't know, crying. They want a soda. Soda pop. Give them the soda. That's the linear Problem solution, solved. right? Yeah, they're crying. They're unhappy, obviously, because they're crying and whatever. What's the linear solution? Exactly, right? Give them the soda. But that causes all kinds of other problems. Yeah. A lot of them, too, by the way. Not just one other problem. It's like a bunch of other problems. So I would imagine it'd be that same formula except times a million mm-hmm. with running the country in whatever way. So it's like, yeah, to focus on that concept where it's like okay sure this will be a linear solution or understanding okay that's a solution that's a linear solution understand what what would happen then and he kept saying and then what right Mm -hmm. just to be paying attention to that stuff i think that's a good thing it's a good move and i'm not saying no one else pays attention to that but that's not like any kind of front-running concept that people are kind of pushing you know it doesn't seem like it is yeah and i don't know but i liked it well if you can lend some support to tony just look you might not agree with him on every every topic that there is. Uh, maybe he sees some things a little bit differently than you, but man, you, you, the guy's character and just the fact that he's going to go up there and live in his room and make things happen. <sighs> help him out if you can. Um, if you want to help out yourself a little bit too. Speaking of Origin USA, we have a factory in North Carolina, kind of two factories right now, which we're consolidating. We have factories up in Maine. We're building stuff in America. Look, here's something else you can do to support America. You want to help America? Mm-hmm. Buy American. Buy American. Yep. You need a pair of boots? Buy an American pair of boots. Mm. You need a pair of jeans? Buy an American pair of jeans. But have you ever heard of Jake Tran? Okay, so maybe you have, maybe you have. He, what he does is he, he kind of breaks down things that have to do with like, money and power and he makes these cool youtube videos okay on YouTube, jake tran so um one of them one of his recent one ones were fashion like the evil fashion industry mm-hmm. and that's what he would talk about he'd talk about like how basically fashion is built by slavery in other countries oh for sure so yeah, have you not been listening to me for the past yes, freaking years I, I i have and and mainly just you but you but had to hear it from jake tran bro jake tran jake the way tran he breaks stuff right. down oh, he did it better than me yes, i got it i got it bro, okay. i love okay. you right. you are the man okay. but in right. this one I, he did a really really good job well here's maybe if i had someone that i worked with that could put together <laughs> videos that kind of <laughs> extended the things that i was saying okay. maybe that would have worked out better i don't know you yeah you know what you make a good point. Yeah. You make a good point. Nope, it's my fault for not finding someone that was more effective <laughs> in, me- in social media and media and media arts again, and film. Again, great point. But the way he does it is he does it in terms of like like you're the evil one. Mm-hmm. And he's talking to you. He goes, all you have to do is this. Just get some slaves and do it. Like he'll talk to uh, That's how he'll uh, make it. It's uh, his does style. He do, does he do that all the time? That's his it, thing? Yeah. kind of. Sure. It's kind of sarcastic, but kind of like, mm-hmm. like when he'll. He's kind of uh, coming at you. A little bit, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's coming at your sinister side almost. Yeah. Like in certain ones, yeah. it's more heavy than others, yeah. but then he'll be like, What's the heaviest one? Uh, this one was so heavy, it made me consider actually doing it. But at the end of the day, when you stop the YouTube video, you're like, Bro, I'm not going to do that. You know, anyway. Uh, one about charities, like how charities can defraud the government or something mm-hmm. like that. And it'll be like, Oh, he'll say, You can do this, this, and this with no strings attached, of course. And then he'll keep talking, and you're like, See what he did there, right? So you're gonna start a, a charity to 
defraud the government? <laughs> is that what you were saying? You <laughs> almost did? That's not what it's about. But I'm saying when you watch the video, you're like, mm, that's actually not a bad idea. You know, it's like that kind of thoughts. But it's the way he says it, though. I'm you glad know? you're one YouTube video <laughs> away from being sinister and ripping people off. Uh, there's more to it than that. Uh, anyway, watch that one about the freaking right. fashion industry. We'll you're going to be like, bro, yeah. that's yeah. A, And I, I get what you're saying when you're like, that's what you've been saying. That's but what the, I've been saying. Yeah. I haven't been saying it effectively enough for you to understand, apparently. No, no, no. I understand it. But he, he like. Uh, he did a better job. Okay, I'm gonna watch him. We'll we'll get the message right. I'll get the message right so people that will understand that when you buy some fashion yeah. crap that's made overseas, it was made by slaves. Did that's what's happening. You remember that one building in I forget where it was, but where it collapsed on all yes. the all the workers. So he starts off like with that and like just all these yeah, it's crazy. And then a lot of it, it's all essentially like borderline free stuff. Like as far as how it was made, yeah. So so much of it just goes to the trash. So much yeah, of it. They just don't so care. they're just just yeah. Who cares? Kids, whatever. That's why you see sometimes out. those those high fashion companies will take their surplus and just burn it because mm. they want to keep the the supply low yeah, so yeah. demand's high. Yeah. But they misread the next fall season or whatever. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. And so, so they got to burn it. So let's not support that. Let's no. support freedom. Yeah. Let's support America. Let's support Origin USA. OriginUSA.com. Uh, also, get yourself some Jocko fuel. I mean, let's face it. Yeah. You're going to have some, you know, whatever. Injuries, soreness. Soreness, yeah, for sure. Uh, what's the difference between muscle soreness and like when you have a joint soreness? Well, or do, what do you call it when you're, if you did, let's say you did weighted dips yesterday. Sure, hypothetically. Yeah. See, weighted dips, every time I do weighted dips, I, ha I feel like a little bit of not just soreness in my triceps and chest, mm -hmm. but I have a little bit of, what is that called, in my shoulders themselves. Yeah, like joint pain. Yeah, yeah, a like a little bit, but it's minor. Right, 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 joint aggravation. Yeah. It's like I think a lot of the times it'll come obviously from like certain nutritional elements and could be past injuries as, as well, but a lot of times it's imbalances mm. in certain places, you know, so you kind of overstretch yeah. or understretch certain things and whatever. But well, well, when you have joint aggravation, sure, you can take like joint warfare. If you have muscle soreness, you can take milk. Yep, and these are nutritional elements that can improve that these are going to improve these scenarios. unfortunate scenarios and kind of fortunate because at least you were able to do them. Exactly, you right. know, you were able to get after it, and it's part of the game. So I learned early on, and I was okay. So I make my daughter mm -hmm. do little workouts. Yep. Sometimes it's punishment. Sometimes it's hey, this is just what we're doing, and <laughs> she's eight. So Dom's delayed onset muscle soreness is new to her. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when you're new to doms, you're like, I don't like this feeling. Like, why would I do push-ups or why would I do a bunch of squats when my legs are gonna feel like this the next yeah. day? It's like, it's like, you feel like your body's kind of being destro destroyed or whatever. But when you really understand what doms is, you kind of invite it. So I understood the value of doms early on. I think I was like 10 or 11 years old. Dang. Yep. From reading about it or just understanding that, like, yeah, I worked out yesterday, I'm sore because I'm getting stronger. Yes. So I found out, I forget how I found out. This is, you know, whatever, 1988 or whatever, however old I, or whatever year. But I knew that your muscles were sore because they were triggered into like growing back big mm. or whatever. So I'm like, oh, shoot. So if I do a bunch of push ups and I'm not sore, I'm like, dang, I didn't do enough push ups. Or if I ran a bunch, like when I started, when you, you know, the first two days of yeah. football practice, you get sore, like you're sore, your legs are sore, your abs are sore from doing sit-ups, your necks are all this stuff. But I knew that, no, that's because they're about to grow back bigger, you kind of invite it. Mm -hmm. So now as an adult, I understand, hey man, that Dom's life is part of the part of the game, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you can mitigate it. You can mitigate it, yeah. Not by working out less or working out weaker, oh, no, but no, by, no. by eating the correct foods. Yeah, you're facilitating the whole yeah. Dom's process right there. So all that stuff, jockofuel.com plus, you can get the drinks at Wawa, which by the way, we're kind of dominating at Wawa. If you go out and you buy stuff from Wawa, I am personally thanking you at this time for making us dominate in Wawa. Mm. Don't let up. Clear shelves, go in there, get after it. Mm. We're working with a bunch of other companies. We are, I, I gotta put together a list of where you can buy Jocko Fuel, but right now, I can tell you, you can get it at Wawa, the drinks, and you can get it at the Vitamin Shop. 
So, or you can get it at jockofuel.com. You ever drink kombucha? I don't like it. it me neither. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing where, I'm sorry. you know, like. Um, you know who drinks kombucha? All the females in my family. Yeah. They're I, drinking that stuff like it's methamphetamine or something. Amen. To each their own. Not and that I, they're into methamphetamine, <laughs> but like it's a very addictive, like something that they're enjoying. You hear good things. Yeah. Okay. No, I haven't heard good things about methamphetamine. <laughs> Anyways, let me retract that. My wife and daughters like kombucha for whatever reason. Yes. I think it tastes like crap. Like crap, yes, yeah. sir. And I'm not even again. My father-in-law, he makes his own kombucha. Oh, damn. So it's like, dang, okay, obviously great for you. Good enough for you. There was a dude that made kombucha with Jocko White tea, by the way. Oh, okay. He was selling it, Combat Kombucha. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> he went out there, he's making Combat Kombucha. Kombucha? Kombucha? Kombucha. Kombucha. It's all, kombucha. The, it's all the deal. However all right. you want to say it. Either way, the point, okay, do you have any vegetables? That you just like, you know, okay, they're good for you, but bro, I'm just not gonna eat that because mm. I'm just not into it, mm. into the taste or whatever. Just not in, like um, asparagus. You yeah. know, people like asparagus, yeah, yeah. you salt it up, and yeah. I, bro, I think it tastes kind of junk. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna be excited for asparagus. Okay. So the good thing, and this is why I think a lot, most people like this energy drink. Because when you drink it and you have no guilt, you know that it's actually good for you. It's not like asparagus. See what I'm saying? Well, asparagus is good for you, but it tastes bad. Yes. Discipline Go is good for you. And it tastes good. And it good. tastes good. Exactly. Double bonus. Exactly right. And that's why I think people like it. Especially the mango one, by the way. I hear great things about the mango one. Mm, check. Uh, if you want to get some stuff from this podcast and represent, you can do that too. Echo made a store. It's called Jocko Store, yeah. <laughs> 100%. Uh, get some of that stuff. Shirt Locker. So there is a shirt coming out that I created Yep. Mentally, sure. and then you have brought to fruition. I think it's going to be a classic. Yeah, I think it's going to be a classic. It's a good one, and that one is the March March shirt. Okay, sure. and it's pretty squared away. The shirt locker is the membership. Did you make the adjustments you needed to make to that shirt as directed? No time. No time. Didn't, didn't have time. It was already. Hey, what do you call? It, the ship has OBE, sailed. Whatever. OBE overcome by events. Yeah. Well, like look, one. we're good. The spelling's good, yep. and that shirt is legit. Yeah, it looks good. That's the March shirt, yep. and the whole shirt locker is squared away mm -hmm. anyway. So it's like if you order it on March first, second, or what, it's all like up to date. Yep. You see what I'm saying? You're good. Yeah, you'd be good to go. Check. Uh, so check out JockoStore.com. Subscribe to the podcast. Go, uh, Jocko Underground. Uh, JockoUnderground.com. Who knows? I know we mentioned COVID during this particular podcast. That's the kind of thing that apparently gets people banned, gets yeah. people uh, in trouble. That's why we have jockounderground.com. It's $8.18 a month. It allows us to have a separate platform that we actually have control over. We can say whatever we want. We won't be censored. So if you wanna help out there, you can do that. If you can't afford it, we still want you in the game. Just email Jocko Underground. Assistance at jockounderground.com. Check out the YouTube channels. Check out the... The Jocko Podcast YouTube channel, if you want to see what Tony looks like. Also, yeah. Origin USA has, if you want to find out what's going on, I talk about these factories and all this stuff going on, check out the Origin USA YouTube channel. That's got a bunch of good information on it, too. Um, it's true. It's yeah. like psychological warfare. Yep. Get that if you need a little, <laughs> little hitter. Yeah. And it, I would say motivation. It's not motivate. Basically, you want Jocko to help you pass your moment of weakness. Mm. So I've right. always said it, so I'm going to keep saying it because it's absolutely true. And if you want Dakota Meyer to help you pass your moment of weakness, he's making cool stuff, flipsidecanvas.com. Uh, written a bunch of books. If you want to check them out, check them out. Just go to check out books by Jocko Willink. You'll find them. Some of them are pretty popular. Some of them you might like. You might be able to learn something from them. You might be able to contact me and tell me I got something wrong. I'm standing by for adjustment. Echelon Front, Leadership Consultancy. We've got live events that we do. The next big one we've got is in Dallas, Texas, March 24th and 25th. So if you wanna come to a live event, you can go to that. We also have the Battlefield events coming up in Gettysburg in May 10th and 12th. And then Gettysburg, May 13th and 14th, and we're doing Little Bighorn as well. Anyways, go for any of this stuff or you want us to come and help your company, Go to echelonfront.com and check that out. We also have an online training, an online training platform 
It's at extreme. It's at extremeownership.com. If you if you have questions for me, you can just go there and ask me a question. I'll be on there. I'll be on there on a Zoom meeting. Remember what Zoom is? COVID brought us Zoom. <laughs> it's one of the good things about COVID, well, right? COVID brought us Zoom. Now we sure. can. Everyone uses Zoom now. Yeah. I used to try and do Zoom meetings back in the day or Skype. Right, Skype. And people just weren't ready for it. Now everyone's yeah. like, oh, Zoom call. Yep, we're 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 ready. Yeah, and, and people understand the benefits of it. Yep. So, if you want to talk to me on a Zoom call, I will literally be right there. Go to extremeownership.com. You can take a bunch of courses we made. We make fresh courses coming out once a week. Leadership, leadership for you, not just for like, oh, you're the CEO of a company or you're the manager of this. But if you're leading a family, if you're leading your friends, if you're leading yourself, go to extremeownership.com. Also, if you wanna help service members, you can go to Mark Lee's mom. She's got an awesome charity that she put together, helps out veterans so much. Go to americasmightywarriors.org for that. And also check out Heroes and Horses, which is a outstanding charity run by Micah Fink up there in Montana, getting it. And if you wanna support Tony Cowden, go to, like like he said earlier, go to TonyCowden.com. And he's also on Instagram, which is, sounds like that's his primary mode of communication with the crew. Mm-hmm. It's co- Tony underscore Cowden underscore four, the number four, and then NC for North Carolina. He's also on Twitter, Tony. Cowden NC and Facebook, YouTube, Tony Cowden. As far as Echo and I go, we're both on Twitter. We're we're both on the gram. We're both on the Facebook. Echo's at Echo Charles. I'm at Jocko Willink. Of course, be advised. Come to check it out real quick. All of a sudden you get sucked in by the algorithm. Don't let that happen. That's the devil's play thing right there, the algorithm. Got to watch out for that one. Thanks once again for Tony to Tony for coming on tonight. Thanks for everything that he's done. You know, we barely even, you you can't spend, what is it, eight or nine years in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. The amount of stuff that that he's been through, that he's done, the amount of risk he's taken to serve our country, you're not gonna cover it in a four hour podcast or a 20 hour podcast or a 100 hour podcast. But that's the kind of person that's been out there laying his life on the line for the country. Now he's stepping up again, so. Support him if you can, and thanks for coming, Tony. And the rest of our American military out there, and the veterans, thank you all for what you've done and continue to do to serve our great nation and to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all first responders, thank you for keeping us safe on the home front. And to everyone else, how much can you do? I actually know the answer to that question. More. (laughs) That's how much you can do. You can do more. And a guy like Tony makes that obvious. But it isn't going to knock on your door. You have to kick that door in. You have to make things happen. You have to initiate action, and you do that by going out there every day and getting after it. Until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.